it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wondre. It was in the 34th century that the Dark Star began its famous conquest, unparalleled in stellar annals. Phobar the astronomer discovered it. He was sweeping the heavens with one of the newly invented multi-powered Sussendorf comet hunters, and something caught his eye. A new star of great brilliance in the foreground of the constellation Hercules. For the rest of the night, he cast aside all his plans and concentrated on the one star. He witnessed an unprecedented event. Mercia's nullifier had just been invented, a curious and intricate device, based on four-dimensional geometry that made it possible to see occurrences in the universe which had hitherto required the hundreds of years needed for light to cross the intervening space before they were visible on Earth. By a hasty calculation with the aid of this invention, Faber found that the new star was about 3,000 light years distant, and that it was hurtling backward into space at the rate of 1,200 miles per second. The remarkable feature of his discovery was this appearance of a fourth magnitude star where none had been known to exist. Perhaps it had come into existence this very night. On the succeeding night, he was given a greater surprise. In line with the first star, but several hundred light years nearer, was a second new star of even more brightness, and it too was hurtling backward into space at approximately 1200 miles per second. Phobar was astonished. Two new stars discovered within 24 hours in the same part of the heavens, both of the fourth magnitude. But his surprise was as nothing when on the succeeding night, even while he watched, a third new star appeared in line with these, but much closer. At midnight he noticed firstly a pinpoint of faint light. By one o'clock the star was of eight magnitude. At two it was a brilliant sun of the second magnitude, blazing away from Earth like the others at a rate of 1,200 miles per second. And on the next evening, and the next, and the next, other new stars appeared until there were seven in all, everyone on a line in the same constellation, Hercules, everyone with the same radiance and the same proper motion, there were varying signs. Phobar had broadcast his discovery to the incredulous astronomers, but as star after star appeared nightly, all the telescopes on Earth were turned toward one of the most spectacular cataclysms that history had recorded. Far out in the depths of space, with unheard of regularity and unheard of precision, new worlds were flaming up overnight in a line that began at Hercules and extended toward the solar system. Phobar's announcement was immediately flashed to Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, the other members of the Five Ward Federation. Saturn reported no evidence of the phenomena, because of the interfering rings and the lack of Mercia's nullifier. But Jupiter, with a similar device, witnessed the phenomena and announced furthermore that many stars in the neighbourhood of the Nova had begun to deviate in singular and abrupt fashion from their normal position. There was not as yet much popular interest in the phenomenon. Without Mercia's nullifier, the stars were not visible to ordinary eyes, since the light rays would take years to reach the Earth. But every astronomer who had access to Mercia's nullifier hastened to focus his telescope on the region where extraordinary events were taking place out in the unfathomable gulf of the night. Some terrific force was at work creating worlds and disturbing the positions of stars within a radius already known to extend billions and trillions of miles from the path of the seven new stars. But of the nature of that force, astronomers could only guess. Fobar took up his duties early on the eighth night. The last star had appeared about 500 light years distant. If an eighth new star was found, it should not be more than a few light years away. But nothing happened. All night Phobar kept his telescope pointed at the probable spot, but search as he might, the heavens showed nothing new. In the morning he sought eagerly for news of any discovery made by fellow watchers, but they, too, had found nothing unusual. Could it be that the mystery would now fade away, a new riddle of the skies? The next evening he took up his position once more, training his telescope on the seven bright stars, 
a man on the region where an eighth, if there were one, should appear. For hours he searched the abyss in vain. He could find none. Apparently the phenomena were ended. At midnight he took a last glance before entering on some tedious calculations. It was there, in the centre of the telescope, a faint, easy object steadily growing in brightness. All his problems were forgotten as Fobar watched the eighth star increase hourly. Closer than any other, closer even than Alpha Centauri, the new sun appeared, scarcely three light years away across the void surrounding the solar system. And all the while he watched, he witnessed a thing no man had ever seen before the birth of a world. By one o'clock, the new star was of fifth magnitude, by two, it was of the first. As the faint flush of dawn began to come toward the close of that frosty, moonless November night, the new star was a great white-hot object more brilliant than any other star in the heavens. Furbar knew that when its light finally reached Earth so that the ordinary eyes could see, it would be the most beautiful object in the night sky. What was the reason for these unparalleled births of worlds and the terrifying mathematical precision that characterized them? Whatever the cosmic force behind it, it was progressing toward the solar system. Perhaps it would even disturb the balance of the planets. The possible chance of such an event had already called the attention of some astronomers, but the whole phenomenon was too inexplicable to permit more than mere speculation. The next evening was cloudy. Jupiter reported nothing new except that Neptune had deviated from its course and tended to pursue an erratic and puzzling new orbit. Fobar pondered long over this last news item, and turned his attention to the outermost planet on the succeeding night. To his surprise, he had great difficulty in locating it. The ephemeris was of absolutely no use. When he did locate Neptune after a brief search, he discovered it more than 80 million miles from its scheduled place. This was at 1.40. At 2.10, he was thunderstruck by a special announcement sent from the Central Bureau to every observatory and astronomer of note throughout the world, proclaiming the discovery of an ultra-Plutonian planet. Phobar was incredulous. For centuries it had been proved that no planet beyond Pluto could possibly exist. With feverish haste, Phobar ran to the huge telescope and rapidly focused it where the new planet should be. Five hundred million miles beyond Neptune was a flaming path like the beam of a giant searchlight but extended exactly to the eighth solar planet. Phobar gasped. He could hardly credit the testimony of his eyes. He then looked more closely. The great stream of flame still crossed his line of vision, but this time he saw something else. At the precise farther end of the flame path, a round disk of dark. Beyond a doubt, a new planet of vast size now formed in addition to the solar group. That planet was almost impervious to the illuminating rays of the sun, and was barely discernible. Neptune itself shone brighter than it ever had, and was falling away from the sun at a rate of 1,200 miles per second. All night Phobar watched the double mystery. By three o'clock he was convinced, as far as lightning calculation showed, that the invader was hurtling toward the sun at a speed of more than 10 million miles an hour. By 3.15, he thought that vanishing Neptune seemed brighter even than the band of fire running to the invader. At four, his belief was certainty. With amazement and awe, Phobar sat through the long, cold night, watching a spectacular and terrible catastrophe in the sky. As dawn began to break, and the stars grew paler, Phobar turned away from his telescope, his brain a whirl, his heart filled with a great fear. He had witnessed the devastation of a world, the ruin of a member of his own planetary system by an invader from outer space. As dawn cut short his observations, he knew at last the cause of Neptune's brightness, he knew that it was now a white-hot flaming sun that sped with increased rapidity away from the solar system. Somehow, the terrible swathe of fire that flowed from the dark star to Neptune had wrenched it out of its orbit and made it a molten inferno. At dawn came another bulletin from the Central Bureau. 
Neptune now had a surface temperature of 3,000 degrees centigrade and was defying all laws of celestial mechanics and within three days would have left the solar system forever. The results of such a disaster were unpredictable and the entire solar system was likely to break up. Already Uranus and Jupiter had deviated from their orbits unless something speedily occurred to check the onrush of the dark star it was prophesied that the laws governing the planetary system would run to a new balance and that in the ensuing chaos the whole group would spread apart and fall towards the gulfs beyond the great surrounding void. What was the nature of the great path of fire? What force did it represent? And was the dark star controlled by intelligence or was it a blind wanderer from space that had come by accident? The flame path alone implied that the Dark Star was guided by an intelligence that possessed the secret of inconceivable power. Menace hung in the sky now, where all eyes could see in a great arc of fire. The world was on the brink of eternity, and vast forces, at whose nature man could only guess, were sweeping planets and suns out of its path. The following night was again cold and clear. High in the heavens, where Neptune should have been, hung a disk of enormously greater size. Neptune itself was almost invisible, hundreds of millions of miles beyond its scheduled position. As nearly as Fobar could estimate, not one hundredth of the sun's rays were reflected from the surface of the dark star, a proportion far below those of the other planets. Fobar had a better view of the flame path, and it was with growing awe that he watched that strange swathe in the sky during the dead of night. It shot out from the dark star like a colossal beam or huge pillar of fire, seeking a food of worlds. With a shiver of cold fear, he saw that there were now three of the bands, one toward Neptune, one toward Saturn, and one toward the Sun. The first was fading, a milky, misty white. The second shone almost as bright as the first one previously had, and the third toward the Sun was a dazzling stream of orange radiance, burning with a steady, terrible, unbelievable intensity across two and a half billion miles of space. That gigantic flare was the most brilliant sight in the whole night sky, an awful and abysmally prophetic flame that made city streets black with staring people, a radiance whose grandeur and terrific implication of cosmic power brought beauty and the fear of doom into the heavens. Those paths could not be explained by all the physicists and all the astronomers in the Five World Federation. They possessed the properties of light, but they were rigid bands like a tube or a solid pillar from which only the faintest of rays escaped, and they completely shut off the heavens behind them. They had, moreover, singular properties which could not be described, as if a new force were embodied in them. Hour after hour, Humanity watched the spectacular progress of the Dark Star, watched those mysterious and threatening paths of light that flowed from the invader. And when dawn came, it brought only a great fear and the oppression of impending disaster. In the early morning, Fobar slept. When he awoke, he felt refreshed and decided to take a short walk in the familiar and peaceful light of day. But he never took that walk. He opened the door in a kind of dim and reddish twilight. Not a cloud hung in the sky, but the sun shone feebly with a dull red glow, and the skies were dull and somber, as if the sun were dying, as scientists had predicted it eventually would. Phobar stared at the dull heavens in a daze, at the foreboding atmosphere and the livid sun that burned faintly as through a smoke curtain. Then the truth flashed on him, it was the terrible path of fire from the Dark Star. By what means he could not guess, by what appalling control of immense and inconceivable forces he could not even imagine, the Dark Star was sucking light and perhaps more than light from the sun. Baba turned and shut the door. The world had seen its last dawn. If the purpose of the Dark Star was destruction, none of the planets could offer much opposition for no weapon of theirs was effective beyond a few thousand miles range at most, and the Dark Star could span millions. If the invader passed on, its havoc would only be a trifle smaller, 
for it had already destroyed two members of the solar system and was now striking at its most vital part. Without the sun, life would die. But even with the sun, the planets must rearrange themselves because of the destruction of balance. Even he could hardly grasp the vast and abysmal catastrophe that without warning had swept from space. How could the dark star have traversed 3,000 light years of space in a week's time? It was unthinkable. So stupendous a control of power, so gigantic a manipulation of cosmic forces, so annihilating a possession of the greatest secrets of the universe, was an unheard of concentration of energy and knowledge of stellar mechanics. But the evidence of his own eyes and the path of the dark star with flaming suns to mark its progress told him, in language which could not be refuted, that the dark star possessed all that immeasurable titanic knowledge. It was the lord of the universe. There was nothing which the Dark Star could not crush or conquer or change. The thought of that immense supreme power numbed his mind. It opened vistas of a civilization and a progress and an unparalleled mastery of all knowledge which was almost beyond conception. Already the news had raced across the world. On Phobar's television screen flashed scenes of a nightmare. The radio spewed a gibberish of terror. In one day, panic had swept the earth. On the remaining members of the Five World Federation, the same story was repeated. Rioting mobs drowned out the chant of religious fanatics who hailed Judgment Day. Great fires turned the air murky and flame shot. Machine guns spat regularly in city streets. Looting, murder, and fear-crazed crimes were universal. Civilization had completely vanished overnight. The tides roared higher than they ever had before. For every thousand people drowned on the American seaboards, a hundred thousand perished in China and India. Dead volcanoes boomed into the worst eruptions known. Half of Japan sunk during the most violent earthquake in history. Land rocked. The seas boiled. Cyclones howled out of the skies. A billion eyes focused on Mecca. The mad beating of tom-toms rolled across Africa. Women and children were trampled to death by the crowds that jammed into churches. Has man lived in vain? asked the philosopher. The world is doomed. There is no escape, said the scientist. The day of reckoning has come. The wrath of God is upon us, shouted the street preachers. In a daze, Phobar switched off the bedlam and, walking like a man asleep, strode out. He didn't care where if only to get away. The ground and the sky were like a dying fire. The sun seemed a half-dead cinder. Only the great swathe of radiance between the sun and the dark star had any brilliance. Sinister, menacing, and now larger even than the sun, the invader from beyond hung in the heavens. As Phobar watched it, the air around him prickled strangely. A sixth sense gave warning. He turned to race back into his house, but his legs failed. A fantastic orange light bathed him. Countless needles of pain shot through his whole body, and the world darkened. The earth had somehow been blotted out. There was a brief blackness, the nausea of space and of a great fall that compressed eternity into a moment. Then a swimming confusion and outlines which gradually came to rest. Phobar was too utterly amazed to cry out or run. He stood inside the most titanic edifice he could have imagined, a single gigantic structure vaster than all New York City. Far overhead swept a black roof fading into the horizon. Beneath his feet was the same metal substance. In the midst of this giant work soared the base of a tower that pierced the roof thousands of feet above. Everywhere loomed machines. Enormous dynamos, cathode tubes a hundred feet long, masses and mountains of such fantastic apparatus that he'd never encountered before. The air was bluish, electric. From the black substance came a phosphorescent radiance. The triumphant drone of motors and a terrific crackle of electricity were everywhere. Off to his right, purple-blue flames the size of sequoia trees flickered around a group of what looked like condensers as huge as Gibraltar. At the base of the central tower, 
half a mile distant, Phobar could see something that resembled a great switchboard studded with silver controls. Near it was a series of mechanisms at whose purpose he could not even guess. All this his astounded eyes took in, in one confused glance. The thing that gave him unreasoning terror was the hundred-foot-high metal monster before him. It defied description. It was unlike any colour known on earth, a blinding colour sinister with power and evil. Its shape was equally ambiguous. It rippled like quicksilver, now compact, now spread out into a thousand limbs, but what appalled Phobar was its definite possession of rational life. Moreover, his very thoughts were transmitted to him as clearly as though written in his own native English. Follow me. Phobar's mind did not function, but his legs moved regularly. In the grasp of this mental, metal monster, he was a mere automaton. Phobar noticed idly that he had to step down from a flat disc a dozen yards across. By some power, some tremendous discovery that he could not understand, he'd been transported across millions of miles of space, undoubtedly to the dark star itself. The colossal thing, indescribable, a blinding, nameless colour, rippled down the hall and stooped before a disc of silvery black. In the centre of the disc was a metal seat with a control board nearby. Be seated. Phobar sat down. The Titan flicked the controls and nothing happened. Phobar sensed that something was radically wrong. He felt the surprise of his gigantic companion. He didn't know it then, but the fate of the solar system hung on that incident. Come. Abruptly, the giant stooped, and Phobar shrank back, but a flowing mass of cold, insensate metal swept around him, lifted him fifty feet in the air. Dizzy, sick, horrified, he was hardly conscious of the whirlwind motion into which the giant had suddenly shot. He had a dim impression of machines racing by, of countless other giants, of a sudden opening in the walls of the immense building, and then a rush across the surface of metal land. Even his vertigo, he had enough curiosity to marvel that there was no vegetation, no water, only the dull black metal everywhere. And yet there was air. And then a city loomed before them. To Phobar it seemed a city of gods or giants. Fully five miles it soared towards space, its fantastic angles and arcs and cubes and pyramids amazing in the dimensions of a totally alien geometry. Tier by tier, the stupendous city, hundreds of miles wide, mounted toward a central tower like the one in the building he'd left. Phobar never knew how they got there, but his numb mind was at last forced into clarity by a greater will. He stared about him. His captor had gone. He stood in a huge chamber circling to a dome far overhead. Before him, on a dais a four thousand feet in diameter, stood sat, rested, whatever it might be called, another monster, far larger than any he'd yet seen, like a mountain of pliant thinking, living metal. And Phobar knew that he stood in the presence of the ruler. The metal cyclops surveyed him, as Phobar might have surveyed an ant. Gold, deadly. Dispassionate scrutiny came from something that might have been eyes or a seeing intelligence locked in a metal body. There was no sound, but inwardly to Phobar's consciousness from the peak of the Titan far above came a command. What are you called? Phobar opened his lips, but even before he spoke, he knew that the thing had understood his thought. Phobar. I'm Gaborel, ruler of Zlobarty, the lord of the universe. Lord of the Universes? I and my world come from one of the Universes beyond the reach of your telescopes. Phobar somehow felt that the thing was talking to him as he would to a newborn babe. What do you want of me? Tell your Earth that I want the entire supply of your radium ores mined, 
and placed above ground according to the instructions I give, by seven of your days hence. A dozen questions sprang to Fobar's lips. He felt again that he was being treated like a child. Why do you want our radium ore? Because they are the rarest of the elements on your scale, are absent on ours, and supply us with some of the tremendous energy we need. Why don't you obtain the ores from other worlds? We do. We are taking them from all worlds where they exist. But we need yours also. Oh, Raiders of the universe. Looting young worlds of their precious radium ores. Piracy on a cosmic scale. And if Earth refuses your demand? For answer, Gaborek rippled to a wall of the room and pressed a button. The wall dissolved, weirdly, mysteriously. A series of vast silver plates were revealed, and a battery of control levers. This will happen to all of your Earth unless the ores are given to us. The Titan then closed a switch. On the screen flashed the picture of a huge tower such as Fobar had seen in the metal city. Gabareg adjusted a second control that was something like a rangefinder. He pressed a third lever, and from the tower leaped a huge surge of terrific energy, like a bolt of lightning a quarter of a mile broad. The giant closed another switch, and on the second plate flashed a picture of New York City. And then, waiting. Seconds, minutes drifted by. The atmosphere became tense, nerve-cracking. Fobar's eyes ached with the intensity of his stare. What would happen? And then, abruptly, it came. A monstrous bolt of energy streaked from the skies. Purple-blue death in a pillar, a fourth of a mile broad, crashed into the heart of New York City, swept up and down Manhattan, across and back, and suddenly vanished. Within fifteen seconds, only a molten hell of fused structures and incinerated millions of human beings remained of the world's first city. Phobar was crushed, appalled, and then utter loathing for this soulless thing poured through him. Oh, if only... It is useless. You can do nothing, answered the ruler as though it had grasped his thought. But why? If you could pick me off the earth, do you not draw the radium ores in the same way? Fobar demanded. The orange ray only picks up loose, portable objects. We can and will transport the radium ores here by means of the ray after they have been mined and placed on platforms or discs. Why did you select me from all the millions of people on Earth? Solely because you were the first apparent scientist whom our Cosmotel chanced upon. It'll be up to you to notify your Earth governments of our demand. But afterwards, Fobar burst out aloud. What then? We will depart. Yeah, but it'll mean death to us. The solar system will be wrecked with Neptune gone and Saturn following it. Garbareg made no answer. To that impassive, cold, inhuman thing, it did not matter if a nation or a whole world perished. Furbar had already seen with what deliberate calm it had destroyed a city, merely to show him what the power lords of these Labati controlled. Besides, what guarantee was there that the invaders would not loot the earth of everything they wanted, and then annihilate all life upon it before they departed? And yet Fobar knew he was helpless, knew that the men of Earth would be forced to do whatever was asked of them, and trust that the raiders would fulfill their promise. Two hours remain for your stay here, came the ruler's dictum to interrupt his line of thought. For the first half of that period, you will tell me of your world and answer whatever questions I may ask. During the rest of the interval, I will explain some of the things you wish to learn about us. Again, Fobar felt Garbareg's disdain, knew that the metal giant regarded him as a kind of plaything for an hour or two's amusement, and yet he had no choice, as we told Garbareg of the life on Earth, how it arose and along what lines it had developed. 
He narrated in brief the extent of man's knowledge, his scientific achievements, his mastery of weapons and forces and machines, his social organization. And when he finished, he felt as a Stone Age man might feel in the presence of a brilliant scientist of the 34th century. If any sign of interest had shown on the peak of the Metallic Lord, Phobar failed to see it. But he sensed an intolerant sneer of ridicule in Garbury, as though the ruler considered these statements to be only the most elementary of facts. Then, for three quarters of an hour, in the manner of one lecturing an ignorant pupil, the giant crowded its thought pictures into Phobar's mind, so that finally he understood a little of the raiders, and of the sudden terror that had flamed from the abysses into the solar system. The universe of matter that you know is only one of the countless universes which comprise the cosmos, began Garbaret. In your universe you have a scale of 92 elements. You have your color spectrum, your rays and waves of many kinds. You are subject to definite laws controlling matter and energy, as you know. But we are of a different universe. On a different scale from yours, a trillion light years away in space, eons distant in time. The natural laws which govern us differ from those controlling you. In our universe, you would be hopelessly lost, completely helpless, unless you possess the knowledge that your people will not attain even in millions of years. But we, who are so much older and greater than you, have for so long studied the nature of the other universes that we can enter and leave at will taking what we wish, doing as we wish, creating or destroying worlds whenever the need arises, coming and hurtling away when we choose. There is no vegetable life in our universe. There is only the scale of elements ranging from 842 to 966 on the extension of your own scale. In this high range, metals of complex kinds exist. There is none of what you call water, no vegetable world, no animal kingdom. Instead, there are energies, forces, rays, and waves, which are food to us and which nourish our life stream just as pigs, potatoes, and bread are food to you. Trillions of years ago in your time calculation, but only a few dozen centuries ago in ours, life arose on the giant world Krypton in our universe. It was life, our life, the life of my people and myself, intelligence animating bodies of pliant metal, existing almost endlessly on an almost inexhaustible source of energy. But all matter wears down. On Krypton, there was a variety of useful metals, others that were valueless. There was comparatively little of the first and much of the second. Krypton itself was a world as large as your entire solar system, with a diameter roughly of four billion miles. Our ancestors knew that Krypton was dying, that the store of our most precious element, Slalreth, was dwindling. But already our ancestors had mastered the forces of our universe and had made inventions that are beyond your understanding, had explored the limits of our universe in space cars that were propelled by the free energies in space and by the attracting, repelling influences of stars. The metal inhabitants of Krypton employed every invention they knew to accomplish an engineering miracle that makes your bridges and mines seem but the puny efforts of a gnat. They blasted all the remaining ores of Saureth from the surface and interior of Krypton and refined them. Then they created a giant vacuum, a dead field in space a hundred million miles away from that world. The dead field was controlled from Krypton by atomic projectors, energy absorbers, gravitation nullifiers and cosmotels, range regulators and a host of other inventions. As fast as it was mined and extracted, the sour earth metal was vaporized, shot into the dead field by interstellar rays, and solidified there along an invisible framework which we projected. In a decade of our time, we had pillaged Krypton of every particle of sour earth. And then in our skies hung an artificial world, a manufactured sphere, a giant new planet, the world you yourself are now on, Slavarti. We did not create a solid globe. We left chambers, tunnels, passageways, storerooms, throughout, piercing it from surface to surface. And thus, even as Labati was being created, we provided for everything that we needed or could need. Experimental laboratories, subsurface vaults, chambers for the innumerable huge ray dynamos, energy storage batteries, and other apparatus which we needed. And when all was ready, 
We transferred by space cars and by atomic individuation all our necessities from Krypton to the artificial world of Slabati. And when everything was prepared, we destroyed the dead field by duplicate control from Slabati. Turned our repulsion power on full against the now useless and dying giant world of Krypton and swung upon our path. But our whole universe is incredibly old. It was mature before ever your young suns flamed out of the gaseous nebulae. It was decaying when your molten planets were flung from the central sun. It was dying before the boiling seas had given birth to land upon your sphere. And while we had enough of our own particular electrical food to last us for a million or fewer years, and enough power to guide Slabati to other universes, we had exhausted all the remaining energy of our entire universe. When we finally left it to dwindle behind us in the black abysses of space, we left it a dead cinder, devoid of life, vitiated of activity, and utterly lacking in cosmic forces, a universe finally run down. The universes, as you may know, are set off from each other by totally black and empty absence, expanses so vast that light rays have not yet crossed many of them. How did we accomplish the feat of traversing such a goal? by the simplest of means. Acceleration. Why? Because to remain in our universe meant inevitable death. We gambled on the greatest adventure in all the cosmos. To begin with, we circled our universe to the remotest point opposite where we wanted to leave it. We then turned our attraction powers on part way, so that the millions of stars before us drew us ahead, and then we gradually stepped out the power to its full strength, thus ever increasing our speed. At the same time, as stars passed to our rear in our flight, we turned our repulsion rays against them, stepping that power up also. Our initial speed was 24 miles per second. Midway into our universe, we'd reached the speed of your light, 186,000 miles per second. By the time we left our universe, we were hurtling at a speed which we estimated to be 1,600,000,000 miles per second. Yet even at that tremendous speed, it took us years to cross from our universe to yours. If we'd encountered even a planetoid at that enormous rate, we would have probably been annihilated in white-hot death. But we had planned well. And there are no superiors to our stellar mechanics, or astronomers, or our scientists. When we finally hurtled from the black void into your universe, we found what we'd only dared hope for. A young universe with many planets and cooling worlds rich in radiant ores. The only element in your scale that can help to replenish our vanishing energy. Half your universe we've already deprived of its ores. And your Earth has more than we want. Then we shall continue on our way to loot the rest of the worlds before passing on to another universe. We are a planet without a universe. We will wander and pillage until we find a universe like the one we come from, or until Slabati itself disintegrates and we perish. We could easily wipe out all the dwellers on Earth and mine the ores ourselves, but that will be a needless waste of our powers. For since you cannot defy us, and since the desire for life burns as high in you as in us, and as it does in all sentient things in the universe, your people will save themselves from death and save us from wasting energy by mining the ores for us. What happens afterwards, we do not care. The seven new suns that you saw were dead worlds that we used as buffers to slow down Slabati. The full strength of our repulsion force directed against any single world necessarily turns it into a liquid or gaseous state depending on various factors. Your planet Neptune was pulled out of the solar system by the attraction of Zlobati's mass. The flame paths, as you call them, are directed streams of energy for different purposes. The one to the sun supplies us, for instance, with heat, light and electricity, which in turn are stored up for eventual use. The orange ray that you felt is one of our achievements. It's similar to the double action pumps used in some of your sulfur mines whereby a pipe is enclosed in a larger pipe and hot water forced down through the larger tubing, returning sulfur-laden through the central pipe. The orange ray instantaneously dissolves any portable object up to a certain size, 
propels it back to Zlobati through its center, which is the reverse ray, and here reforms the object, just as you were recreated on the disc that you stood on when you regained consciousness. But I didn't have enough time to explain everything on Zlobati to you, nor would you comprehend it all if you did. Your stay is almost up. In that one control panel lies all the power that we have mastered, boasted Garbareg with supreme egotism. It connects with the individual controls throughout Zlobarty. What's the purpose of some of these levers? asked Fobar, with a desperate hope in his thoughts. A filament of metal whipped to the panel from the Lord of Zlobarty. This first section duplicates the control panel that you saw in the laboratory, where you opened your eyes. Do not think that you can make use of this information. In ten minutes you will be back on your earth to deliver our command. Between now and that moment you will be so closely watched that you can do nothing and will have no opportunity to try. Now this first lever controls the attraction rays, the second the repulsion force, the third dial regulates the orange ray by which you will be returned to earth. The fourth switch directs the electrical bolt that destroyed New York City. Next, it is a device that we have never had occasion to use. It releases the Krangor wave throughout Zlobati. Its effect is to make each atom of Zlobati, the Sraleth metal and everything on it, become compact, to do away with the empty spaces that exist in every atom. Theoretically, it would reduce Zlobati to a fraction of its present size, diminish its mass while its weight and gravity remained as before. The next lever controls matter to be transported between here and the first laboratory. Somewhat like the orange ray, it disintegrates the object and reassembles it here. So, so that was what Phobar's captor had been trying to do with him back there in the laboratory. Why was I not brought here by that means? burst out Phobar. Because you belong to a different universe answered Gabore. Without experimentation we cannot tell what natural laws of ours you would not be subject to, but this is one of them. A gesture of irritation seemed to come from him now. Some laws hold good in all the universes we have thus far investigated. The orange ray, for instance, picked you up as it would have plucked one of us from the service of Gripton, but on a Slavati, which is composed entirely of Slaret. Your atomic nature and physical constitution are so different from ours that they were unaffected by the energy that ordinarily transports objects here. And thus the metal nightmare went rapidly over the control panel. At length, Phobar's captor, or another thing like him, re-entered when Garbareg flicked a strange-looking protuberance on the panel. You will now be returned to your world, came the thought of Garbareg. We shall watch you through our Cosmotel to see that you deliver our instructions. Unless the nations of Earth obey us, they will be obliterated at the end of seven days. Uh, a wild impulse to smash that impassive metallic master passed from Phobar as quickly as it came. He was helpless. Sick and despairing, he felt the cold, baffling colored metal close around him again. And once more he was borne aloft for the journey to the laboratory. From there to be propelled back to Earth. Seven days of grace. But Phobar knew that less than ten minutes remained to him. Only here could he possibly accomplish anything. Once off the surface of Zlobati, there was not the remotest chance that all the nations of Earth could reach the invaders or even attempt to defy them. And what could he do alone in a week, to say nothing of ten minutes? He sensed the amused, supercilious contempt of his captor. And that was really the greatest obstacle, this ability of theirs to read thought pictures. And already he'd given them enough word pictures of English so they could understand. In the back of Phobar's mind, the ghost of a desperate thought suddenly came. What was it he'd learned years ago in college? Homer, the Odyssey, a Plutarch. From rusty, disused corners of memory crept forth the half-forgotten words. He bent all his efforts to the task, not daring to think ahead or plan ahead or visualize anything but the Greek words. He felt the bewilderment of his captor. To throw it off the track, 
Hobart suddenly let an ancient English nursery rhyme slip into his thoughts. The disgust that emanated from his captor was laughable. Fobar could have shouted aloud. Mm, but the Greek words. Already the pair had left the mountain high Titan city far behind, and they rippled across the smooth black surface of Zabati, and bore like rifle bullets down on the swiftly looming laboratory. In a few minutes it would be too late for ever. Now the lost Greek words burst into Fobar's mind, and, hoping against hope, he thought in Greek word pictures which his captor could not understand. He weighed chances, long shots. Into his brain flashed an idea. But they were now upon the laboratory, and a stupendous door dissolved weirdly into shimmering haze, and they sped through. Phobar's hand clutched a bulge in his pocket. Would it work? How could it? They were now beyond the door, and racing across the great expanse of the floor, past the central tower, past the control panel which he'd first seen. Then, as if by magic, there leaped into Phobar's mind a clear-cut, vivid picture of violet oceans of energy crackling and streaking from the heavens to crash through the laboratory roof and barely miss striking his captor behind. Even as Phobar created the image of that terrific death, his captor whirled around in a lightning movement, a long arm of metal flicking outward at the same instant to drop Phobar to the ground. Like a flash, Phobar was on his feet, his hand whipped from his pocket, and with all his strength he flung a gleaming object straight toward the fifth lever on the control panel a dozen yards away. As a clumsy arrow would, his oversized bunch of keys twisted to their mark, clanked and spread across the fifth control, which was the size regulator. As rapidly as Phobar's captor had spun around, it reversed again, having guessed his trick. A tentacle of pliant metal snaked toward Phobar like a streak of flame. But in those few seconds, a terrific holocaust had taken place. As Phobar's keys battered against the fifth lever, there came an immediate, growing, strange, high-pitched whine, and a sickening collapse of the very surface beneath them. Everywhere, outlines of objects wavered, changed, melted, shrank with a steady and nauseatingly swift motion. The roof of the laboratory high overhead plunged downward, the far distant wall swept inward, contracted, and the metal monsters themselves dwindled as though they were vast rubber figures from which the air was hissing. Phobos sprang back as the tentacle whipped after him. Only that jump and the suddenly dwarfing dimensions of the giant saved him. And even in that instant of wild action, Phobos shouted aloud, for this whole world was collapsing, together with everything on it except he himself, who came from a different universe, and remained unaffected. It was the long shot he'd gambled on, the one chance he'd had to strike a blow. All over the shrinking laboratory, the monsters were rushing toward him. His dwindling captor flung another tentacle toward the control panel to replace the size-regulating lever, but Fobar had anticipated that possibility and had already leapt to the switchboard sweeping a heavy bar from its place and crashing it down on the lever so hard that it could not be replaced without being repaired. Almost in the same move, he'd bounded away again, the former hundred-foot giant now scarcely more than his own height. But throughout the laboratory, the other metal things had halted in their tasks and were racing onward. Phobar always remembered that battle in the laboratory as a scene from some horrible nightmare. The catastrophe came so rapidly that he could hardly follow the whirlwind events. The half-dozen great leaps he made from the lashing tentacles of his pursuer sufficed to give him a few seconds' respite, and then the weird, howling sound of the tortured world swelled to a piercing wail. His lungs were laboring from the violence of his exertions. Again and again he barely escaped from the curling whips of the metal tentacles. And now the monster was hardly a foot high. The huge condensers and tubes and colossal machinery were like those of a pygmy laboratory, and overhead the roof plunged ever downward. But Phobar was cornered at last. He stood in the centre of a circle of the foot-high things. His captor suddenly shot forth a dozen rope-like arms toward him as the others closed in. He didn't even have a weapon, but he dropped the bar in his first mad bound away from the control panel. 
he saw himself trapped in his own trip. For in minutes at most the laboratory would be crushing him with fearful force. Blindly, Phobar reverted to a primitive defence in this moment of infinite danger, and he kicked with all his strength at the squat monster before him. The thing tried to whirl aside, but Phobar's shoe squashed thickly through, and in a disorder of quivering pieces the metal creature fell and subsided. Knowing at last that the invaders were vulnerable, and how they could be killed, Phobar went leaping and stamping on those nearest him. Underfoot they disintegrated into little pulpy lumps of inert metal. And in a trice he broke beyond the circle and darted to the control panel. One quick glance showed him that the roof was now scarcely a half dozen yards above. With fingers that fumbled in haste at tiny levers and dials, he spun several of them. The repulsion ray full, the attraction ray full. And when they were set, he picked up the bar, he dropped and smashed the controls so that they were helplessly jammed. You almost feel the planet catapult through the heavens. The laboratory roof was only a foot over his head now. He whirled around, squashed a dozen tiny creeping things, leapt to a disc that was now not more than a few inches broad. Stooping low, balancing himself precariously, he somehow managed to close the tiny switch. The haze of orange light enveloped him. There came a great vertigo and dizziness and pain. He felt himself falling through bottomless spaces. So exhausted that he could scarcely move, Phobar blinked his eyes open to brilliant daylight in the chill of a November Indian summer noon. The sun shone radiant in the heavens. Off in the distance he heard a pandemonium of bells and whistles. Wearily he noticed that there were no flame paths in the sky. Staggering weakly, he made his way to the observatory mounted the steps with tired limbs and wobbled to the eyepiece of his telescope, which he'd left focused on the dark star two hours before. Almost trembling, he peered through it. The dark star was gone. Somewhere far out in the abysses of the universe, a runaway world plunged headlong at ever-mounting speed to uncharted regions under its double acceleration of attraction and repulsion. A sigh of contentment came from his lips as he sank into a heavy and profound sleep. Later he would learn of the readjustments in the solar system, and of the colder climate that came to Earth, and of the vast changes permanently made by the invading planets, and of a blazing new star discovered in Orion that might signify the birth of a sun or the death of a metallic dark world. But these were events to be and he demanded his immediate reward of a day's dreamless slumber. The Man from 2071 Perhaps this story does not belong with my other tales of the Special Patrol Service, and yet there is, or should be, a report somewhere in the musty archives of the service covering the incident. Not accurately, you know, not in detail. Among a great mass of old records which I was browsing through the other day, I happened across that report. It occupied exactly three lines in the logbook of the air tug. Just before departure, discovered stowaway, apparently demented, and ejected him. For the hard-headed higher-ups of the service, that report was enough. Or had I given the facts, they would have called me to the base for a long-winded investigation have taken weeks and weeks filled with fussy questioning. Dozens of stoop-shouldered laboratory men would have prodded and snooped and asked for long written accounts. In those days keeping the logbook was writing enough for me, and being grounded at base for weeks would have been punishment. Nothing would have been gained by any detailed reports. The service needed action rather than reports anyway. But, well, now that I'm an old man, on the retired list, I have time to write and it will be a particular pleasure to write this account, for it will go to prove that these much-honoured scientists of ours, with all their tremendous appropriations and long-winded discussions, are not nearly so wonderful as they think they are. They are, and always have been, too much interested in abstract formulas, and not enough in their practical application. Never had a great deal of use for it. Well, I've received orders to report to Earth, 
regarding a dull routine matter of reorganising the emergency base which had been established there. Oh, Earth, I might add, for the benefit of those who have forgotten your geography of the universe. It's not a large body, but its people furnished almost all of the officer personnel of the Special Patrol Service. Now, being a native of Earth, I received the assignment with considerable pleasure, despite its dry and uninteresting nature. It was a good sight to see old Earth, bundled up in her cottony clouds, growing larger and larger in the television disc. No matter how much you wander around the universe, no matter how small and insignificant the world of your birth, there is a tie that cannot be denied. I have set my ships down on many strange and unknown worlds, with danger and adventure awaiting me. But there is, for me, no thrill which quite duplicates that of viewing again that particular little ball of mud from whence I sprang. I've said that before, I shall probably say it again. I'm proud to claim Earth as my birthplace small end out of the way as she is. Our base on Earth was adjacent to the city of Greater Denver on the Pacific coast. Couldn't help wondering, as we settled swiftly over the city, whether our historians and geologists and other scientists were really right in saying that Denver had, at one period, been far from the Pacific. Well, it seemed impossible, as I gazed down on that blue, tranquil sea that it had engulfed hundreds of years ago, such a vast portion of North America. But I suppose the men of science know best. Well, I need not go into the routine business that brought me to Earth. Suffice to say, it was settled quickly, by the afternoon of the second day. Well, I'm referring, of course, to Earth days, which are slightly less than half the length of an Inaran of universe time. A number of my friends had come to meet me, visit me during my brief stay on Earth, and having finished my business with such dispatch, I decided to spend that evening with them, and leave the following morning. It was very late when my friends departed, and I strolled out with them to their monocar, returning the salute of the air tax lone sentry, who was pacing his post before the huge circular exit of the ship. The air tax lay lightly upon the earth, her polished sides gleaming in the light of the crescent moon. In the side toward me, the circular entrance gaped like a sleepy mouth. The sentry, knowing the eyes of his commander were upon him, strode back and forth with brisk, military precision. Slowly, still thinking of my friends, I made my way toward the ship. I'd taken only a few steps when the sentry's challenge rang out sharply. Halt! Who goes there? I glanced up in surprise. Shiro, the man on guard, had seen me leave. He should have had no difficulty in recognizing me, but, well, the challenge had not been meant for me. Well, between myself and the air tax, there stood a strange figure. An instant before, I would have sworn that there was no human in sight, save for myself and the sentry. But now this man stood not twenty feet away, swaying as though ill or terribly weary, barely able to lift his head and turn it toward the sentry. Friend, he gasped. Friend. I think he would have fallen to the ground if I hadn't clapped an arm around his shoulders and supported him. Just a moment, whispered the stranger. I'm a bit faint. I'll be all right. I stared down at the man, unable to reply. This was a nightmare, no less. I could feel the sentry staring, too. The man was dressed in a style so ancient that I couldn't remember that period. 21st century, at least, perhaps earlier. And while he spoke English, which is a language of Earth, he spoke it with a harsh and unpleasant accent that made his words difficult, almost impossible, to understand. Their meaning did not fully sink in until an instant after he'd finished speaking. Shiro, I said sharply. Help me take this man inside. He's ill. Yes, sir. The guard leapt to obey the order, and together we led him into the air tower, into my own stateroom. There was some mystery here, and I was eager to get at the root of it. The man with the ancient costume and the strange accent had not come to the spot where we'd seen him by any means with which I was familiar. He materialized out of thin air. There was no other way to account for his presence. We propped the stranger in my most comfortable chair, and I turned to the sentry. He was staring at our weird visitor with wondering, fearful eyes, and when I spoke he started as though stung by an electric shock. Very well, I said briskly. That'll be all, 
Resume your post immediately and... Shiro? Yes, sir. It won't be necessary for you to make a report of this incident. I'll attend to that. Understand? Yes, sir. I think it's to the man's everlasting credit, and to the credit of the service which had trained him, that he executed a snappy salute, did an about-face, and left the room without another glance at the man slumped down in my big easy chair. With a feeling of cold, nervous apprehension, such as I've seldom experienced in a rather varied and active life, I then turned to my visitor. He hadn't moved, save to lift his head. He was staring at me, his eyes fixed in his chalky white face. They were dark, long eyes, abnormally long, and they glittered with a strange, uncanny light. Are you feeling better? I asked. His thin, bloodless lips moved, but for a moment no sound came from them. He tried again. Water, he said. I drew him a glass from the tank in the wall of my room. He downed it at a gulp and passed the empty glass back to me. More, he whispered. He drank the second glass more slowly, his eyes darting swiftly, curiously around the room. Then his brilliant, piercing glance fell upon my face. Tell me, he commanded sharply, what year is this? I stared at him. It occurred to me that my friends might have conceived and executed an elaborate hoax, and then I dismissed the idea instantly. There were no scientists among them who could make a man materialize out of nothingness. Are you in your right mind? I asked slowly. The question strikes me as damnably odd, sir. The man laughed wildly and slowly straightened up in the chair. His long bony fingers clasped and unclasped slowly as though feeling were just returning to them. Your question, he replied in his odd, unfamiliar accent, is not unnatural under the circumstances. I assure you that I am of sound mind, of very sound mind. He smiled, rather a ghastly smile, and made a vague, slight gesture with one hand. Would you be good enough to answer my question? What year is this? Earth year, you mean. He stared at me then, his eyes flickering. Yes, he said. Earth year. Are there other ways of figuring time now? Oh, certainly. Each inhabited world has its own system. There's a master system for the universe. Well, who are you? What are you? That you should ask me a question the smallest child should know. First, he insisted. Tell me what year this is, Earth Reckoning. I told him, and the light flickered up in his eyes again, a cruel, triumphant light. Thank you. He nodded, and then slowly and softly, as though he spoke to himself, he added, oh, Less than half a century off. Less than half a century. And they laughed at me. Oh, I shall laugh at them now. Hmm. You choose to be mysterious, sir, I asked impatiently. No, no, you'll understand, and then you'll forgive me, I know. I've come through an experience such as no man has ever known before. If I'm shaken weak, surprising to you, it's because of that experience. He paused for a moment, his long, powerful fingers gripping the arms of the chair. You see, he added, I've come out of the past and into the present, or from the present into the future, <laughs> depends upon one's viewpoint. If I am distraught, then forgive me. A few minutes ago, I was Jacob Harbauer in a little laboratory on the edge of a mountain park near Denver. But now my nameless being hurtled into the future, pausing here many centuries from my own era. Do you wonder now that I'm so unnerved? Do you mean... I said slowly, trying to understand what he'd babbled for. That you have come out of the past, that you... that... you... Well, it was too monstrous to put into words. I mean, he replied, I was born in the year 2028. I'm 43 years old. Or oh, I was a few minutes ago, but... 
and his eyes flickered again with that strange, mad light. I'm a scientist. I've left my age far behind me for a time. I've done what no other human being has ever done. I've gone centuries into the future. But I don't understand. Could he, after all, be a madman? How can a man leave his own age and travel ahead to another? Even in this age of yours? Have they not discovered that secret? Harbauer exalted. You travel the universe, I gather. Your scientists have not yet learned to move in time. But listen, let me explain to you how simple the theory is. Um, I take it that you're an intelligent man. Your uniform and its insignia would seem to indicate a degree of rank, am I correct? I'm John Hansen, commander of the Airtop, of the Special Patrol Service, I informed him. Then you will be capable of grasping, in part at least, what I have to tell you. It's really not so complex. See, um, time is a river, flowing steadily, powerful, at a fixed rate of speed. It sweeps the whole universe along in its bosom at that same speed. That's my conception of it. Is that clear to you? Oh, I should think, I replied, that the universe is more like a great rock in the middle of your stream of time that stands motionless while the minutes, the hours, and the days roll by. No, the universe travels on the breast of the current of time. It leaves yesterday behind and sweeps on towards tomorrow. It's always been so until I challenged this so-called immutable law. I said to myself, why should a man be a helpless stick on the stream of time? Why need he be born on this slow current at the same speed? Why cannot he do as a man in a boat? Paddle backwards or forwards? Back to a point already passed? Ahead, faster than the current, to a point that, drifting, he would not reach so soon. In other words, why can he not slip back through time to yesterday, or ahead to well, tomorrow? And if to tomorrow, why not next year, next century? Oh, these are questions I ask myself. Other men have asked themselves the same questions, I know. They were not new, but... Harbauer drew himself far forward in his chair, and leaned close to me, almost as though he prepared himself to spring. No other man ever found the answer. Well, that remained for me. Well, I was not entirely correct, of course. I found that one could not go back in time. The current was against one. But to go ahead with the current at one's back, that was different. I spent six years on the problem, working day and night. Handicapped by lack of funds. Ridiculed by the press. Look. Harbauer reached inside his antiquated costume and drew forth a flat packet which he passed to me. I unfolded it curiously, my fingers clumsy with excitement. I could hardly believe my eyes. The thing Harbauer had handed me was a folded fragment of a newspaper, such as I'd often seen in museums. I recognized the old-fashioned type and the peculiar arrangement of the columns. Instead of being yellow and brittle with age, and preserved in fragments behind sealed glass. This paper was fresh and white, and the ink was as black as the day it had been printed. What this man said then must be true. He must... I can understand your amazement, said Harbauer. It did not occur to me that a paper which, to me, was printed only yesterday would seem so antique to you. But that must appear as remarkable to you as fresh papyrus, Newly inscribed with the hieroglyphics of the ancient Egyptians would seem to, well, people of my day and age. But you read it. You see how my world viewed my efforts. There was a sharpness, a bitterness in his voice, that made me vaguely uneasy. Even though he'd solved the riddle of moving in time as men have always moved in space, my first conjecture that I had a madman to deal with might not be so far from the truth. Well, ridicule and persecution have unseated the reason of all too many men. The type was unfamiliar to me, and the spelling was archaic, but I managed to stumble through the article. It read, as nearly as I can recall it, like this. Harbauer says time is like great river. 
Jacob Harbauer, local inventor, in an exclusive interview, propounds a theory that man can move about in time exactly as a boat moves about on the surface of a swift flowing river, save that he cannot go back in time on account of the opposition of the current. Well, that is very fortunate, this writer feels. It would be a terrible thing, for example, if some good-looking scamp from our present 21st century were to dive into the past and steal Cleopatra from Antony, or start an affair with Josephine and send Napoleon scurrying back from the front and let the Napoleonic Wars go to pot. We'd have to have all our histories rewritten. Harbauer is well known in Denver as the eccentric inventor who, for the last five or six years, has occupied a lonely shack in the mountains, guarded by a high fence of barbed wire. Well, he claims he's now perfected equipment which will enable him to project himself forward in time, and expects to make the experiment in the very near future. Well, this writer was permitted to view the equipment which Harbauer says will shoot him into the future. The apparatus is housed in a low, barn-like building in the rear of his shack. Along one side of the room is a veritable bank of electrical apparatus with innumerable controls, many huge tubes of unfamiliar shape and appearance, a mighty generator of some kind, and an intricate maze of gleaming copper bus bar. In the center of the room is a circle of metal, about a foot in thickness, insulated from the flooring by four truncated cones of fluted glass. Now this disc is composed of two unfamiliar metals, arranged in concentric circles. Above this disc, at a height of about eight feet, is suspended a sort of grid, composed of extremely fine silvery wires, supported on a framework of black insulating material. Asked for a demonstration of his apparatus, Harbauer finally consented to perform an experiment with a doll, a white short-haired mongrel that, Harbauer informed us, he kept to warn him of approaching strangers. Now he bound the dog's legs together securely, placed the struggling animal in the center of the heavy metal disc. Then the inventor hurried to the central control panel and manipulated several switches, which caused a number of things to happen almost at once. The big generator started with a growl and unsettled immediately into a deep hum. The whole row of tubes glowed with a purplish brilliancy. There was a crackling sound in the air, and the grid above the disc seemed to become incandescent although it gave forth no apparent heat. From the rim of the metal disc, thin blue streamers of electric flame shot up toward the grid, and the little white dog began to whine nervously. Now watch, shouted the Harbauer. He closed another switch, and the space between the disc and the grid became a cylinder of livid light, for a period of perhaps two seconds. Then Harbauer pulled all the switches and pointed triumphantly to the disc. It was empty. We looked around the room for the dog, but he was not visible anywhere. I've sent him nearly a century into the future, said Harbauer. We'll let him stay there for a moment and then bring him back. What do you mean to say, we asked, that the pup is now roaming around somewhere in the 22nd century? Harbauer said he meant just that, and added that he would now bring the dog back to the present time. The switches were closed again, but this time it was the metal plate that seemed incandescent, and the grid above that shot out the streaks of thin blue flame. As he closed the last switch, the cylinder of light appeared again, and when the switches were opened, there was the dog in the center of the disc, howling and struggling against his bonds. Look, cried Harbauer, he's been attacked by another dog or some other kind of animal, while in the future... You see the blood on his shoulder? We ventured the humble opinion that the dog had scratched or bit himself in struggling to free himself from the cords with which Harbaugh had bound him, and the inventor flew into a terrible rage, cursing and waving his arms as though demented. Feeling that discretion was the better part of valor, we beat a hasty retreat, pausing at the barbed wire gate only long enough to ask Mr. Harbauer if he'd be good enough sometime when he had a few minutes to spare to dash into next week and bring back some stock market reports to aid us in our financial investments. Under the circumstances, we did not wait for a response, but we presume we are persona non grata, the Harbauer establishment from this time on. And all in all, we are not sorry.
I folded the paper and passed it back to him. Some of the allusions I did not understand, but the general tone of the article was very clear indeed. You see, said Harbauer, his voice grating with anger, I try to be courteous to that man, to give him a simple, convincing demonstration of the greatest scientific achievement in centuries. And the fool returned to write this, to hold me up to ridicule, to paint me as a crack-brained, wild-eyed fanatic. Well, uh, it's hard for the layman to conceive of a great scientific achievement, I said soothingly. All great inventions and inventors have been laughed at by the populace at large. Ah, true, true. Harbauer nodded his head solemnly. But just the same. He broke off suddenly and forced a smile. I found myself wishing that he'd completed that broken sentence, though. I felt that he'd almost revealed something that would have been most enlightening. Oh, but uh, enough of that fool and his babblings, he continued. I'm here as living proof that my experiment is a success. I have a tremendous curiosity about the world in which I find myself. This, uh, I take it, is a ship for navigating space? That's right. The air talk of the Special Patrol Service. Would you care to look around a bit? I would indeed. There was a tremendous eagerness in the man's voice. You're not too tired. No, I quite recover from my experience. Harbauer leapt to his feet, those abnormally long, slitted eyes of his glowing. Oh, I'm a scientist, and I'm most curious to see what my fellows have created since, oh, since my own era. I picked up my dressing gown and tossed it to him. Slip this on, then, to cover your clothing. You'd be an object of too much curiosity to those men who are on duty, I suggested. Well, I was much taller than he was, and the garment came within a few inches of the floor. He knotted the cincture around his middle and thrust his hands into the pockets, turning to me for approval. I nodded, and motioned for him to precede me through the door. As an officer of the Special Patrol Service, it's often been my duty to show parties and individuals through my ship. Well... Most of these parties are composed of females who have only exclamations to make instead of intelligent comment, and who possess an unbounded capacity for asking utterly asinine questions. It was therefore a real pleasure to show Harbauer through the ship. He was a keen, eager listener. When he asked a question, and he asked many of them, he showed an amazing grasp of the principles involved. My knowledge of our equipment was, of course, only practical, save for the rudimentary theoretical knowledge that everyone has of present-day inventions and devices. The ethon tubes which lit the ship interested him only a little. The atomic generators, the gravity pads, their generators, and the disintegrator ray, however, well, he delved into with that frenzied ardor of which only a scientist, I believe, is capable. Questions poured out of him, and I answered them as best I could, or sometimes completely and satisfactorily. So that he nodded and said, oh, I see, I see. But sometimes so poorly that he frowned and cross-questioned me insistently until he obtained the desired information. In the big, soundproof navigating room, I explained the operation of the numerous instruments, including the two three-dimensional charts actuated by super-radio reflexes, television disc, the attraction meter, the surface temperature gauge, and the complex control system. Forward, I added, is the operating room. You can see it through these glass partitions. The navigating officer in command relays his orders to men in the operating room, who attend to the actual execution of those orders. Ah, just as a pilot or the navigating officer of a ship of my day gives his orders to the quartermaster at the wheel, nodded Harbauer, and began firing questions at me again, going over the ground we'd already covered, to check up on his information. I was amazed at the uncanny accuracy with which he graphed such a great mass of technical detail. It had taken me years of study to pick up what he had taken from me and apparently retained intact in something more than an hour of Earth time. I glanced at the Earth time clock on the wall of the navigating room as he triumphantly finished his questioning. Less than an hour remained before the time set for our return trip. I'm sorry, 
I commented, to be an ungracious host, but I'm wondering what your plans may be. You see, we're due to start in less than an hour, and... And a passenger would be in your way. Harbauer smiled as he uttered the words, but there was a gleam in his long eyes that rather startled me. I wondered if I only imagined the steeliness of his voice. Well, don't let that worry you, sir. It's not worrying me, I replied, watching him closely. I have enjoyed a very remarkable, a very pleasant experience. If you should care to remain aboard the air tide, I should like exceedingly to have you accompany us to our base, where I could place you in touch with other laboratory men, with whom you would have much in common. Harbauer threw back his head and laughed. Not pleasantly. Thanks, he said. But I have no time for that. They could give me no knowledge that I need now. You've told me and showed me enough. I understand how you've released atomic energy. It's a matter so simple that a child should have guessed it. A man has wondered about it for centuries. Knowing that the power was there but lacking a key to unfetter it. But now I have that key. True, but perhaps our scientists would like, in exchange, the secret of moving forward in time, I suggested, reasonably enough. Uh, what do I care about them? snapped Harbauer. He loosened the cord of the robe with a quick, impatient gesture, as though it confined him too tightly, and threw the garment from him. Then, suddenly, he took a quick stride toward me, and thrust out his ugly head. I know enough now to give me power over all my world, he cried. Haven't you guessed the reason for my interest in your engines of destruction? I came down the centuries ahead of my generation, so I might come back with power in my hand. Power to wipe out the fools who have made a mockery of me. And I have that power. Here. Yeah. He tapped his forehead dramatically with his left hand. I'll bring a new regime to my era, he continued, fairly shouting now. I'll be what many have tried to be, and what no man has ever been, the master of the world. Absolute, unquestioned, supreme master. He paused, his eyes glaring into mine, and I knew from the light that shone behind those long, narrow slits that I was dealing with a madman. True, you will, I said gently, moving carelessly toward the microphone. With that in my hand, a slight pressure on the general attention signal, and I would have the whole crew of the air attack here in a moment. But I'd explained the workings of the navigation room's equipment only too well. Stop, snarled Harbauer, and his right hand flashed up. See this? Perhaps you don't know what it is, so I'll tell you. It's an automatic pistol, not so efficient as your disintegrator ray, deadly enough. There is certain death for eight men in my hand, understand? Perfectly. What an utter fool I'd been. I was not armed, and I knew that Harbauer spoke the truth. I'd often seen weapons similar to the one he held in the military museums. They're still there if you're curious. Rusty and broken, but not unlike our present atomic pistols in general appearance. They propelled the bullet by the explosion of a sort of powder. Inefficient, of course, but, as he'd said, deadly enough for the purpose. Good. You are a good sword, Hanson, but don't take any chances. I'm not going to, I promise you. You see, and he laughed again, the light in his long eyes dancing with evil. I'm not likely to be punished for a few killings committed centuries after I'm dead. I've never killed a man, but I won't hesitate to do so now, if one or more should get in my way. But why? I asked, soothing. Why should you wish to kill anyone? You have what you came for, you say. Why not depart in peace? He smiled crookedly, and his eyes narrowed with cunning. You approve of my little plan to dominate the world? He asked softly, his eyes searching my face. No, I said boldly, refusing to lie to him. I do not, and you know it. Ah, very true. 
He pulled out his watch with his left hand and held it before his hand so he could observe the time without losing sight of me for even an instant. I doubted that I could secure your willing cooperation. Therefore, I am commanding it. You see, there are a few instruments and pieces of equipment that I should like to take back to my laboratory with me. Perhaps I'd be able to reproduce them without models, but with the models my task will be much easier. Ah, the question remaining is a simple one. Will you give me the proper orders to have this equipment removed to the spot where you first saw me? Or shall I be obliged to return to my own era without this equipment? leaving behind me a dead commander of the Special Patrol Service and any other who may try to stop me. I tried to keep cool under the lash of his mocking voice. I've never been adept at holding my temper when I should, but somehow I managed it this time. Frowning, I kept him waiting for a reply, utilizing the time to do what was perhaps the hardest, fastest thinking of my life. There wasn't a particle of doubt in my mind regarding his ability to make good his threat, nor his readiness to do so. I caught the faint glimmering of an idea and fenced with it eagerly. How are you going back to your own period, your own era? I asked him. You told me that it was impossible to move backward in time. That's not answering my question, he said, leering. Don't think you're fooling me. But, well, I'll tell you just the same. I can go back to my own era. That is, back to my own actual existence. I shall return just two hours after I leave. I couldn't go back further than that, and it's not necessary that I do so. I can only go back because I came from that present. I'm not really of this future at all. So I go back from whence I came. But, uh, I objected, thinking of something I'd read in the clipping each showed me. You're not going back to your own era. You can't. If you return, you put your project into execution. The history doesn't record that activity. I saw from the sudden narrowing of his abnormally long eyes that I caught his interest. I pressed my advantage hastily. Remember that all the history of your time is written, Harbauer. It's in the books of Earth's history, with which every child of this age into which you have thrust yourself is familiar. And those histories do not record the domination of the world by yourself. And so, you're confronted by an impossibility. All well, my reasoning now sounds specious, and yet it was a line of thought which could not be waved aside. I saw Harbauer's black brows knit together, and mounting anger darkened his face. I don't know, but I believe I was never nearer death than I was at that instant. A fool! he cried. Idiot! Imbecile! You think you can confuse me? Turn me from my purpose with words? Do you? Do you believe me to be a child or a weakling? I tell you, I've planned this thing to the last detail. If I hadn't found what I saw from this first trip, I would have taken another, a dozen, a score, until I found the information I saw. Now, the last sixty years of my life, I've worked day and night to this end. Your histories and your work. My plan had worked. The man was beside himself with insane anger, and in his rage he forgot, for an instant, that he was my captor. Taking a desperate chance, I launched myself at his legs. His weapon roared over my head, just as I struck. I felt the hot gas and the thing beat against my neck. I caught the reeking scent of the smoke. And then we were both on the floor, and locked in a mad embrace. Harbauer was a smaller man than myself, but he had the amazing strength of a Xenia. He fought viciously, using every ounce of his strength against me, striving to bring his weapon into use, hammering my head upon the floor, racking my body mercilessly, grunting, cursing, mumbling constantly as he did so. But I was in better shape than Harbauer. I've never seen a laboratory man who could stand the strain of prolonged physical exertion. Bending over test tubes and meters is no life for a man. A grips with him, I was in my own element, and he was out of his. I let him wear himself out, exerting myself as little as possible, confining my efforts to keeping his weapon where he couldn't use it. I felt him weakening at last, 
His breath was coming in great sobs. His long eyes started from their sockets with the strained effort he was putting forth. And then, with a single mighty effort, I knocked the pistol from his hand so that it slid across the floor and brought up with a crash against a wall of the room. Now, I said, and turned on him. He knew, at that moment when I put forth my strength, that I'd been playing with him. I read the shock of sudden fear in his eyes. My right arm went about him in a deadly hold. I had him in a grip that paralyzed him. Grimly, I jerked him to his feet, and he stood there trembling with weakness, his shoulders heaving as his breath came and went between his teeth. You realize, of course, that you're not going back, I said quietly. Back? Half dazed, he stared at me through the quivering lids of his peculiar eyes. What do you mean? I mean that you're not going back to your own era. You've come to us, uninvited, and you're going to stay here. No, no, he shouted, and struggled so desperately to free himself that I was high put to hold him, without tightening my grip sufficiently to dislocate his shoulders. You wouldn't do that. I must return. I must prove to them. No. That's exactly what must not happen. And what shall not happen. I interrupted. You know, you're in a strange predicament, Harbauer. It's already written that you do not return. Can't you see that, man? If it were to be that you left this age and returned your own, you'd make known your discovery. History would record it, but history does not record it. You're struggling, not against me, but against, well, against a fate that's been sealed all these centuries. And when I'd finished, he stared at me as though hypnotized, motionless and limp in my grasp. And then, suddenly, he began to shake, and I saw such depths of terror and horror in his eyes as I never hoped to see again. Mechanically, he glanced down at his watch, lifting his wrist into his line of vision as slowly and ponderously as though it bore a great weight. Two, two minutes, he whispered huskily. Then the automatic switch will close, back in my laboratory. If I am not standing well, where you found me between the disk and the grid of my time machine, where the reversed energy can reach me to, to take me back then... God. He sagged in my arms and dropped to his knees, sobbing. And yet, what you say is true. It's already written that I did not return. His sobs cut harshly through the silence of the room. Pitying his despair, I reached down to give him a sympathetic pat on the shoulder. It is a terrible thing to see a man break down as Harbauer had done. As he felt my grip on him relax, he suddenly shot his fist into the pit of my stomach and leapt to his feet. Groaning, I doubled up, weak and nerveless. From that instant, vicious, unexpected blow. <sighs> Shrieked Harbauer. You soft-hearted fool. He struck me then in the face, sending me crashing to the floor, and snatched up his pistol. Well, I'm going now, he shouted. Going. What do I care for your records and your history? They're not yet written. If they were, I'd change them. He then bent over me and snatched from my hand the ring of keys, one of which I'd used to unlock the door of the navigating room. I tried to grip him around the legs, but he tore himself loose, laughing insanely in a high-pitched cackling sound that seemed hardly human. Farewell, he called mockingly from the doorway. And then the door slammed, and as I staggered to my feet, I heard the lock click. I must have acted then by instinct or inspiration. There was no time to think. It would take him not more than three or four seconds to make his way to the exit, stroll by the guard to the spot where we'd found him, and then disappear. By the time I could arouse the crew and have my orders executed, his time would be up, and unless the whole affair were some terrible nightmare, he would go hurtling back through time to his own era, armed with a devastating knowledge. 
There was only one possible means of preventing his escape in time. I ran across the room to the emergency operating controls, cut in the atomic generators with one hand, and pulled the vertical ascent lever to full power. There was a sudden shriek of air, and my legs almost thrust themselves through my body. Quickly I pushed the lever back until, with my eye on the altimeter, I held the air attack at her attained height, something over a mile as I recall it. Then I pressed the general attention signal and snatched up my microphone. Less than a minute later, Corey and Hendricks, fellow officers, were in the room and besieging me with solicitous questions. Well, it had been my idea, of course, to keep Harbauer from leaving the ship, but it was not so destined. Shiro, the sentry on duty outside the air tower, was the only witness to Harbauer's fate. I was walking my post, sir, he reported, watching the sun come up when suddenly I heard the sound of running feet inside the ship. I turned towards the entrance and drew my pistol to be in readiness. I saw the stranger we had taken into the ship appear at the exit, which, as you know, was open. Just as I opened my mouth to command him to halt, the air attack shot up from the ground at terrific speed. The stranger had been about to leap upon me. Indeed, he had discharged some sort of weapon at me, for I heard a crash of sound and a missile of some kind. Well, as you know, this passed through my left arm. As the ship left the ground, he tried to draw back, but he was off balance and the inertia of his body momentarily incapacitated him, I think. He slipped, clutched at the gangway across the threads which seal the exit, and then, at a height I estimate to be of around 500 feet, he fell. The air attack shot on up until it was lost to sight, and the stranger crashed to the ground a few feet from where I was standing, on almost exactly the spot where we first saw him, sir. And, uh, now, sir, comes a part I guess you'll find hard to believe. When he struck the ground, he was smashed flat. He died instantly. Well, I started to run toward him, and then, well, then I stopped. My eyes had not left the spot for a moment, sir. But he, his body, that is, suddenly disappeared. That's the truth, sir, for I saw it with my own eyes. There wasn't a sign of him left. Mm, I see, I replied. I believe that I did see. We'd gone straight up, and his body, by no great coincidence, had fallen upon the spot close to the exit of the air tap where we'd first found him. And his machine, in operation, had brought him or rather, his mangled body, back to his own age. Dom, you've not mentioned this affair to anyone, Shiro. No, sir, it wasn't anything you'd be likely to tell. Nobody would believe you. I went at once to have my arm attended to, and then reported here according to orders. Very good, Shiro. You, um, keep the entire affair to yourself. I'll make all the necessary reports. That's an order, understand? Yes, sir. And that'll be all. Take good care of your arm. He saluted me with his good hand, and then left. Later in the day, I wrote in the logbook of the air attack the report I mentioned at the beginning of this story. Just before departure, discovered Stowaway, apparently demented, and ejected him. And that was a perfectly truthful statement, and it served its purpose. Now I've given the whole story in detail just to prove what I've so often contended, that these owlish laboratory men whom this age reveres so much are not nearly so wise and omnipotent as they think they are. Well, I'm quite sure they would have discredited or attempted to discredit my story had I told it at the time. They would have resented the idea that someone so much ahead of them had discovered a principle that still baffles this age of ours. I would have had no evidence to present. Well, perhaps even now the story will be discredited. If so, I don't care. I'm much too old, and too near the portals of that impenetrable mystery, in the shadow of which I've stood so many times, to concern myself with what others may think or say. Well, I know that... What I've related here is the truth, and in my mind I have a vivid and rather pitiful picture of a mangled body, bloody and alone, 
in the barn-like structure that the ancient paper had described, a body broken and motionless, lying across that striated metal disc, like a sacrificial victim, a victim and a sacrifice of science. There have been many such. The Soul Snatcher by Tom Curry The shrill voice of a woman broke the steady hum of the many machines in the great, semi-darkened laboratory. It was the onslaught of weak femininity against the ebony shadow of Jared, the silent servant of Professor Ramsey Burr. Not many people were able to get to the famous man against his wishes, as Jared obeyed orders implicitly and was generally an efficient barrier. I will see him. I will, screamed the middle-aged woman. I'm Mrs. Mary Baker, and he... It's his fault my son's going to die. His fault. The professor. Professor Burr. Jared was unable to keep her quiet. Coming in from the sunlight, her eyes were not yet accustomed to the strange, subdued haze of the laboratory. An immense chamber crammed full of equipment, the vista of which seemed like an apartment in hell. Bizarre shapes stood out from the mass of impedimentia. Great stills which rose two full stories in height. Dynamos, immense tubes of coloured liquids, a hundred puzzles to the inexpert art. The small plump figure of Mrs. Baker was very out of place in this setting. Her voice was poignant, reedy. A look at her made it evident that she was a conventional, good woman. She had soft, cloudy golden eyes and a pathetic mouth and she seemed on the point of tears. Madam, madam, the doctor is busy, whispered Jared, endeavouring to shoo her out of the laboratory with his polite hands. He was respectful, but firm. She refused to obey. She stopped when she was within a few feet of the activity in the laboratory, and stared with fear and horror at the centre of the room, and its occupant, Professor Burr, whom she had addressed during her flurried entrance. The professor's face, as he peered at her, seemed like a disembodied stare, for she could only see eyes behind a mask of lavender-grey glass eye-holes, with its flapping ends of dirty, grey-white cloth. She drew in a deep breath and gasped, for the pungent fumes, acrid and penetrating, of sulfuric and nitric acids, stabbed at her lungs. It was like the breath of hell, and aptly Professor Burr seemed like the devil himself, manipulating these infernal machines. Acting swiftly, the tall figure stepped over and threw two switches in a single, sweeping movement. The vermilion light, which had lived in a long row of tubes on a nearby bench, abruptly ceased to writhe like so many tongues of flame, and the embers of hell died out. Then the professor flooded the room in harsh grey-green light and stopped the high-pitched humming whine of his dynamos. A shadow picture writhing on the wall, projected from a lead glass barrel, disappeared suddenly. The great colour filters and other machines lost their semblance of horrible life, and a regretful sigh seemed to come from the metal creatures as they gave up the ghost. To the woman, it had been like entering the abode of fear. Oh, she couldn't restrain her shudders, but she bravely confronted the tall figure of Professor Burr as he came forth to greet her. He was extremely tall, with a red, bony mask of a face pointed at the chin by a sharp little goatee. Feathery blonde hair, silvered and awry, covering his great head. Madam, said Burr in a gentle, disarmingly quiet voice. Your manner of entrance might have cost you your life. Luckily I was able to deflect the rays from your person, or else you might not now be able to voice your complaint, for such seems to be your purpose in coming here. He turned to Jared, who was standing close by. Very well, Jared, you may go. After this it will be as well to throw the bolts, although in this case I am quite willing to see the visitor. Jared slid away then 
leaving the plump little woman to confront the famous scientist. For a moment, Mrs. Baker stared into the pale grey eyes, the pupils of which seemed black as coal by contrast. Some, with his bitter enemies among them, claim that Professor Ramsey Burr looked cold and bleak as an iceberg, others saying that he had a baleful glare, and his mouth was grim and determined. Yet, through her eyes, Mrs. Baker, looking at the professor's bony mask of a face, with that high-bridged, intrepid nose, those passionless grey eyes, thought that Ramsey Burr would be handsome, if a little less cadaverous and more human. The experiment which you ruined by your untimely entrance, continued the professor, was not a safe one. His long white hand waved toward the bunched apparatus. But to her, the room seemed all glittering metal coils of snake-like wire, ruddy copper, dull lead, and tubes of all shapes. Hell cauldrons of unknown chemicals seethed and slowly bubbled. Beetle-black baker-like fixtures reflected the hideous light. Oh, she cried, clasping her hands as though she addressed him in prayer. Forget your science, Professor Burr. Be a man. Help me. Three days from now, my boy, my son, whom I love above all else in the world, is going to die. Well, three days is a long time, said the professor calmly. Do not lose hope. I have no intention of allowing your son, Alan Baker, to pay the price for a deed of mine. And I freely confess it was I who was responsible for the death of, what was the person's name? Smith, I believe. It was you who made Alan get poor Mr. Smith to agree to the experiments which killed him, and which the world blamed on my son, she said. They called it the deed of a scientific fiend, Professor Burr. Perhaps they're right, but Alan, Alan's innocent. Be quiet, ordered Burr, raising his hand. Remember, madam, your son Alan is only a commonplace medical man. While I taught him a little from my vast store of knowledge, he was ignorant and of much less value to science and humanity than myself. Do you not understand? Can you not comprehend also that the man Smith was a martyr to science? He was no loss to mankind, and only sentimentalists could have blamed anyone for his death. Well, I should have succeeded in the interchange of atoms which we were working on, and Smith would at this moment be hailed as the first man to travel through space in invisible form, projected on radio waves, had it not been for the fact that the alloy which conducts the three types of sinusoidal failed me burned out. Yes, it was an error in calculation, and Smith would now be called the Lindbergh of the atom but for that. Yet Smith has not died in vain, for I have finally corrected this error. Science is but trial and correction of error, and all will be well. Alan, Alan must not die at all, she cried. For weeks he's been in that death house. Oh, it's killing me. The governor refuses him a pardon, nor will he commute my son's sentence. In three days he's to die in the electric chair, for a crime which you admit you alone are responsible for. And yet you remain in your laboratory, immersed in your experiments, and do nothing, nothing. The tears came now, and she sobbed hysterically. It seemed that she was making an appeal to someone in whom she'd only a forlorn hope. Nothing, repeated Burr, pursing his thin lips. Nothing. Madam, I have done everything. I have, as I've told you, perfected the experiment. It's successful. Your son has not suffered in vain. Smith's name will go down with the rest of science's martyrs as one who died for the sake of humanity. But if you wish to save your son, you must be calm. You must listen to what I have to say, and you must not fail to carry out my instructions to the letter. I'm ready now. And with that light, the light of hope, sprang in the mother's eyes. She grasped his arm and stared at him with shining face, through tear-dipped eyelashes. D do you mean it? Can you save him? Even after the governor has refused me? What can you do? No influence will snatch Alan from the jaws of the law. The public's greatly excited and very hostile toward him. A 
quiet smile played at the corners of Burr's thin lips. Come, he says. Place this coat about you. Alan wore it when he assisted me. The professor replaced his own mask and conducted the woman into the interior of the laboratory. I will show you, said Professor Burr. She saw before her now on long metal shelves which appeared to be delicately poised on fine scales whose balance was registered by hairline indicators, two small metal cages. Professor Burr stepped over to a row of common cages set along the wall. There was a small menagerie there, guinea pigs, the martyrs of the animal kingdom, rabbits, monkeys, and some cats. The man of science reached in and dragged out a meowing cat, placing it in the right-hand cage on the strange table. He then obtained a small monkey and put this animal in the left-hand cage, beside the cat. The cat, on the right, squatted on its haunches, meowing and looking up at its tormentor. The monkey, after a quick look around, began to investigate the upper reaches of its new cage. Over each of the animals was suspended a fine, curious metallic armament. For several minutes, while the woman, puzzled at how this demonstration was to affect the rescue of her condemned son, waited impatiently. The professor deftly worked at the apparatus, connecting wires here and there. Right, I am ready now, said Burr. Watch the two animals carefully. Yes, sir. yes. She replied faintly, for she was quite afraid. The great scientist was stooping over, looking at the balances of the indicators through microscopes. She saw him reach for his switches, and then a brusque order caused her to turn her eyes back to the animals, the cat in the right-hand cage, the monkey at the left. Both animals screamed in fear, and a sympathetic chorus sounded from the menagerie as a long, purple spark danced from one grey metal pole to the other, over the cages on the table. At first Mrs. Baker noticed no change. The spark had died. The professor's voice, unhurried, grave, broke the silence. Ah, the first part of the experiment is over, he said. The ego... Oh my God, cried the woman. You've driven the poor creatures mad. She indicated to the cat. That animal was clawing at the top bars of its cage, uttering a bizarre chattering sound, somewhat like a monkey. The cat hung from the bars, swinging itself back and forth as if on a trapeze, and then reached up and hung by its hind claws. Well, as for the monkey, it was squatting on the floor of its cage. It made a strange sound in its throat, almost a meow, as it hissed several times at the professor. Oh, they are not mad, said Burr. As I was explaining to you, I finished the first portion of the experiment. The ego, the personality of one animal, has been taken out and put into the other. She was unable to speak. Well, he had mentioned madness. Was he, Professor Ramsey Burr, crazy? Well, it was likely enough, and yet, yet the whole thing... The surroundings did seem plausible. She hesitated about speaking, watching with fascinated eyes the out-of-character behavior of the two beasts. Burr went on. Oh, the second part follows at once. Now that the two egos have interchanged, I will shift the bodies. And when it's completed, the monkey will have taken the place of the cat, and vice versa. Now, what? He was busy for some time with his levers, and the smell of ozone reached Mrs. Baker's nostrils as she stared with horrified eyes at the animals. She then blinked. The sparks crackled madly. The monkey meowed, and the cat chattered. Were her eyes going back on her? She could now see neither animal distinctly. They seemed to be shaking in some cosmic disturbance, and were merely blurs. Well, this illusion for to her it seemed it must be optical, just persisted, or grew worse, until the quaking forms of the two unfortunate creatures were like so much ectoplasm in swift motion, ghosts whirling about in a dark room. 
Yeah, she could see the cages quite distinctly, and the table and even the indicators of the scalings. She closed her eyes for a moment. The acrid odours penetrated to her lungs, and she coughed, opening her eyes. Now, she could see clearly again. Yes, she could see a monkey, and it was climbing quite naturally about its cage. It was excited, but just a monkey. And the cat, while protesting mightily, did act like a cat. And then she gasped. Had her mind in the excitement betrayed her? She looked at Professor Burr. On his lean face there was a smile of triumph, and he seemed to be awaiting her applause. She looked again at the two cages. Surely at first the cat had been in the right-hand cage, and the monkey in the left, but now, now the monkey was in the place where the cat had been, and the cat had been shifted to the left-hand cage. And so it was with Smith, when the alloys burned out, said Burr. It is impossible to extract the ego or dissolve the atoms and translate them into radio waves unless there is a connection with some other ego and body, for in such a case the translated soul and body would have no place to go. Well, luckily for you, madam, it was the man Smith who was killed when the alloys failed me. It might have been Alan, for he was the second pole of the connection. <laughs> she began faintly. How can this mad experiment have anything to do with saving my boy? He waved impatiently at her evident stupidity. Do you not understand? It is so I will save Alan, your son. I shall switch our egos, or souls, as you say, and then switch the bodies. You must always take this sequence. Why, I have not ascertained. But it always works like this. Mrs. Baker was terrified. What she had just seen smacked of the blackest magic. Yet a woman in her position must grasp at straws. The world was blaming her son for the murder of Smith. A man Professor Burr had made use of as he might a guinea pig. And Alan must be snatched from the death house. Do, do you mean you can bring Alan from the prison to here? Just by throwing those switches? She asked. That's it. But there is more to it than that, for it is not magic, madam. It is science, you understand. There must be some physical connection. But with your help, that can easily be done. Professor Ramsey Burr, she knew, was the greatest electrical engineer the world had ever known. And he stood high as a physicist. Nothing hindered him in the pursuit of knowledge, they said. He knew no fear, and he lived on an intellectual mountaintop. He was so great that he almost lost sight of himself. To such a man nothing was impossible. And so hope, wild hope, sprang in Mary Baker's heart, and she grasped the bony hand of the professor and kissed it. Oh, I believe, I believe you, she cried. You can do it. You can save Alan. I'll do anything, anything you tell me to do. Very well. You visit your son daily at the death house, do you not? She nodded, a shiver of remembrance of that dread spot passing through her. Then you will tell him the plan and let him agree to see me the night preceding the electrocution. I'll give him final instructions as to the exchange of bodies. Then my life spirit, or ego, is confined in your son's body in the death house, and Alan will be able to perform the feat of changing the bodies, and your son's flesh will join his soul, which will have been temporarily inhabiting my own shell. Do you see? When they find me in the cell where they suppose your son to be, they will be unable to explain the phenomenon. They can do nothing but release me. Your son will go here, and can be whisked away to a safe place of concealment. Yes, yes, well, what am I supposed to do besides this? Professor Burr opened a drawer nearby, and from it extracted a folded garment of thin, shiny material. This is metal cloth coated with the new alloy, he said. He rummaged further, saying as he did so, I expected you'd be here to see me, and I've been getting ready for your visit. 
all is prepared, save a few odds and ends which I can easily clean up in the next two days. Here are four cups which Alan must place under each leg of his bed, and this delicate little director coil he must be especially careful with. It is to be slipped under your song's tongue at the time appointed. She was staring at him, still half in fear, half in wonder, yet she couldn't feel any doubt of the man's miraculous powers. Somehow, while he talked to her and rested those cold eyes upon her, she was under the spell of the great scientist. Her son, before the trouble into which he had been dragged by the professor, had often hinted at the abilities of Ramsey Burr, giving her the idea that his employer was practically a necromancer, yet a magician whose advanced scientific knowledge was correct and explainable in the light of reason. Yes, Alan had talked to her often when he was at home, resting from his labours with Professor Burr. He'd spoken of the new electricity discovered by the famous man, and also told his mother that Burr had found a method of separating atoms and then transforming them into a form of radioelectricity so they could be sent in radio waves to designated points. And she now remembered... The swift trial and conviction of Alan on the charge of murder had occupied her so deeply that she'd forgotten all else for the time being. But her son had informed her quite seriously that Professor Ramsey Burr would soon be able to transport human beings by radio. Neither of us will be injured in any way by the change, said Burr calmly. It is possible for me now to break up human flesh, send the atoms by radioelectricity, and reassemble them in their proper form by these special transformers and atom filters. Mrs. Baker took all the apparatus presented to her by the professor. She ventured the thought that it might be better to perform the experiment at once, instead of waiting until the last minutes. But this, Professor Burr waved aside as impossible. Uh, he needed the extra time, he said, and there was no hurry. She glanced around the room and... Her eyes took in the giant switches of copper with their black handles. There were others of a grey-green metal she didn't recognise. Many dials and meters strange to her, all confronting the little woman. These things, she felt with a rush of gratitude for the inanimate objects, were those that would help to save her son. So they interested her, and she began to feel kindly towards these great machines. Would Professor Burr really be able to save Alan, as he claimed? Yes, she thought, he could. She would make Alan consent to the trial of it, even though her son had cursed the scientist and cried he would never speak to Ramsey Burr again. She was escorted from the home of the Professor by Jared, and, going out into the bright, sunlit streets, she blinked her eyes as they adjusted themselves to the daylight after the strange light of the laboratory. In a bundle she had a strange suit and the cups. Her purse held the tiny coil, wrapped in cotton for safety. How could she get the authorities to consent to her son having the suit? The cups and the coil she might slip to him herself. Well, she decided that a mother would be allowed to give her son new underwear. Yes, she would say it was that. And so she started at once for the prison. Professor Burr's laboratory was about twenty miles from the cell where her son was incarcerated. As she rode on the train, Seeing people in everyday clothing, commonplace occurrences going on about her, the spell of Professor Burr faded, and cold reason stared her in the face. Was it nonsense, this idea of transporting bodies through the air in invisible waves? Yet she was old-fashioned. The age of miracles had not passed for her. Radio, in which pictures and voices could be sent on wireless waves, was unexplainable to her, so perhaps... She sighed and shook her head. It was hard to believe. It was also hard to believe that her son was in deadly peril, condemned to death as some scientific fiend. Oh, here was her station. A taxi took her to the prison, and after a talk with the warden, finally she stood there, before the screen through which she could talk to Alan, her son. Mom! Her heart lifted and melted within her. It was always thus when he spoke. Alan, she whispered softly. And they were allowed to talk, undisturbed. Come, Professor Burr wishes to help you, she said in a low voice. Her son, Alan Baker, M.D., 
turned eyes of misery upon her. His hair was awry. This young man was imaginative and could therefore suffer deeply. He had the gift of turning platitudes into puzzles, and his hazel eyes were lit with an elfin quality which, if possible, endeared him even more to his mother. All his life he'd been the greatest thing in the world to this woman, and to see him in such dire straits tore her very heart. When he'd been a little boy, she'd been able to make joy appear in those eyes by a word and a pat on the head. Now that he was a man, the matter was more difficult, but she'd always done her best. I cannot allow Professor Burr to do anything for me, he said dully. It's his fault that I am here. But, Alan, you must listen, and listen carefully. Professor Burr can save you. He said it was all a mistake. The ally was wrong. He's not come forward before because well, he knew he'd be able to iron out the trouble if he had time and thus snatch you from this terrible place. She put as much confidence into her voice as she could. She must, to enhearten her son. Anything to replace that look of suffering with one of hope. She would believe. She did believe. The bars, the great masses of stone which enclosed her son, would be as nothing. He would pass through them unseen and unheard. For a time, Alan spoke bitterly of Ramsay Burr. But his mother pleaded with him, telling him it was his only chance and that the devilry that Alan suspected was in his imagination. He, he killed Smith in such an experiment, said Alan. I took the blame, as you know, though I only followed his instructions. But, well, you say he claims to have found the correct alloys? Yes, and this suit, you must put it on. Professor Burr himself will be here to see you the day after tomorrow, the day preceding the... She bit her lip and got out the dreaded word. The electrocution. But well, there won't be any electrocution, Alan. No, there, there can be. You'll be safe. You'll be safe in my arms. Oh, she had to fight now to hold her belief in the miracle which Burr had promised. The solid steel and stone of this room dismayed her brain. Well, the new alloy seemed to interest Alan Baker. His mother told him of the exchange of the monkey and the cat, and he nodded excitedly, growing more and more restive, and his eyes began to shine with hope and curiosity. I've told the warden about the suit, saying it was something I made for you myself, she said in a low voice. You must pretend the coil and the cups are things you desire for your own amusement. You know, they've allowed you a great deal of latitude since you are educated and need diversion. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe some difficulty, but I'll overcome that. Okay, tell Burr to come. I'll talk with him, and he can instruct me in the final details. It's better than waiting in here like a rat in a trap. Oh, I've been afraid of going mad, Mom. And this, well, this buoys me up. He smiled at her then, and her heart sang in the joy of relief. Well, how did the intervening days pass? Mrs. Baker couldn't sleep, could scarcely eat. She could do nothing but wait, wait, and wait some more. She watched the meeting of her son at Ramsey Burr on the day preceding the date set for the execution. Well, Baker, said Burr nonchalantly, nodding to his former assistant. How are you? You see how I am, said Alan coldly. Yes, yes, well, listen to what I have to say and note it carefully. There must be no mistakes. You have the suit, the cups, and the director coil. Now you must keep the suit on. The cups go under the legs of the cot you lie on, and the director under your tongue. The professor then spoke further with Alan, instructing him in scientific terms which the woman could scarcely comprehend. Okay, tonight. Then, at 11.30, said Burr finally. Be ready. Alan nodded. Mrs. Baker accompanied Burr from the prison. You... you will let me be with you, she begged. Oh, it's hardly necessary, replied the professor. But I must. I must see Alan the moment he's free, to make sure he's all right. Then I want to be able to take him away. I have a place in which he can hide, and as soon as he's rescued, he must be taken out of sight. 
Very well, said Burr, shrugging. It's immaterial to me, so long as you do not interfere with the course of the experiment. You must sit perfectly still, and you must not speak until Alan stands before you and addresses you. Yes, I'll obey you, she promised. Mrs. Baker then watched Professor Ramsey Burr eat his supper. Burr himself was not in the least perturbed. It was wonderful, she thought, that he could be so calm. Well, to her it was the great moment, the moment when her son would be saved from the jaws of death. Jared carried a comfortable chair into the laboratory, and she sat in it, quiet as a mouse in one corner of the room. It was nine o'clock, and Professor Burr was busy with his preparations. She knew he'd been working steadily for the past few days. She gripped the arms of her chair, and her heart burned within her. The professor was making sure of his apparatus. He tested this bulb and that, and carefully inspected the curious oscillating platform over which was suspended a thickly bunched group of grey-green wire, which was, seemingly, an antenna. The numerous indicators and implements seemed to be satisfactory, for, at a quarter after eleven, Burr gave an exclamation of pleasure and nodded to himself. Burr seemed to have completely forgotten about the woman. He spoke aloud occasionally, but not to her, as he brought forth a suit made of the same metal cloth as Alan must have on at this moment. Well, the tension was terrific. Terrific for the mother, who was awaiting the culmination of the experiment, which would rescue her son from the electric chair. Or might it fail? She shuddered. What if Burr was mad? But then she looked at him. She was sure he was sane, well, as sane as she was. He will succeed, she murmured, digging her nails into the palms of her hands. I know he will. She pushed out of her mind the picture of what was going to happen tomorrow, only a few hours from now, when Alan, her son, was due to be led to a legal death in the electric chair. Professor Burr placed the shiny suit upon his lank form. She saw him put a duplicate coil, the same sort of machine which Alan possessed, under his tongue. The Mephistophelian figure then consulted a matter-of-fact watch. At that moment, Mrs. Baker heard, above the hum of the myriad machines in the laboratory, the slow chiming of a clock. Now was the moment for the deed. And then she feared the professor was indeed insane, for he suddenly leaped to the high bench of the table on which stood one of the oscillating platforms. Wires led out from this, and Burr sat gently upon it, a strange figure now in the subdued light. Professor Burr, however, she soon came to realise, was not insane. No, this was all part of it. He was reaching for switches near at hand, and bowls began to glow with unpleasant light. Needles on indicators swung madly, and then, at last, Professor Burr kicked over a giant switch, which seemed to be the final movement. For several seconds, the professor did not move, and then his body grew rigid, and he twisted a few times. His face, though not drawn in pain, did switch galvanically, as though actuated by slight jabs of electricity. The many tubes fluoresced, flared up in pulsing waves of violet and pink. There were grey bars of invisibility, or areas of air in which nothing visible showed. Then there came the faint, crackling hum of machinery, rather like a swarm of wasps in anger. Blue and grey threads of fire spat across the antenna. The odour of ozone came to Mrs. Baker's nostrils, and the acrid odours burned her lungs. She was staring at him now, staring at the professor's face. She half rose from her chair and then uttered a little cry. The eyes had changed. No longer were they cold, impersonal, the eyes of a man who prided himself on the fact that he kept his arteries soft and his heart hard. No, they were loving, soft eyes. Alan, she cried. Yes. Without doubt, the eyes of her son were looking at her out of the body of Professor Ramsey Burr. Mom, 
he said gently. Oh, don't be alarmed. It worked. I'm here. I'm in Professor Burr's body. Yes, she cried hysterically. Well, it was too weird to believe. It seemed, strangely to her, to be totally unearthly. Oh, are you all right, darling? she asked timidly. Yeah, I felt nothing beyond a momentary giddy spell, a bit of nausea and some mental stiffness. Well, it was strange and I have a slight headache, however, all is well. He grinned at her, laughed with a voice which was not quite his, yet which she recognized as coming from her son's spirit. The laugh was cracked and unlike Alan's wholehearted mirth, yet she smiled in sympathy. Yes, the first part is a success, said the man. Our egos have interchanged, and soon our bodies will undergo the transformation, and then I must keep undercover. Well, I dislike Burr, yet he is a great man, and he saved me. I suppose the slight headache which I feel is the one bequeathed me by Burr. Well, I hope he inherits my shivers and terrors and the neuralgia for the time being so you'll get some idea of what I've undergone. He got down now from the oscillating platform. The spirit of her son was in Ramsey's body. What? What are you doing now? She asked. Well, I must carry out the rest of it myself, he said. Burr directed me when we taught yesterday. Well, it's more difficult when one subject is out of the laboratory. Tubes have to be checked. He went carefully about his work, and she saw him replacing four of the tubes with others, new ones which were ready at hand. Though it was the body of Ramsey Burr, the movements were different from the slow, precise work of the professor, and more and more she realized that her son now inhabited the shell before her. Well, for a moment, the mother thought of attempting to dissuade her son from making the final change. Was it not better like this? than to chance the disintegration of the body. Suppose something went wrong, and the exchange didn't take place, and her son, that is, his spirit, just went back to the death house. Midnight struck as he worked feverishly at the apparatus, the long face corrugated as he checked the dials and tubes. He worked swiftly, but evidently was following a procedure which he had committed to memory, for he was forced to pause often to make sure of himself. Everything's okay, said the strange voice at last. He then consulted his watch. Twelve thirty, he said. Well, she bit her lip in terror as he cried, Now! and sprang to the table to take his place on the metallic platform, which oscillated to and fro under his weight. The delicate greyish metal antenna, which she knew would form a glittering halo of blue and grey threads of fire, rested now above his head. This is the last thing, he said calmly, as he reached for the big ebony-handled switch. I'll be myself in a few minutes, Mom. Yes, son. Yes. The switch connected, and Alan Barker, in the form of Ramsey Burr, suddenly cried out in great pain. His mother leaped up to run to his side, but he waved her away. She stood, wringing her hands, as he began to twist and turn, as though torn apart by some invisible force. Eerie screams came from the throat of the man on the platform, and Mrs. Baker's cries of sympathy mingled in with them. The mighty motors hummed in a high-pitched, unnatural whine, and suddenly Mrs. Baker saw the tortured face before her grow dim. The countenance of the professor seemed to mount, and then there came a dull, muffled thud, a burst of white-blue flame, the odour of burning rubber, and the tinkle of broken glass. Then back to the face came the clarity of outline, and it was still Professor Ramsey Burr's body that she was staring at. Her son, in the professor's shape, climbed from the platform and looked about him as though dazed. An acrid smoke filled the room, and burning insulation assailed the nostrils. Desperately, without looking at her, his lips set in a determined line, the man went hurriedly over to the apparatus again. God, have I forgotten them? 
Did I do something wrong? She heard his anguished cry. Two tubes were burned out, and these he replaced as swiftly as possible. But he was forced to go over all the wiring again and cut out whatever had been short-circuited so that it could be hooked up anew with uninjured wire. Before he was ready to resume his seat on the platform, after half an hour of feverish haste, a knock came on the door. The person outside was impatient, and Mrs. Baker ran over and opened the portal. Jared, the whites of his eyes shining in the dim light, stood there. Oh, the professor. Tell him that the warden wishes to speak with him. It's very important, ma'am. The body of Burr, inhabited by Alan's soul, pushed by her, and she followed falteringly, wringing her hands. She saw the tall figure snatch at the receiver and listen. Oh, God, he cried. And then, at last, he put the receiver back on the hook and sank down in a chair, his face in his hands. Mrs. Baker went to him quickly. What is it, Alan? she cried. Mom, he said hoarsely, it was the warden of the prison. He told me that Alan Barker had temporarily gone insane and claimed to be Professor Ramsey Burr in my body. But what's the matter? she asked. Can't you finish the experiment, Alan? Can't you change the two bodies now? He shook his head. Mom, they electrocuted Ramsey Burr in my body at 12.45 tonight. She screamed. She was faint, but she controlled herself with a great effort. Yeah, but the, <laughs> the electrocution wasn't to be until tomorrow morning, she said. Alan shook his head. Well, they're allowed a certain latitude, about twelve hours, he said. Burr protested up to the last moment and begged for more time. Oh, God, then they must have come and dragged him from his bed to die in that electric chair while you were attempting the second part of the change, she said. Yeah, that's why it failed. That's why the tubes and wires burned out and why we couldn't exchange bodies. It had begun to work. Then I could feel something terrible had happened. It was impossible to complete the beta circuit, which short-circuited. Well, they took him from the cell, you see, while I was starting the exchange of the atoms. For a time, the mother and her boy sat staring at one another. She saw the tall, eccentric figure of Ramsey Burr before her, and she also saw the soul of her son within that form. The eyes were Alan's, the voice was soft and loving, and his spirit was with her. Come, Alan, my son, she said softly. Well, Burr paid the price, said Alan, shaking his head. He became a martyr to science. The world has often wondered why Professor Ramsey Burr, so much in the headlines as a great scientist, suddenly gave up all his experiments and took up the practice of medicine. Well, now that the public furor and indignation over the death of the man Smith has died down, sentimentalists believe that Ramsey Burr has reformed and changed his icy nature, for he manifests great affection and care for Mrs. Mary Baker, the mother of the electrocuted man who had been his assistant. Four lives lay helpless before the murder machine, the uncanny device by which hypnotic thought waves are filtered through men's minds to mold them into murdering tools. The Murder Machine by Hugh B. K. It was dusk on the evening of December 7th when I first encountered Sir John Harmon. At the moment of his entrance, I was standing over the table in my study a lighted match in my cupped hands and a pipe beneath my teeth. That pipe was never lit. I heard the lower door slam shut with a violent clatter. The stairs resounded to a series of unsteady footsteps, and the door of my study was flung back. In the opening, staring at me with quiet dignity, stood a young, careless fellow, 
about five feet ten in height, decidedly dark of complexion. The swagger of his entrance branded him as an adventurer. The ghastly pallor of his face, which was almost colourless, branded him as a man who has found something more than mere adventure. <laughs> Dr. Dale? he demanded. I am Dr. Dale. Closed the door of the room deliberately, advancing toward me with slow steps. My name is John Harmon, Sir John Harmon. It is uh, unusual, I suppose, he said quietly with a slight shrug. Coming at this late hour, I won't keep you long. He faced me silently. A single glance at those strange features convinced me of the reason for his coming. Only one thing can bring such a furtive, restless stare to a man's eyes. Only one thing. Fear. I've come to you, Dale, because... <laughs> Sir John's fingers closed heavily over the edge of the table. Because... I'm on the verge of going mad. From fear? From fear, yes. I suppose it's easy to discover. I mean, a single look at me. A single look at you, I said simply, will convince any man that you are deadly afraid of something. Now, do you mind telling me what it is? He shook his head slowly. The swagger of the poise was gone. He stood upright now with a positive effort, as if the realization of his position had suddenly surged over him. I do not know, he said quietly. It's a childish fear. Fear of the dark, you may call it. Well, the cause does not matter, but if something doesn't take this unholy terror away, the effect will be madness. I watched him in silence for a moment, studying the shrunken outline of his face and the unsteady gleam of his narrowed eyes. I had seen this man before. All of London had seen him. His face was constantly appearing in the sporting pages, a swaggering member of the upper set, a man who had been engaged to nearly every beautiful woman in the country, who sought adventure in sport and uh, in nightlife, merely for the sake of living at top speed. And here he stood before me, whitened by fear, the very thing he had so deliberately laughed at. Dale, he said slowly, for the past week I've been thinking things that I don't want to think and well, doing things completely against my will. Some outside power, God knows what it is, is controlling my very existence. He stared at me then, and leaned closer across the table. Last night, sometime before midnight, he told me, I was sitting alone in my den. Alone, mind you, not a soul was in the house with me. Well, I was reading a novel, and suddenly, as if a living presence had stood in the room and commanded me, I was forced to put the book down. I fought against it, fought to remain in that room and go on reading. But, well, I failed. Failed? My reply was a single word of wonder. I left my home, because I couldn't help myself. Have you ever been under hypnotism, Dale? Yeah, well, the thing that gripped me was something similar, except that no living person came near me in order to work his hypnotic spell. I went alone the whole way, through back streets, alleys, filthy dooryards, never once striking a main thoroughfare, until I crossed the entire city and reached the west side of the square. And there, before a big grey townhouse, I was allowed to stop my mad wandering. Well, the power, whatever it was, had broken. And well, I went home. Sir John got to his feet then, with an effort, and stood over me. Dale, he whispered hoarsely. What was it? Hmm. You were conscious of every detail, I asked. Conscious of the time, of the locality you went to. You're sure it was not just some fantastic dream? Dream? Is it a dream to have some damnable force move me about like a mechanical robot? But you can think of no explanation. Well, I was a bit sceptical of his story. Well, he turned on me savagely. I have no explanation, Doctor, 
he said curtly. I came to you for an explanation. And while you're thinking over my case during the next few hours, perhaps you can explain this. When I stood before that grey mansion on After Street, alone in the dark, there was murder in my heart. I should have killed the man who lived in that house, had I not been suddenly released from the force that was driving me forward. Sir John then turned from me in bitterness. Without offering any word of departure, he pulled open the door and stepped across the sill. The door closed, and I was left alone. And that was my introduction to Sir John Harmon. I offer it in detail because it was the first of a startling series of events that led me to the most terrible case of my career. In my records, I've labelled the entire case The Affair of the Death Machine. Twelve hours after Sir John's departure, which will bring the time to the morning of December the 8th, the headlines of the Daily Mail stared up at me from the table. They were black and heavy. They were black and heavy, those headlines, and horribly significant. They were as follows. Franklin White Jr. found murdered. Midnight Marauder strangles young society man in West End Mansion. I turned the paper hurriedly and read, between the hours of one and two o'clock this morning, an unknown murderer entered the home of Franklin White Jr., well-known West End sportsman, and escaped, leaving behind his strangled victim. Young White, who is a favourite in London upper circles, was discovered in his bed this morning, where he had evidently lain dead for many hours. Police are seeking a motive for the crime, which may have its origin in the fact that White only recently announced his engagement to Margot Vernet young and exceedingly pretty French debutante. Police say that the murderer was evidently an amateur, and that he made no attempt to cover his crime. Inspector Thomas Drake of Scotland Yard has the case. Oh, there was more, much more. Young White had evidently been a decided favourite, and the murder had been so unexpected, so deliberate, that the male reporter had made the most of his opportunity for a story. But aside from what I've explained here, there was only a single short paragraph which claimed my attention, and it was this. The White Home is not a difficult one to enter. It is a huge grey townhouse, situated just off the square in After Street. The murderer entered by a low French window, leaving it open. Well, I have said here the words exactly as they were printed. The item does not call for any comment. But I'd hardly dropped the paper before she stood before me. I say she, it was Margot Vernet, of course, because for some particular reason I had expected her. She stood quietly before me, a cameo face set in the black of mourning, staring straight into mine. You know why I have come, she said quickly. I glanced at the paper on the table before me and nodded. Her eyes followed my glance. That is only part of it, Doctor, she said. I was in love with Franklin very much, but I have come to you for something more, because you are a famous psychologist and you can help me. She then sat down quietly, leaning forward so that her arms rested on the table. Her face was white, almost as white as the face of that young adventurer who had come to me on the previous evening. And when she spoke, the voice was hardly more than a whisper. Doctor, for many days now I have been under some strange power, something frightful that compels me to think and act against my will. She glanced at me suddenly as if to note the effect of her words, and then, I was engaged to Franklin for more than a month, Doctor, yet for a week now I have been commanded, commanded, by some awful force to return to... Well, to a man who knew me more than two years ago. I can't explain it. I did not love this man. I hated him bitterly. And now comes this mad desire, this hungering to go to him. And last night... Margot Vernet hesitated suddenly. She stared at me searchingly, and then, with renewed courage, she continued. Last night, Doctor, I was alone. I had retired for the night, and it was late nearly three o'clock, and then I was strangely commanded by this awful power that has suddenly taken possession of my soul 
to go out. I tried to restrain myself, and in the end I found myself walking through the square. I went straight to Franklin White's home, and when I reached there it was half past three. I could hear Big Ben. I went in through the wide French window at the side of the house. I went straight to Franklin's room, because I could not prevent myself from going. A sob came from Margot's lips. She had half risen from her chair and was holding herself together with a brave effort. I went to her side and stood over her, and she, with a half-crazed laugh, stared up at me. He was dead when I saw him, she cried. Dead, murdered. That infernal force, whatever it was, had made me go straight to my lover's side to see him lying there with those cruel finger marks on his throat. Dead, I tell you. Oh, it's horrible. She then turned suddenly. When I saw him, she said bitterly, the sight of him and the sight of those marks, well, it broke the spell that had held me. I crept from the house as if I had killed him. Well, they... they will probably find out I was there, and they'll accuse me of the murder. It doesn't matter, but, well, this power, this awful thing that has been controlling me, is there no way to fight it? I nodded heavily. The memory of that unfortunate fellow who had come to me with the same complaint was still holding me. I was prepared to wash my hands of the whole horrible affair. It was clearly not a medical case, and clearly out of my realm. There is a way to fight it, I said quietly. I am a doctor, not a master of hypnotism, or a man who can discover the reasons behind that hypnotism. But London has its Scotland Yard, and Scotland Yard has a man who is one of my greatest comrades. She nodded her surrender. As I stepped to the phone, I heard her murmur in a weary, troubled voice. Hypnotism. It is not that. God knows what it is, but it has always happened when I have been alone. One cannot hypnotize through distance. And yet, with Margot Vernet's consent, I sought the aid of Inspector Thomas Drake of Scotland Yard. In half an hour Drake stood beside me, in the quiet of my study. When he'd heard Margot's story, he asked a single, significant question. It was this. You say you have a desire to go back to a man who was once intimate with you. Who is he? Margot looked at him dully. It is Michael Strange, she said slowly. Michael Strange, of Paris, a student of science. Drake nodded. Without further questioning, he dismissed my patient, and when she'd gone, he turned to me. She did not murder her sweetheart, Dale, he said. That is evident. Have you any idea who did? And so I told him of that other young man, Sir John Harmon, who had come to me the night before. When I'd finished, Drake stared at me stared through me, and suddenly turned on his heel. I shall be back, Dale, he said curtly. Wait for me. Wait for him? Well, that was Drake's peculiar way of going about things. Impetuous, sudden, until he faced some crisis. Then, in the face of danger, he became a cold, indifferent officer of Scotland Yard. And so I waited. During the twenty-four hours that elapsed before Drake returned to my study, I did my best to diagnose the case before me. First, Sir John Harmon, his visit to the home of Franklin White, and then the deliberate murder, and, finally, young Margot Vernet and her confession. It was like the revolving whirl of a pinwheel, this series of events, continuous and mystifying, but without beginning or end. Surely somewhere in the procession of horrors there would be a loose end to cling to, some loose end that would eventually unravel the pinwheel. Well, it was plainly not a medical affair, or at least only remotely so. The thing was in proper hands then, with Drake following it through, and I had only to wait for his return. And he came at last and closed the door of the room behind him. He stood over me with something of a swagger. Well, I've been looking into the records of this Michael Strange, he said quietly. They are interesting, these records. They go back some ten years, 
when this fellow Strange was beginning his study of science. And now Michael Strange is one of the greatest authorities in Paris on the subject of mental telegraphy. He's gone into the study of human thought with the same thoroughness that other scientists go into the subject of radio telegraphy. He's written several books on the subject. Drake pulled a tiny black volume from the pocket of his coat and dropped it on the table before me. With one hand he opened it to a place which he'd previously marked in pencil. Read it, he said significantly. Well, I looked at him in wonder, and then did as he ordered. What I read was this. Mental telegraphy is a science, not a myth. It's a very real fact, a very real power which can be developed only by careful research. To most people it is merely a curiosity. They sit, for instance, in a crowded room at some uninteresting lecture, and stare continually at the back of some unsuspecting companion, until that companion, by the power of suggestion, turns suddenly around. Or they think heavily of a certain person nearby, perhaps commanding him mentally to hum a certain popular tune, until the victim, by the power of their will, suddenly fulfills the order. To such persons, the science of mental telegraphy is merely an amusement. And so it will be until science has brought it to such a perfection that these waves of thought can be broadcast, that they can be transmitted through the ether precisely as radio waves are transmitted. In other words, mental telegraphy is at present merely a mild form of hypnotism. Until it has been developed so that these hypnotic powers can be directed through space, and directed accurately to those individuals to whom they are intended, this science will have no significance. It remains for the scientists of today to bring about that development. I closed the book. When I looked up, Drake was watching me intently, as if expecting me to say something. Drake, I said slowly, more to myself than to him, the pinwheel is beginning to unravel. We found the beginning of the thread. Perhaps, if we follow that thread, Drake smiled. If you pick up your hat and coat, Dale, he interrupted, I think we have an appointment. This Michael Strange, whose book you have just enjoyed so immensely, is now residing on a certain quiet little side street about three miles from the square in London. I followed Drake in silence, until we'd left Cheney Lane in the gloom behind us. At the entrance to the square my companion called a cab, and from there on we rode slowly, through a heavy darkness which was blanketed by a wet, penetrating fog. The cabby, evidently one who knew my companion by sight, and what London cabby does not know his Scotland Yard name, chose a route that twisted through gloomy, uninhabited side streets, seldom winding into the main route of traffic. As for Drake, he sank back into the uncomfortable seat and made no attempt at conversation. For the entire first part of our journey he said nothing. Not until we'd reached a black, unlit section of the city did he turn to me. Dale, he said at length, have you ever hunted a tiger? I looked at him and laughed. Why? I replied. Do you expect this hunt of ours will be something of a blind chase? Oh, it will be a blind chase, no doubt of it he said, and when we have followed the trail to its end, I imagine we'll find something very like a tiger to deal with. I've looked rather deeply into Michael Strange's life, and unearthed a bit of the man's character. He's twice been accused of murder, murder by hypnotism, and has twice cleared himself by throwing scientific explanations at the police. That is the nature of his entire history for the past ten years. I nodded without replying. As Drake turned away from me again, our cab poked its labouring nose into a narrow and gloomy street. I had a glimpse of a single unsteady street lamp on the corner, then a dim sign, mate late. And then we were dragging along the curb. The cab stopped with a groan. I'd stepped down and was standing by the cab door when suddenly, from the darkness in front of me, a strange figure advanced to my side. He glanced at me intently, then, seeing that I was evidently not the man he sought, he turned to Drake. I heard a whispered greeting and an undertone of conversation, and then, quietly, 
Drake stepped toward me. Dale, he said, I thought it best that I should not show myself here tonight. No, there's no time for explanation now. You will understand later, perhaps. And, significantly, well, sooner than you anticipate, Inspector Hartnett will go through the rest of this pantomime with you. I shook hands with Drake's man, still rather bewildered at this sudden substitution. Then, before I was aware of it, Drake had vanished and the cab was gone. We were alone, Hartnett and I, in Mate Lane. The home of Michael Strange, number seven, was hardly inviting. No light was in evidence. The big house stood like a huge, unadorned vault set back from the street, some distance from its adjoining building. The heavy steps echoed to our feet as we mounted them in the darkness, and the sound of the bell, as Hartnett pressed it, came sharply to us from the silence of the interior. We stood there, waiting. In the short interval before the door opened, Hartnett glanced at his watch. It was nearly ten o'clock, and then said to me, I imagine, Doctor, we shall meet a black wall. Oh, let me do the talking, please. And that was all. In another moment, the big door was pulled slowly open from the inside, and in the entrance, glaring out at us, stood the man we had come to see. It's not hard to remember that first impression of Michael Strong. He was a huge man, gaunt and haggard, moulded with the hunched shoulders and heavy arms of a gorilla. His face seemed to be unconsciously twisted into a snarl. His greeting, which came only after he'd stared at us intently, for nearly a minute, was curt and rasping. Well, gentlemen, what is it? Oh, I should like a word with Dr. Michael Strange, said my companion quietly. I am Michael Strange. And I, replied Hartnett, with a suggestion of a smile, am Raoul Hartnett from Scotland Yard. I didn't see any sign of emotion on Strange's face. He stepped back in silence to allow us to enter. Then, closing the big door after us, he led the way along a carpeted hall to a small, poorly lit room just inside. Here he motioned to us to be seated, he himself standing upright beside the table facing us. From Scotland Yard, he said, and the tone was heavy with dull sarcasm. Well, I am at your service, Mr. Hartnett. And now, for the first time, I wondered just why Drake had insisted on my coming here to his gloomy house in Mate Lane. Why had he so deliberately arranged a substitute so that Michael Strong should not come face to face with him directly? Well, evidently Hartnett had been carefully instructed as to his course of action. But why this seemingly unnecessary caution on Drake's part? And now, after we gained admission, what excuse would Hartnett offer for the intrusion? Surely you would not follow the bull-headed role of a common policeman. Well, there was no anger, no attempt at dramatics in Hartnett's voice. He looked quietly up at our host. Dr. Strange, he said at length, I have come to you for your assistance. Last night, sometime after midnight, Franklin White was strangled to death. He was murdered, according to substantial evidence, by the girl he was going to marry. Margot Vernet. I come to you because you know the girl rather well, and perhaps you can help Scotland Yard in finding her motive for killing White. Michael Strange said nothing. He stood there, scowling down at my companion in silence. And I too, I must admit, turned upon Hartnett with a stare of bewilderment. His accusation of Margot had brought a sense of horror to me. I had expected almost anything from him, even to a mad accusation of Strange himself. I had hardly foreseen this cold-blooded declaration. You understand, Doctor, Hartnett went on in that same ironical drawl, that we do not believe Margot Vernet did this thing herself. Well, she had a companion, undoubtedly, one who accompanied her to the house on After Street, and assisted her in the crime. Who that companion was, we're not sure. But there's a decidedly a case of suspicion against a certain young London sportsman. Now, this fellow is known to be proud about the White Mansion both on the night of the murder 
and the night before. Hartnett glanced up casually. Strange's face was a total mask. When he nodded, the nod was the most even and mechanical thing I'd ever seen. Certainly this man could control his emotions. Oh, naturally, Doctor, Hartnett said. We've gone rather deeply into the past life of the lady in question. Well, your name appears, of course, in a rather unimportant interval when Margot Vernet resided in Paris. So we come to you in the hope that you can perhaps give us some slight bit of information. Or something that seems insignificant perhaps to you, but which may put us on the right track. It was a careful speech. Even as Hartnett spoke it, I could have sworn that the words were Drake's and had been memorised. But Michael Strange merely stepped back to the table and faced us without a word. He was probably, during that brief interlude, attempting to realise his position and to discover just how much Raoul Hartnett actually knew. And then, after his interim of silence, he came forward sullenly and spoke over my comrades. I'll tell you this much, Mr. Hartnett of Scotland Yard, he said bitterly. My relations with Margot Vernet are not an open book to be passed through the clumsy fingers of ignorant police officers. As to this murder, I know nothing. At the time of it, I was seated in this room in company with a distinguished group of scientific friends. I will tell you, on authority, that Margot did not murder her lover. Why? Well, because she loved him. The last words were heavy with bitterness. Before they died into silence, Michael Strange had opened the door of his study. Now, oh, if you please, gentlemen, he said quietly. Hartnett got to his feet. For an instant he stood facing the gorilla-like form of our host. Then he stepped over the sill without a word. We passed down the unlit corridor in silence, while Strange stood in the door of his study, watching us. I couldn't help but feel as we left that gloomy house, that Strange had suddenly focused his entire attention upon me, and had ignored my companion. Oh, I could feel those eyes upon me, and feel the force of the will behind them. A decided feeling of uneasiness crept over me, and I shuddered. A moment later, the big outer door had closed shut after us, and we were alone in Mate Lane. Alone, that is, until a third figure joined us in the shadow and Drake's hand closed over my arm. Captain Dale, he said triumphantly, for half an hour you entertained him, you and Hartnett, and for half an hour I've had the unlimited freedom of his inner rooms, with the aid of an unlocked window on the lower floor. Those inner rooms, gentlemen, are significant, very. As we walked the length of Mate Lane, the gaunt, sinister home of Michael Strange became an indistinct outline in the pitch behind us. Drake said nothing more on the return trip, until we'd nearly reached my rooms. Then he turned to me with a smile. We are one up on our friend there, he said. He does not know, just now, which is the bigger fool, you or Hartnett here. However, I imagine Hartnett will be the victim of some very unusual events before many hours have passed. And that was all, at least all of significance. I left the two Scotland Yard men at the opening of Cheney Lane and continued alone to my rooms. I opened the door and let myself in quietly. And there, some few hours later, began the last and most horrible phase of the case of the murder machine. It began, or to be more accurate, I began to react to it at three o'clock in the morning. I was alone and the rooms were dark. For hours I'd sat quietly by the table, considering the significant events of the past few days. Well, sleep was impossible with so many unanswered questions staring into me, and so I sat there wondering. Did Drake actually believe that Margot Vernet's simple story had been a ruse, that she had in truth killed her lover on that midnight intrusion of his home? Did he believe that Michael Strange knew of that intrusion, that he had possibly planned it himself and aided her? in order that Margot be free to return to him? And did Strange know of that other intrusion, and of the uncanny power which had driven Sir John Harmon, and supposedly driven Margot to that house or after street? And those were the questions that still remained without answers. It was over those questions that I pondered. 
while my surroundings became darker and more silent as the hour became more advanced. I heard the clock strike three and heard the answering drone of Big Ben from the square. And then it began. Well, at first it was little more than a sense of nervousness. Before I'd been content to sit in my chair and doze, but now, in spite of myself, I found myself pacing the floor back and forth like a caged animal. I could have sworn at the time that some sinister presence had found entrance to my room, and yet the room was empty. And I could have sworn too that some silent power of will was commanding me, an undeniable force, to go out, out into the darkness of Cheney Lane. Oh, I fought it bitterly, I laughed at it, yet even through my laugh came the memory of Sir John Harmon and Margot, and what they had told me. And then, unable to resist that unspoken demand, I seized my hat and coat and went out. Cheney Lane was deserted, utterly still. At the end of it, the street lamp glowed dully, throwing a patch of ghastly light over the side of the adjoining building. I hurried through the shadows, and as I walked, a single idea had possession of me. I must hurry, I thought, with all possible speed, to that grim house in Mate Lane, number seven. Where that deliberate desire came from, I did not know. I didn't stop to reason. Something had commanded me to go at once to Michael Strange's home. And though I stopped more than once, deliberately turning in my tracks, inevitably I was forced to retrace my steps and continue. I remember passing through the square and prowling through unlit side streets that lay beyond. Three miles separated Cheney Lane from Mate Lane, and I'd been over the route only once before in a cab. Yet I followed that route without a single false turn, followed it instinctively. At every intersecting street I was dragged in a certain direction, and not once was I allowed to hesitate. It was as though some unseen demon perched on my shoulders, as the demon of the sea rode Sinbad and pointed out the way. Only one disturbing thing occurred on that night journey through London. I turned into a narrow street hardly more than a quarter mile from my destination, and before me, in the shadows, I made out the form of a shuffling old man. And here, as I watched him, I was conscious of a new, mad desire. I crept upon him stealthily, without a sound. My hands were outstretched, clutching for his throat. At that moment, I could have killed him. I can't explain it. During that brief interval, I was a murderer at heart. I wanted to kill. And now that I remember it, the desire had been pregnant in me ever since the lights of Cheney Lane had died behind me. All the time that I prowled through those black streets, murder lurked in my heart. I could have killed the first man who crossed my path. But I didn't kill him. Thank God. As my fingers twisted toward the back of his throat, that mad desire suddenly left me. I stood still, while the old fellow, still unsuspecting, shuffled away into the darkness. Then dropping my hands with a sob of helplessness, I went forward again. And so I reached Mate Lane and the huge grey house that awaited me. Well, this time, as I mounted the stone steps, the old house seemed even more repulsive and horrible. I dreaded to see that door open, but I could not retreat. I dropped the knocker heavily. A moment passed, and then, precisely as before, the huge door swung inward, and Michael Strange stood before me. He didn't speak. Perhaps if he had spoken, that fiendish spell would have been broken, and I should have returned, even then, to my own peaceful little rooms in Cheney Lane. No, he merely held the door for me to enter. As I passed him, he stood there, watching me with a significant smile. Straight to that familiar room at the end of the hall I went, with Strange behind me. When we'd entered, he closed the door cautiously. For a moment, he faced me without speaking. You came very close to committing a murder on your way here, did you not, Dale? I stared at him. How in God's name could this man read my thoughts so completely? You would have completed the murder, he said softly, had I wished it. I did not wish it. 
I didn't answer. There was no way to reply to such a mad declaration. As for my companion, he watched me for an instant, and then laughed. He wasn't mad. Well, I'm doctor enough to know that. But the laugh was not long in duration. He stepped forward suddenly and took my arm in a steel grip, dragging me toward that half-hidden door at the farther end of the room. I shall not keep you long, Dale, he said harshly. I could have killed you. Could have made you kill yourself, and in fact, I intended to do so, but after all, you are merely a poor, stumbling fool who has meddled in things too deep for you. He pulled open the door and pushed me forward. The room was dark, and not until he closed the door again and switched on a dim light could I see its contents. Even then I saw nothing, at least nothing of importance to an unscientific mind. There was a low table against the wall, with a profusion of tiny wires emanating from it. I was aware that a cup-shaped microphone, or something very similar, hung over the table, about on a level with my eyes, had I been sitting in a chair. Beyond that I saw nothing until Strong should move forward and draw on aside a curtain that hung beside the table. I made you come here tonight, Dale, he murmured, because I was a bit afraid of you. Your comrade, Hartnett, was an ignorant police officer. He has not the intellect to connect the series of events of the past day or two, and so I did not trouble myself with him. But you, you're an educated man. You've made no demonstrations of your ability in the field of science, but... We stopped speaking abruptly. From the room behind us came the sound of a warning bell. Strange turned quickly and went to the door. You will wait here, Doctor, he said. I have another caller tonight. Another one who came the same way as you. And then he vanished. For a short interlude I was alone with that peculiar radio-like apparatus before me. It was, for all the world, like a miniature control room in some small broadcasting station. Except for the odd shape of the microphone, if it was such, I could detect no radical difference in the equipment. However, I had little time for conjecture. A patter of footsteps interrupted me from the next room, and a frightened, feminine voice broke the stillness of the outer study. Even before the owner of that voice stepped into my presence, I knew who it was. And when she came, with her white, fearful face and trembling body, I couldn't withhold a shudder of apprehension. It was the young woman who'd come to my office, Margot Vernet. Evidently, at last, she had yielded to the horrible impulse that had drawn her back to Michael Strange, an impulse which, I now understood, had originated from the man himself. He pressed her forward. There was nothing tender in his touch. Ah, it was cruel and triumphant. So, you succeeded at last, I said bitterly. He turned to me with a sneer. I have brought her here, yes, he replied. And now that she has come, she shall hear what I have to tell you. You will perhaps give her a respect for me, and this time she will not have the power to turn me away. He pointed at the table, to the apparatus that lay there. I'm telling you this, Dale, he said, because it gives me pleasure to do so. You are enough of a scientist to appreciate and understand it. And if, when I've finished, I've told you too much, there's a very easy way to keep your tongue silent. You have heard of hypnotism, Dale. You've also heard of radio. Have you ever thought of combining the two? He faced me directly then. I made no effort to reply. Radio, he said quietly, is broadcast by means of sound waves. That much you know. But hypnotism too can be transmitted through distance, if an instrument delicate enough to transmit thought waves can be invented. Well, for twenty-five years I've worked on that instrument, and for twenty years I have studied hypnotism. You understand, of course, that this instrument is worthless unless it's operated by a master mind. Thought waves are useless. They will not control the actions of even a cat. But hypnotic waves of concentrated thought, they will control the world. There was no denying him. He 
face me with the savage triumph of a wild beast. Well, he was glorying in his power and in my amazement. Well, I wanted Franklin White to die, he cried. It was I who murdered him. Why? Because he was about to take the girl I desired. Is that not reason enough for murder? And so I killed him. It was not Margot Vernet who strangled her lover. No, it was a complete stranger. A London sportsman who had no reason for committing the murder. Except that I wished him to. And so he died on the night of December 7th. Murdered by Sir John Harmon, the sportsman. Why? Because of all London, Sir John would be the last man to be suspected. I have a keen appreciation for the irony of fate. Why it would have died the night before, except that I lacked the courage to kill him. His murderer was standing under my power outside his very house, and then I suddenly thought it best that I should have an alibi. Oh, your Scotland Yard is clever, and it was best that I had protection. And so on the following night, I sent Sir John to the house once again. This time, while I sat here and controlled the actions of my puppet, a group of men sitting here with me. They believed that I was experimenting with a new type of radio receiver. Michael Strange laughed. He laughed harshly in utter triumph, like a cat laughs at the antics of his mouse victims. When the murder was done, he said, I set Margot to the scene so that she might see her lover strangled, dead, Oh, I repeat, Dale, that I enjoy the irony of fate, especially when I can control it. As for you, I brought you here tonight merely so you would realize the intensity of the powers that control you. When you leave here, you will be unharmed. But after the exhibition I shall give you, I'm sure that you will make no further attempt to interfere with things out of your realm of understanding. I heard a sob from Margot. She'd retreated to the door and clung there. As for myself, I didn't move. Strange's recital had revealed to me the horrible lust that gripped him, and now I watched him in fascination. He wouldn't harm the girl, that much I was sure of. In his distorted fashion, he really did love her. In his crazed, murderous way, he would attempt to win her love, even though she had once scorned him. I saw him step toward the table, I saw him drop heavily into the chair, and stared directly into that microphonic thing that hung before his eyes. As he stared, he spoke to me. Science, in its intricate forms, is probably above the mind of a common medical man, Jack, he said. It would be useless to explain to you how my thoughts, and my will, can be transmitted through space. Perhaps you sat in a theatre and stared at a certain person until that person turned to face you. You have? Well then, you will perhaps understand how I can control the minds of any human creature within the radius of my power. Ah, you see, Dale, this intricate little machine gives me the power to transform London into a city of stark murder. I could bring about such a horrible wave of crime that Scotland Yard would be scorned from one end of the world to the other. I could make every man murder his neighbour until the streets of the city were running with blood. Strange turned then, quietly, to look at me and spoke deliberately. And now for the little exhibition of which I spoke, Dale, he murmured. Your detective friend, Hartnett, has been under my power for the past three hours. You see, it was safer to control his movements and be sure of him, and now, to be doubly sure of him, perhaps you'd like to see him kill himself. Well, I stepped forward with a sudden cry. Strange said nothing. His eyes merely burned into mine. Once again I felt that strange, all-powerful control forcing me back. I retreated, step by step, until the wall stopped me. But even as I retreated, a childish hope filled me. How could Strange, working his terrible murder machine, concentrate his power on any individual when the whole of London lay before him? Well, he answered my question. He must have read it as it came over me. Uh, have you ever been in a crowd, Dale, and watched a certain individual intently until that particular individual turned to look at you? Well, the rest of the crowd pays no attention, of course. Just that one man. Now we shall make that one man murder himself. 
Strange turned slowly. I saw his fingers creep along the rim of the table, touching certain wires that came together there. I heard a dull, droning hum fill the room, and over it, Strange's penetrating voice. When I am finished, Dale, I shall probably kill you. I brought you here merely to frighten you, but I believe I may have told you too much. With that new horror upon me, I saw my captor's lips move slowly. And then, from the shadows at the other end of the small room, came a low, unemotional voice. Before you begin, Strong, Michael Strange whipped about in his chair like a tiger. His hand dropped to his pocket so swiftly that my eyes did not follow it, and as it dropped a single staccato shot split the darkness of the room, and the scientist slumped forward in his chair. The dull whirring sound of that hellish machine then stopped abruptly, cut short by the sudden weight of Strange's lunging body as he fell upon it. I saw the livid, fiery snake of white light twist suddenly upward through that coil of wires, and in another moment the entire apparatus shattered by a blinding crash of flame. After that, I turned away. Whether the bullet had killed Strange or not, I don't know. But the sight of his charred face, hanging over that table of destruction, told its own story. It was Inspector Drake who came across the room toward me and took my arm the smoking revolver still in his hand, as he led me to the adjoining room, where I saw Margot had already found refuge. You see now, Dale, Drake said quietly, why I let Hartnett go with you before. If Strange had suspected me, I would merely be another victim. As for Hartnett, he has been under constant guard down at the headquarters. He's safe. They've kept him there at my instructions, in spite of all his terrific efforts to leave them. I was listening to my companion in admiration, even though I didn't quite understand. I was wrong in just one thing, Dale. I left you alone without protection. I believe Strange would ignore you because, after all, you're not a Scotland Yard man. Thank God I had the sense to follow Margot to trail her here, and get here soon enough. So ended the horrible series of events that began with Sir John Harmon's chance visit to my study. As for Harmon, he was later cleared of all guilt upon the charred evidence in Michael Strange's house in Mate Lane. The girl, I believe, has left London, where she can be as far as possible from the memories that are all too terrible. As for me, I'm back once again in my quiet rooms in Cheney Lane, where the routine of common medical practice has wiped out many of those vivid horrors. In time, I believe I shall forget, unless Inspector Drake of Scotland Yard insists upon bringing the affair up again. When the moon turned green, it was nearly midnight when Bruce Dixon finished his work and wearily rose from before the workbench of his lonely mountain laboratory, located in an abandoned mine working in southern Arizona. He looked like some weirdly garbed monk of the Middle Ages as he stretched his tall, lithe figure. His head was completely swathed in a hood of lead cloth, broken only by twin eye holes of green glass. The hood merged into a long-sleeved tunic of the same fabric while leg-cloth gauntlets covered his hands. The leg-cloth costume was demanded by Dixon's work with radium compounds. The result of that work lay before him on the bench, a tiny leg capsule containing a pinhead lump of a substance which Dixon believed would utterly dwarf Earth's most powerful explosives in its cataclysmic power. So engrossed had Dixon been in the final stages of his work that for the last 72 hours he'd literally lived there in his laboratory. It remained now only for him to step outside and test the effect of the little contact grenade, and at the same time get a badly needed taste of fresh air. He set the safety catch on the little bomb and slipped it into his pocket. As he started for the door, he threw back his hood, revealing the ruggedly good-looking face of a young man in his early thirties, with the lines of weariness now etched deeply into the clean-cut features. 
The moment that Dixon entered the short winding tunnel that led to the outer air, he was vaguely aware that something was wrong. There was a strange and intangibly sinister quality in the moonlight that streamed dimly into the winding passage. Even the cool night air itself seemed charged with a subtle aura of brooding evil. Dixon reached the entrance and stepped out into the full radiance of the moonlight. He stopped abruptly and stared around him in utter amazement. High in the eastern sky there rode the disk of a full moon but it was a moon weirdly different from any that Dixon had ever seen before. This moon was a deep and baleful green, was glowing with a stark malignant fire like that which lurks in the blazing heart of a giant emerald. Bathed in the glow of the intense green rays, the desolate mountain landscape shone with a new and eerie beauty. Dixon took a dazed step forward, his foot thudded softly into a small feathered body there in the sparse grass he stooped to pick it up. It was a crested quail, with every muscle as stonily rigid as though the bird had been dead for hours. Yet Dixon, to his surprise, felt the slow faint beat of a pulse still in this tiny body. Then a dim group of unfamiliar objects down in the shadows of a small gully in front of him caught Dixon's eye. Tucking the body of the quail inside his tunic for later examination, he hurried down into the gully. A moment later, he was standing by what had been the night camp of a prospector. And the prospector was still there, his rigid figure wrapped in a blanket, and his wide-open eyes staring sightlessly at the malignant green moon in the sky above. Dixon knelt to examine the stricken man's body. It showed the same mysterious condition as that of the quail, rigidly stiff in every muscle, yet with a slow pulse and respiration of life still faintly present. Dixon found the prospector's horse and burrow, sprawled on the ground a dozen yards away, both animals frozen in the same baffling condition of living death. Dixon's brain reeled as he tried to fathom the incredible calamity that had apparently overwhelmed the world while he had been hidden away in his subterranean laboratory. Then a new and terrible thought assailed him. If the grim effect of the baleful green rays was universal in its extent, what then of old Emil Crawford and his niece, Ruth Lawton? Crawford, an inventor like Dixon, had his laboratory in a valley some five miles away. An abrupt chill went over Dixon's heart at the thought of Ruth Lawton's beauty being forever stilled in the grip of that eerie living death. Well, he and Ruth had loved each other ever since they'd first met. And so Dixon broke into a run as he headed for a nearby ridge that looked out over the valley. His pulse hammered with unusual violence as he scrambled up the steep incline, and his muscles seemed to be tiring with strange rapidity. He had a vague feeling that the rays of that malignant green moon were beating directly into his brain, clouding his thoughts and draining his physical strength. Gaining the crest of the ridge, he stopped aghast as he looked down the valley toward Emil Crawford's place. Near the site of Crawford's laboratory home was an unearthly pyrotechnic display such as Dixon had never seen before. An area several hundred yards in diameter seemed one vivid welter of pulsing colours, with flashing lances of every hue crisscrossing in and through a great central cloud of ever-changing opalescence, like a fiery aura borealis gone mad. Dixon fought back the ever-increasing lethargy that was benumbing his brain, and groped dazedly for a key to his new riddle. Was it some weird and colossal experiment of Emil Crawford's that was causing the green rays of death from a transformed moon, an experiment the earthly base of which was amid the seething play of blazing colours down there in the valley? The theory seemed hardly a plausible one. As far as Dixon knew, Crawford's work had been confined almost entirely to a form of radio-propelled projectile for use in wartime against marauding planes. Dixon shook his head forcibly in a vain effort to clear the stupor that was sweeping over him. It was strange how the vivid rays of that malevolent green moon seemed to sear insidiously into one's brain, stifling thought as a swamp fog stifles the sunlight. Then Dixon suddenly froze in stark immobility, staring with startled eyes at the base of a rocky crag thirty yards away. Something was lurking there in the green-black shadows, a great sprawling black shape of abysmal horror, with a single flaming opalescent eye fixed unwinkingly upon Dixon. The next moment the vivid moon was suddenly obscured by drifting wisps of cloud, 
As the green light blurred to an emerald haze, the creature under the crag came slithering out toward Dixon. He had a vague glimpse of a monster such as one should see only in nightmares, a huge, loathsome spider form with a bloated body as long as that of a man, and great sprawling legs that sent it half a dozen yards nearer Dixon in one effortless leap. The onslaught proved too much for Dixon's morale, half dazed as he was by the green moon's paralyzing rays. With a low, inarticulate cry of terror, he turned and ran, straining every muscle in a futile effort to distance the frightful thing that inexorably kept pace in the shadowy emerald gloom behind him. Dixon's strength faded rapidly after his first wild sprint. Fifty yards more and his faltering muscles failed him utterly. The dread rays of that grim green moon sapped his last faint powers of resistance. He staggered on for a few more painful steps, then sprawled helplessly to the ground. His brain hovered momentarily upon the verge of complete unconsciousness. Then he was suddenly aware of a fluttering struggle inside his tunic where he placed the body of the quail. A moment later, and the bird wriggled free. It promptly spread its wings and flew away, apparently as vibrantly alive as before the mysterious paralysis had stricken. The incident brought a faint surge of hope to Dixon, as he dimly realized the answer to at least part of the Green Moon's riddle. The bird had recovered after being shielded in the leg cloth of his tunic. Well, that could mean only one thing. The menace of those Green Moon rays must in some unknown way be radioactive. If Dixon could only get the leg cloth hood over his own head again, he also might cheat the Green Doom. He fumbled at the garment with fingers that seemed as stiff as wooden blocks. It was a long moment of agony when he feared that his effort had come too late. Then the hood finally slipped over his head, just as utter oblivion claimed him. Dixon came abruptly back to life with the dimly remembered echo of a woman's scream still ringing in his ears. For a moment he thought that he was awakening on his cot back in the laboratory after an unusually vivid and weird nightmare. Then the garish green moonlight around him swift realization that the incredible happenings of the night were a grim reality. The clouds were gone from the moon, leaving his surroundings again clearly outlined in the flood of green light. Dixon lifted his head and cautiously searched the scene, but he could see no trace of the great spider form that had pursued him. Wondering curiously why the creature had abandoned the chase at the moment when victory was within its grasp, Dixon rose lively to his feet. Protecting Hood had brought a quick and complete recovery from the devastating effects of the Green Moon's rays. His muscles were again supple, and his brain once more functioned with clearness. Then, abruptly, Dixon's blood froze as the sound of a woman's scream came again. The cry was that of a woman in the last extremity of terror, and Dixon knew with a terrible certainty that that woman was Ruth Lawton. He raced toward the small ridge of rocks from behind which the sound had apparently come. A moment later he'd reached the scene and stopped, horror-stricken. Three figures were there in a small rock-walled clearing. One was old Emil Crawford, sprawled unconscious on his side, the soft glow of a small white globe in a strange headpiece atop his grey hair shining eerily in the green moonlight. Near Crawford's body loomed the giant spider creature, and clutched firmly in the great claspers just under the monster's terrible fang mouth was the slender body of Ruth Lawton. Merciful unconsciousness had apparently overwhelmed the girl now, for she lay supinely in the dread embrace, with eyes closed and lips silent. As the monster dropped the girl's body to the ground and whirled to confront Dixon, for the first time he had a clear view of the thing in all its horror. He shuddered in uncontrollable nausea. The incredible size of the creature was repellent enough, but it was the grisly head of the monstrosity that struck the final note of horror. That head was more than half human. The fangs and other mouthparts were those of a giant tarantula, but these merged directly into the mutilated but unmistakable head of a man, with an aquiline nose, staring eyes, and a tussled mop of dirty brown hair. Resting on top of the head was a metallic headpiece similar to the one worn by Emil Crawford, but the small globe in this one blazed with a fiery opalescence. 
The creature crouched lower, with its legs twitching in obvious preparation for a spring. Dixon looked wildly about him for a possible weapon, but saw nothing. Then he suddenly remembered the little leg grenade in his pocket. The cataclysmic power of that little bomb should be more than a match for even this monster. His fingers closed over the grenade just as the great spider's twitching leg straightened in a mighty effort that sent it hurtling through the air straight toward him. Dixon dodged to one side with a swiftness that caused the monster to miss by a good yard. Dixon raced a dozen paces further away, then whirled to face this great spider. The creature's legs began scuttling warily forward. It was to be no wild leap through the air this time, but rather a swift rush over the ground that Dixon would be powerless to evade. Releasing the safety catch of the grenade, Dixon hurled the tiny missile straight at the rock floor just under the feet of that vast, misshapen creature. There was a vivid flash of blinding blue flame, then a terrific noise. Dazed by the concussion, but unhurt, Dixon cautiously went over to investigate the result of the explosion. One brief glance was enough. The hideous mass of shattered flesh sprawling there in the rocks would never again be a menace. The only thing that had escaped destruction in that shattering blast was a strange headpiece the thing had worn. Either the small shining globe was practically indestructible, or else it had been spared by some odd freak of the explosive, for it still blazed in baleful light atop the shattered head. Dixon hurried back to where Emil Crawford and Ruth Lawton lay. The girl's body was so rigidly inert that Dixon threw back his encumbering hood and knelt over her for a swift examination. His fears were quickly realized. Ruth was already a victim of the Green Moon's dread paralysis. Dixon! Bruce Dixon! Dixon turned at the call. Emil Crawford, his face drawn with pain, had struggled up on one elbow. The old man was obviously fighting off complete collapse by sheer willpower. Dixon, replace Ruth's shining headpiece at once, Crawford gasped. That'll make her immune from the Green Death. And then, then we can... The old man's voice swiftly faded away into silence as he again fainted. Dixon hurriedly searched the scene and found Ruth's headpiece on the ground, where it had apparently fallen in her first struggle with the giant spider. But the tiny white globe in the device was shattered and dark. Despair gripped Dixon for a moment. Then he remembered the unbroken headpiece of the slain monster. Well, true, the glow of its globe was opalescent instead of white, but it seemed to offer its wearer the immunity to the green moon's rays. He swiftly retrieved the headpiece from the spider creature's body and set the light metal framework in place on Ruth's open curls. Results came with incredible quickness. The rigidity left Ruth's body immediately. Her breath came in fast, quickening gasps, and her eyes fluttered open as Dixon knelt before her. It's Bruce, Ruth. Bruce Dixon, he said tenderly. Do you know who I am, dear? But there was no trace of recognition in those wide-open blue eyes staring fixedly up at him. For a moment, Ruth lay there, with muscles strangely tense. Then, with a lithe strength that was amazing, she suddenly twisted free of the clasp of Dixon's arms and sprang to her feet. The next minute Dixon gave ground, and he found himself battling for his very life. This was not the Ruth Lawton whom he had known and loved. This was a madwoman of savage menace, with soft lips writhing over white teeth in a jungle snarl, and blue eyes that fairly glittered with unrestrained, intense hate. He tried to close in on the maddened girl, but instantly regretted his rashness. Her slender body seemed imbued with the strength of a tigress, as she sent slim fingers clawing at his throat. He tore himself free just in time. Dazed and shaken, he again gave ground before the fury of the girl's attack. He couldn't bring himself to the point of actually fighting back, yet he knew that, in another moment, he would either have to mercilessly batter his beautiful adversary into helplessness, or else be himself overcome. There was no middle course. Then old Emil Crawford's voice came again, as the old man rallied to consciousness for another brief moment. Bruce, 
The opal globe is a direct link to those devils themselves. Break it, Bruce. Break it. For Ruth's sake as well as your own. Crawford had barely finished his gasp warning when Ruth again hurled herself forward upon Dixon with tapering fingers curved like talons as they sought his throat. Dixon swept her clutching hands aside with a desperate left-handed parry, then snatched wildly at the gleaming headpiece with his right hand. The thing came away in his grasp, and in the same swift movement he savagely smashed it against the rocky wall beside him. Whatever the opalescent globe's eerie powers might be, it was not indestructible. It shattered like a bursting bubble, its fire dying in a tiny cloud of particles that shimmered faintly for a moment, and then was gone. And once again the effect upon Ruth was almost instantaneous. Every trace of her insane fury had vanished. She swayed dizzily and would have fallen had not Dixon caught her in his arms. For a moment she looked up into his face with eyes in which recognition now shone unmistakably. Then her eyelids slowly closed and she again lapsed into unconsciousness. Dixon looked over at Emil Crawford and found that the old man had again collapsed. Dixon knew of but one thing to do with the stricken man and girl and that was to take them to his laboratory. The laboratory, apparently insulated by veins of lead ore in the mountain surrounding it, was the one sure spot of refuge in this weird nightmare world of paralyzing lunar rays and prowling monsters. Part 2 Flinging his tunic over Ruth's head to shield her as much as possible from the moonlight, he carried her to the laboratory then returned for Emil Crawford. Safe within the subterranean retreat of the old scientist, Dixon removed his encumbering leg costume and began doing what he could for the stricken pair. Ruth was still unconscious, but the cataleptic rigidity was already nearly gone from her body, and her breathing was now the deep respiration of normal sleep. But Emil Crawford's condition was more serious. Not only was the old man's frail strength nearly exhausted, but he was also badly wounded. His thin chest was seared by two great livid areas of burned flesh, the nature of which puzzled Dixon as he began to dress the injuries. They seemed to be of radioactive origin, yet in many ways they were unlike any radium burns Dixon had ever seen. While Dixon was working over them, Crawford stirred weakly and opened his eyes. He sighed in relief as he recognized his surroundings. Oh, good boy, Bruce, he commended warmly. We're safe here among the insulating veins of lead ore in the mountain. This is where Ruth and I were trying to come after we escaped from those devils tonight. But, oh, Bruce, how did you guess the radioactive nature of the green sickness in time to avoid falling a victim to it as soon as you left the shelter of your laboratory? My escape was entirely luck, Dixon admitted grimly. Tonight... I left my laboratory for the first time in three days, and I found a world gone mad, with a strange green moon blazing down upon a land of living dead men, and with marauding monsters hideous enough to have been spawned in the pit itself. What in heaven's name does it all mean? I'm afraid that it means the end of the world, Bruce, Crawford answered quietly. It's a little over 48 hours ago that the incredible event first happened. Without a moment's warning, the moon turned green. Hardly had the world's astronomers had time to speculate upon this amazing phenomenon before the green sickness struck. Pestilence of appalling deadliness that swept resistlessly in the path of those weird green rays. Wherever the green moon shone, every living creature succumbed with ghastly swiftness to the condition of living death that you've seen. Westward with a racing moon sped the green sickness nothing stopped its attack. The green rays pierced through buildings of wood, stone and iron, as though they didn't even exist. The doomed world had neither the time nor opportunity to guess that lead was the one armor against those dread rays. But tonight, Bruce, we are, in all probability, the only three human beings on this planet who are not slumbering in the paralytic stupor of the green sickness. Ruth and I were stricken with the rest of this world. Crawford continued. 
We recovered consciousness hours later to find ourselves captives in the earth camp of the invaders themselves. You probably saw the display of lights that marks their camp down in the valley a mile beyond my place. We've learned since that the ship of the invaders dropped silently down into the valley the night before the moon turned green. They established the camp as a sort of outpost and observatory. They left two of their number there as pioneers, and the rest of them departed in the spaceship for their present post up near the moon. Ruth and I were revived, only so the two invaders in the camp might question us regarding life on this planet. They have a science that's based upon principles as utterly strange and incomprehensible to us as ours probably is to them. They probed my brain with a thought machine. It was an apparatus that worked both ways. What knowledge they got from me, I don't know. But I do know that they unwittingly told me much in the bizarre and incredible mental pictures that the machine carried from their brains to mine. Well, they're refugees, Bruce, from a planet that's circled about the star we know as Alpha Centauri. A star that's the nearest of all of our stellar neighbors, being only four and a third light years distant. Their home planet was disrupted by a colossal engineering experiment of the Centaurians themselves. The only survivors being a group of fifty who escaped in a spaceship just before the catastrophe. Well, there were no other habitable planets in their own system. So in desperation, these refugees sped out across the void to our solar system, in the hope of finding a new home here. They did reconnaissance on our Earth secretly, and found it ideal. At first, they believed that they must conquer the life that already held this Earth. And to do this, they struck with the green sickness. The rays of the turning the moon green emanate from the spaceship hovering up there some 50,000 miles from the moon itself. The Centaurians race blending with the sunlight striking the disk of the full moon, are intensified in some unknown way, then reflected across a quarter of a million miles to the Earth to flood this planet with virulent radiance. The green moonlight is radioactive in nature and overcomes animal life within a matter of 15 minutes or less. The rays are the most powerful when the moon is in the sky, but their effect continues even after it is set because, well, as long as the green moonlight strikes any part of the Earth's atmosphere, the entire atmospheric envelope of the planet remains charged with the paralyzing radioactive influence. Well, Earth's inhabitants are not dead. They're merely stupefied. If the green rays were to cease now, most of the victims of the green sickness would quickly recover with little permanent injury. But Bruce, if that evil green moon blazes on for 24 hours more, the brain powers of Earth's millions will be forever shattered. So weakened will they be by then that recovery will be impossible, even with the ray shut off. And the entire planet will be populated by only mindless imbeciles, readily available material for the myriads of monstrous hybrids that the invaders will create to serve them. Well, tonight, you saw the hybrid that the invaders sent to recapture Ruth and me. It was a fit specimen of the grisly magic which those devils from outer space work with their uncanny surgery and their growth-stimulating radioactive rays. The basic element of that monster was an ordinary tarantula spider, with its growth incredibly increased in a few short hours of intensive ray treatment in the Centaurian's camp. The half-hair grafted to it was that of a human being. They always graft the brain cavity of a mammal to a hybrid. Half heads of burros, horses, or even dogs, but preferably those of human beings. I think that they prefer to use as great a brain power as possible. Well, the hybrids are controlled through the small, opalescent globes on their heads, globes that are in direct tune with a huge master globe of green fire in the invaders' camp. When Ruth attacked you after you placed the opal headpiece upon her head, she was for the moment, merely another of the invaders' servants blindly obeying the broadcast command to kill. The white gloves that Ruth and I wore when we escaped from the camp were identical with those worn by the invaders themselves, being nothing more than harmless insulators against the effect of the green moonlight. A sudden spasm of pain convulsed Crawford's face. Dixon sprang forward to aid him, but the old man rallied with an effort and weakly waved Dixon back. <sighs> I'm all right, Bruce, he gasped. My strength is nearly exhausted, that's all. Like a garrulous old fool, I've worn myself out talking about everything, 
apart from the one important subject. Bruce. Bruce, have you developed that new and infinitely powerful explosive you were working on? Yes, Dixon answered grimly. I have an explosive right here in the laboratory that can easily blow the Centaurians' camp completely off the map. And Crawford shook his head impatiently. Oh, destroying the camp would do no good. We must shatter the spaceship itself if we're to extinguish those green rays in time to save our world. Oh, that's impossible if the spaceship is hovering up there by the moon, Dixon protested. No, no, it's not impossible, Crawford answered confidently. I have a projectile in my laboratory that will not only hurtle across that great gap with incredible speed, but will also infallibly strike its target when it gets there. It's a projectile that's as irresistibly drawn by radio waves as steel is by a magnet, and it will speed as straight to the source of those waves as a bit of steel will to the magnet. Those Centaurians in the spaceship. Crawford continued, are in constant communication with their camp through radio apparatus, much like our own. If you can pack a powerful contact charge of your explosive in my projectile, then I can guarantee that when the projectile is released, it'll flash out into space and score a direct hit against the walls of their spaceship. Well, I can pack the explosive in the projectile, all right, Dixon answered grimly. We'll need only a lump the size of an egg a small container of the heavy gas that activates it. The explosive itself is a radium compound that, when allowed to come into contact with the activating gas, becomes so unstable that any sharp blow will set it off in an explosion that, in a matter of seconds, releases the infinite quantities of energy usually released by radium over a period of at least 1,200 years. The cataclysmic force of that explosion should be enough to wreck a small planet. Good. Crawford commanded weakly. If you can only strike your blow tonight, Bruce, our world still has a chance. If only you... The old man's voice suddenly failed. He sank back in utter collapse, his eyes closed, and his last vestige of strength spent. Knowing that the old man would probably remain in his sleep of complete exhaustion for hours, Dixon turned his attention to Ruth. Well, to his surprise, he found her sitting up, apparently completely recovered. Well, I'm quite all right again, she said reassuringly. I've been listening to what Uncle told you. Now you go ahead and prepare your explosive, Bruce. I'll do what I can for Uncle while you're working. Dixon donned his leg cloth hood and tunic again and set to work. Ten minutes later, he turned to Ruth with a slender foot-long cylinder of lead in his hand. Ruth... Will this fit your uncle's projector? he asked. Easily, she assured him. But isn't it frightfully dangerous to carry it in that form? No, it's completely safe now. It'll be safe until this stud is turned, releasing the activating gas from one compartment to mingle with the radium compound in the other section. Then the cylinder will become a bomb that any sharp jar will detonate. All right, let's go then, Ruth answered. But have you any more of those leg clothes I can wear? I could wear the globe headpiece that Uncle wore, but it would loom up in the dark like a searchlight. Dixon didn't protest Ruth's going with him. There was nothing further that could be done for Emil Crawford for hours, and in the hazardous journey to Crawford's laboratory, he knew that Ruth's cool courage and quick wits would at least double their chances of success in their desperate mission. He provided her with a reserve hood and tunic of leg cloth then handed her a tiny leaden pellet. Keep this for a last resort, he told her. It's a contact bomb that becomes ready to throw when this safety catch is snapped over. Oh, I wish we had a dozen of them, but that's the last capsule I had and there's no time to prepare more. He fished a rusty old revolver out of a drawer and placed it in his pocket. I'll use this gun for a last resort weapon myself, he said. The action only works about half the time. But it's the only firearm I have in the place. The green moon was still high in the sky as Ruth and Dixon emerged from the tunnel. But it was already beginning to drop gradually down toward the west. Dixon wheeled his disreputable fliver out of his nearby shed. 
With engines silent, they started coasting down the rough, winding road into the valley. For nearly two miles, they wound down the long grave. Then, just as they reached the valley floor, they saw, far up among the rocks to the left of the road, the thing that they'd been dreading. The bobbing, green globe that marked the presence of one of the Centaurians' hideous hybrids. The shimmering globe paused for a moment, then came racing down toward them. The need for secrecy was past. Dixon threw the car in gear and savagely pulled down the gas lever. With throttle wide open, they hurtled around the perilous curves of the narrow road. But always in the rocks beside and above them, they heard the scuttling progress of some huge, many-legged creature that constantly kept pace with them. They had occasional glimpses of the thing. Its pale, jointed body was some twenty feet in length and had apparently been developed from that of a centipede, with scores of racing legs that carried it with startling speed over the rocky terrain. The fliver raced madly on toward the blaze of kaleidoscopic colours that marked the Centaurian's camp. Crawford's home loomed up now barely a hundred yards ahead. As though sensing that its quarry was about to escape, the hybrid flashed a burst of speed that sent it on by the car for a full fifty yards and then down into the road directly in front, where it whirled to confront them. Dixon knew that he could never stop the car in the short gap separating them from that huge upreared figure, and to attempt swerving from the road upon either side was certain disaster. He took the only remaining chance. With throttle wide open, he sent the little car hurtling straight for the giant centipede. He threw his body in front of Ruth to shield her as much as possible, just as they smashed squarely into this hybrid. Well, the impact was too much for even that monstrous figure. It was hurled bodily from the road to crash upon the jagged rocks at the bottom of a thirty-foot gully. And there it sprawled in a broken mass, too hopelessly shattered to ever rise again. The fliver skidded momentarily, then crumpled to a full stop against the rocks at the side of the road. Dixon and Ruth scrambled from the wreckage and raced for Crawford's home, scarcely fifty yards ahead. They entered the laboratory and Ruth went directly over to where the radio projectile rested in a wall rack. Dixon took the gleaming cylinder down to examine it. Tapering to a rounded point at the front end, it was nearly a yard long and about five inches in diameter. The mechanism inside the projectile is turned off now, of course, Ruth said. If it were turned on, the projectile would have been on its way to the spaceship long ago, for the radio waves were as strong here as at the Centaurians' camp. The woman pointed to a small metal stud in the nose of the projector. When that's snapped over, it makes the contact that sets the magnetizing mechanism into action, she explained. Then the projectile will go hurtling directly for the source of any radio waves within range. I don't know the nature of its mechanism, Uncle merely told me that it's the application of an entirely new principle of electricity. Dixon laid the long projectile down on the workbench and began packing his lead cylinder of explosive inside it. He had to release the lead cylinder's safety catch before closing the projectile, which made his work a thrillingly precarious one, for any sharp blow now would detonate the unstable mixture of gas and radium compound in one cataclysmic explosion. He sighed in relief as he finally straightened up with the completed projectile held carefully in both hands. What we have to do now, Ruth, he said, is step out from under this roof and snap that energizing star. Then this little package of destruction will be on its way to our Centaurian friends up there by that pestilential green moon. Ruth stepped ahead to open the door for him. With the end of their task so near at hand, both forgot to be cautious. Ruth threw the door open and took one step outside, and suddenly screamed in terror as her shoulders were encircled by a long, snake-like object that came whipping down from some vast something that had been lurking just outside. Dixon tried to dodge back, but too late. Another great hairy tentacle came lashing around his shoulders, pinning his arms tightly and jerking him out of the doorway. He got a swift, vague glimpse of the hybrid looming there in the green moonlight. A tarantula hybrid that in size and horror dwarfed any of the frightful products of Centaurian science that he'd yet seen. 
Before Dixon had any time to note the details of his assailant, another tentacle curled around him, tearing the projectile from his grasp. Then he was irresistibly drawn up toward that grisly head where Ruth's body was also suspended in one of those powerful tentacles. The next moment, bearing its burdens with amazing ease, the giant hybrid set off. Dixon tried with all his strength to squirm free enough to get a hand upon the revolver in his pocket, but the constricting tentacle did not give for even an inch. The only result of his effort was to twist his hood to one side, leaving him as effectually blindfolded as though his head were in a sack. Long minutes of swaying, pinching motion followed as the hybrid sped over the rocky ridges and gullies. It finally came to a halt, and for another minute or so Dixon was held there motionless in midair, dimly conscious of a subdued hum of activity all about him, and then he was gently lowered to the ground again. While one tentacle still held him securely, Another tore away his hood and tunic. Almost immediately the hood was replaced by one of the protective white globe devices. Dixon then blinked for a moment in half-blinded bewilderment as he got his first glimpse of the earth camp of the Centurions. Part 3 The place, located on the smooth rock floor of a large natural basin, seemed a veritable cauldron of seething colours which rippled and blended in a dazzling maze of unearthly splendour. But Dixon forgot everything else in that weird camp as his startled gaze fell upon the creature standing directly in front of him. He instinctively knew that the thing must be one of the Alpha Centaurians, for in its alien grotesqueness the figure was utterly dissimilar to anything ever seen upon Earth before. Life upon the shattered planet of that far distant sun had apparently sprung from sources both crustacean and reptilian. The centaurian stood barely five feet in height. Its bulky, box-like body was completely covered with a chitinous armour that gleamed pale yellowish-green. Two short, powerful legs, scaled like those of a lizard, ended in feet that resembled degenerated talons. Two pairs of slender arms emanated from the creature's shoulders, with their many-jointed flexible length ending in delicate three-pronged hands. The scaly, hairless head beneath the centaurian's white globe device bore a face that was blankly hideous. Two great lidless eyes, devoid of both pupils and whites, stared unblinkingly at Dixon like twin globs of red-black jelly. A toothless, loose-lipped mouth slathered beneath. Dixon averted his gaze from the horror of that fearful alien face, and looked anxiously around for Ruth. He saw her almost at once, over at his right. She was tethered by a light metallic rope that ran from her waist to one of the metal beams supporting the great shimmering ball of opalescent fire which formed the central control of the hybrid. One of the white globe devices had been placed upon Ruth's head, and she was apparently unhurt, as she pluckily flashed a reassuring smile at Dixon. Directly in front of Dixon, and some forty yards away, there was a large pen-like enclosure, with vari-coloured shafts of radiance from banks of projectors constantly sweeping through it. Dixon drew in his breath sharply as he saw the frightful life lying dormant in that pen. It was a solid mass of hybrids. Great, loathsome creatures, fashioned from a score of different worms, insects, and spiders. The globes upon the gruesome mammalian half-heads were still dark and unfired with opalescence. The invaders had apparently raided most of the surrounding country in obtaining those grafted half-heads. Near where Dixon stood, there was a tragic little pile of articles taken from the Centaurian's victims. Prospectors' picks, shovels, axes, and other tools. Over to the left of the dormant hybrid stood the second Alpha Centaurian, curiously examined Dixon's projector. The creature apparently suspected the deadly nature of the gleaming cylinder, for it soon laid it carefully down and packed cushions of soft fabric around it to shield it away from any possible shock. Then, at an unspoken command from the first Centaurian, the great hybrid whirled Dixon around to face a small enclosure just behind him, in which were located banks of control panels and other apparatus. 
one of the pieces of mechanism, with a regularly spaced stream of sparks snapping between two terminals, was apparently a radio receiver automatically recording the broadcast from the spaceship. Dixon was unable to even guess the nature of the remaining apparatus. Bruce, be careful, Ruth called in despairing warning. He's going to put the thought reading machine on your brain. Then you'll learn what the projectile's for and everything will be lost. Dixon's mind raced with lightning speed in the face of this new danger. He stealthily slipped a hand over the revolver in his pocket. There was one vulnerable spot in the great hybrid holding him, and that was the opalescent globe on the creature's head. If he could only smash that globe with one well-directed shot, he might be able to elude the Centaurians for the precious minute necessary to send the projectile on its deadly journey. The hybrid began maneuvering Dixon toward the instrument enclosure. For a fleeting second, the grip of the tentacles upon his shoulders loosened slightly, and Dixon took instant advantage of it. Twisting himself free from the loosened tentacle in one mighty effort, he whirled and fired point-blank at the opalescent globe on the head looming above him. The bullet smashed accurately home, shattering the globe like a bursting bubble. The great hybrid collapsed with startling suddenness, its life force instantly extinguished as the globe burst. Dixon leapt to one side and swung the gun into line with the Centaurian's hideous face. He pulled the trigger, but there was no response. The rusty old firearm had hopelessly jammed. Dixon then savagely flung the revolver at the Centaurian. The creature tried to dodge, but the heavy gun struck its body with a glancing blow. There was a slight spurt of bodily fluid as the chitinous armor was partly broken. And Dixon's heart leapt exultantly. No wonder these creatures had to create hybrids to fight for them. Their own bodies were as vulnerable as that of a soft-shelled crab. The Centaurian quickly drew a slender tube of dark green from a scabbard in its belt. Dixon dodged back, looking wildly about him for a weapon. Well, there was an axe in the pile only a few yards away. Dixon snatched it up and whirled, ready to give battle. The other Centurion had come hurrying over now to aid its mate. Dixon was effectually barred from attempting any progress toward the projectile by the two grotesque creatures as they stood alertly there beside each other with their green tubes menacing him. Dixon waited tensely at bay, remembering those searing radium burns upon Emil Crawford's body. Then the first centurion abruptly leveled a second and smaller tube upon Dixon. A burst of yellow light flashed toward him enveloping him in a cloud of pale radiance before he could dart it. Then there was a faint plop as the protecting white globe upon his head was shattered. The yellow radiance swiftly faded, leaving Dixon unhurt, but he realized that the first round in the battle had been won decisively by the Centaurians. His only chance now was to end the battle before the paralyzing rays of the green moon sapped his strength. He warily advanced upon the Centaurians. Their green tubes swung into line, and twin bolts of violet flame flashed toward him. He dodged, and the bolts missed by inches. Then Dixon nearly fell as his foot struck a bundle of cloth on the ground. The next moment he snatched the bundle up with a cry of triumph. It was his leg cloth tunic, torn and useless as a garment, but invaluable as a shield against the searing effects of those bolts of radioactive flame. He hurriedly wrapped the fabric in a rough bundle around his left forearm. The next time the tube's violet flames flashed toward him, he thrust his rude shield squarely into their path. There was a light tingling shock, but that was all. The bolts did not sear through. With newfound confidence, Dixon boldly charged the two centurions. A weird battle ensued in the garishly lighted arena. The effective range of the violet flashes was only about ten feet, and Dixon's muscular agility was far superior to that of his antagonists. By constant whirling and dodging, he was able to either catch the violet bolts upon his shielded arm, or else dodge them entirely. 
And yet, in spite of the Centaurians' clumsy slowness, they manoeuvred with a cool strategy that constantly kept the Earthman's superior strength at bay. Always, as Dixon tried to close with one of them, he was forced to retreat when a flanking attack from the other threatened his unprotected back. And always the Centaurians manoeuvred the bar Dixon from attempting any dash toward the projectile. Minutes passed, and Dixon felt his strength rapidly ebbing, both from his Herculean exertions and from the paralyzing rays of the green moon beating down upon his unprotected head. As his speed of foot lessened, the Centaurians began inexorably pressing their advantage. Dixon was no longer escaping unscathed. In spite of his frantic efforts to dodge, twice the violet bolts grazed his body in searing flashes of exquisite agony. His muscles stiffened still more in the attack of the green sickness. Desperately dodging a centaurian bolt, he stumbled and nearly fell. As he staggered to regain his balance, one of his antagonists scrambled to the coveted position behind him. It was only Ruth's scream of warning that galvanized Dixon's numb brain into action in time to meet the imminent peril. In one mighty effort, he flung his axe at the centaurian in front of him. The heavy blade cut deep into the thinly armored body. Mortally wounded, the creature collapsed. Dixon then whirled and flung up his shielded left arm just in time to intercept the violet bolt of the other centurion. Warily backing away, Dixon succeeded in retrieving his axe from beside the twitching body of the fallen invader. Then, with the heavy weapon again in his hand, he remorselessly charged his remaining foe. The centurion's tube flashed in a veritable hail of hurtling violet bolts, but Dixon caught the flashes upon his shield and closed in grimly. One final leap brought him to close quarters. The heavy axe whistled through the air in a single mighty stroke that cleft the centaurian's frail body nearly in two. And then, Ruth's excited scream came in. Bruce! The other one! Get it quick! Dixon turned. The wounded invader, taking advantage of their preoccupation in the final struggle with its mate, had dragged its crippled body over to the instrument enclosure. Dixon staggered toward it as fast as his half-paralyzed muscles would permit. But he was just too late. The centaurian jerked to leave a home a fraction of a second before Dixon's smashing axe forever ended his activities. The lever's action upon the pen of inert hybrids was immediate. The sweeping lances of light vanished in a brief sheet of vivid flame, which kindled the dark globes of the hybrid's gruesome heads to steady opalescence, and the dreaded horde came to life. Sprawling from the pen, they came scuttling toward Dixon in a surging flood, a scene straight out of a nightmare. Dixon faced the oncoming horde in numb despair, knowing that his nearly paralyzed body had no chance in a fight. Then, just as the hybrids were nearly upon him, he heard Ruth's encouraging voice again. There's still one chance left, Bruce, she cried, and I'll take it. Dixon turned. Ruth had in her hand the tiny contact grenade he'd given her for a last emergency. She snapped the safety catch on the little bomb, then hurled it squarely at the giant opalescent globe looming close beside her. There was a terrific explosion, and the great globe shattered to atoms. Apparently stunned by the concussion, but otherwise unhurt, Ruth was flung clear of the wreckage. With the shattering of the central globe, the strange life force of the hybrid horde vanished instantly and completely. Midway in their rush, they sprawled inert and dead. With their outstretched legs so close to Dixon, that he had to step over one or two to get clear. Dixon's brain reeled in the reaction of relief from the horde's hideous menace. Then he grimly fought to clear his fast-numbing senses long enough for one final task that he knew must still be done. The projectile, cushioned as it was, 
had escaped detonation in the blast. He had only to stagger across the twenty yards separating him from it, and then release the stud that would send it flashing out into space. But his last shred of reserve strength had nearly been sapped now by the insidious rays of that malevolent green moon. Even as he started toward the projectile, he staggered and fell. Unable to drag himself to his feet again, he began grimly crawling with arms and legs as stiff and dead as that of stone. Only ten more yards to go now. Only five. Grimly, doggedly, with senses reeling and muscles nearly dead, the last survivor of a dying planet fought desperately on under the malignant rays of the vivid green moon. One last sprawling convulsive effort, and Dixon had the projectile in his hands. His stiff fingers fumbled agonizingly with the activating start, and then abruptly the start snapped home. With a crescendo whistle of sundered air, the projectile flashed upward into the western sky. Dixon collapsed upon his back, his dimming eyes fixed upon the grim green moon. Minutes that seemed like eternities dragged slowly by. Then his heart leapt in sudden hope. Had he really seen a glowing small blue spark up there beside the green moon? The spark marking the mighty explosion of the radium bomb against the Centaurian spaceship? A fraction of a second later, and that doubt became glorious certainty. The vivid green of the moonlight had vanished. The silvery white sheen of a normal moon again shone serenely up there in the western sky. With the extinguishing of the dreaded green rays, new strength surged swiftly through Dixon's tired body. He arose and hurried over to where Ruth lay limp and still near the wreckage of the great globe. He worked over her for many anxious minutes before the normal flush of health returned to her white cheeks and her eyes slowly opened. And then he took Ruth into his arms, and for a long minute the two silently drank in the beauty of that radiant silver moon above them, while their hearts thrilled with the realization of the glorious miracle of awakening life that they knew must already be beginning to rejuvenate in the stricken world. The Moonweed by Hal Vincent Unwittingly the traitor of Earth, Van pits himself against the inexorably tightening web of plant beasts that he is released from the moon. Hobart Madison pursed his lips in a whistle of incredulous surprise as he regarded the object that lay in the palm of his hand. An ordinary pebble, it seemed to be, but a pebble in which a strange fire smouldered and showed itself here and there through the dull surface. Would you mind repeating what you just said, Van? He asked. You heard me the first time. I say that's a diamond, and that it came from the moon. Carl van der Venter glared at his friend in resentment of his doubting tone. You mean to tell me you've been there to the moon? Well, certainly not. I'm not a Jules Verne adventurer, but I'm telling you that stone is a diamond of the first water, and that it came from the moon. It weighs over a hundred carats, too. You can have it appraised yourself if you think I'm kidding you. Bart Madison just laughed. Don't get sore, Van, he said. I'm not doubting your word, but, Lord, man, the thing's so incredible. It takes a little time to soak in. Can you say there are more? Sure, this one's the largest of five I've found so far. And there's other stuff, too. Wait till you see. Fossils, beetles and things. I tell you, Bart, the moon was inhabited at one time. I have the evidence, and I want you to be the first to see it. The eyes of the young scientist shone with excitement as he saw that his friend was roused to intense interest. But well, that's what all your experimenting has been aimed at. No wonder it costs so much. Yeah, and you've been a brick for financing me. Never asked a question either. But, Bart, 
It'll all come back to you now. You know how much that stone's worth? Oh, plenty, I guess, but forget about the financing and all that. Where is this laboratory of yours? Madison had pushed his chair back from his desk and was reaching for his hat. Over in the Ramapo Mountains, not far from Tuxedo. I'll have you there in two hours. Sure, you can spare the time to go out there now? Van de Venta was enthusiastically eager. Spare the time? Well, you just try and keep me from going. Neither of them noticed the sinister figure that lurked outside the door which led into the adjoining office. They chattered excitedly as they passed into the outer hall and made for the elevator. Van de Venter's laboratory was a small dome structure set in a clearing atop the mountain and well hidden from the winding road which was the only means of approach. Though Bart Madison, who had inherited his father's prosperous brokerage business, had financed his friend's research work ever since the two had left college, this was his first visit to the secluded workshop and its wealth of equipment was revealed to him as a complete surprise. He had always thought of Van's experiments as something beyond his ken, something uncanny and mysterious. Well, now he was convinced. The most prominent single piece of apparatus in the laboratory was a 12-inch reflecting telescope which reared its lattice framework to a slit in the dome overhead. Paralleling its axis and secured to the same equatorial mounting, was a shining tube of copper which bristled with hand wheels and levers, and was connected by heavy insulated cables to an amazing array of electrical machinery that occupied an entire side of the single room. A ah, regular young observatory you got here, Van, Bart commented, when he'd taken all of this in in one sweeping glance of appraisal. Yeah, and then some. Not another like it in the world. Van was busying himself with the controls of his electrical equipment, and a powerful motor generator started up with a click and a whir as he closed a starting switch. Madison watched in silence as a swift-fingered scientist fussed with the complicated adjustments of the apparatus, and then turned to the massive concrete pedestal on which his telescope was mounted. At his touch of a button, the instrument swung over on its polar axis to a new position, the slit in the dome was open to the afternoon sky, revealing the lunar disk in its daytime faintness. Well, you can see it just as well in the daylight? Bart asked as his friend peered through the eyepiece of the telescope and continued his adjustments. Well, sure, the surface is just as bright as at night. It doesn't seem so to your eye, but it's different through the telescope. Here, take a look. Bart squinted through the eyepiece and saw a huge crater with a shadowed spire in its centre. Like a shell hole in soft earth it appeared, a great splash that had congealed immediately as it was made. The crosshairs of the eyepiece were centred on a small circular shadow near its inner rim. That, Van was saying, is a prominent crater near the Mare Nubium. The spot under the crosshairs is that from which I have obtained the diamonds, and other things. Now, Watch this, Bart. The young broker straightened up and saw that his friend was removing the cover from a crystal bowl that was attached to the lower end of the copper tube that would point it to the heavens at the same ascension and declination as the telescope. The air of the room vibrated to a strange energy when he closed a switch that lighted a dozen vacuum tubes in the apparatus that lined the wall. You say you uh, bring the stuff here with a light ray? he asked. Noah set with the speed of light. The tube projects a ray of vibrations, like directional radio, you know, and this ray has a component that disintegrates the object it strikes and brings it back to us as dissociated protons and electrons which are reassembled in the original form and structure in this crystal bowl. Here, watch. A misty brilliance filled the bowl's interior. Intangible shadowy forms seemed to be taking shape within a swirling maze of ethereal light that hummed and crackled with astounding vigour. Then, abruptly, the apparatus was silent and the light gone, revealing an odd object that had taken form in the bowl. A starfish, Bart gasped. Yeah, fossilised. Van handed it to him and he took it in his fingers gingerly, as if expecting it to burn them. Well, the thing was undoubtedly a starfish, and of light spongy stone. Its colour was pale blue, 
and the ambulacral suckers were clearly discernible on all five rays. Lord, you're sure this is from the moon? Bart turned the starfish over in his hand and gazed stupidly at his friend. Certainly it is. You think I had it up my sleeve? But here, watch again. There's something else. The crackling misty light again filled the bowl. Hmm. I suppose, uh, Bart ventured. You bring in something large. Big as a house, let's say. What would it do to your machine? Well, I can't. The ray will only pick up stuff that will enter the bowl. Oh, look, here's the next arrival. The mysterious light died down and the scientist picked up the second object with trembling fingers. It was a knife of beautiful workmanship, fashioned from obsidian and obviously the work of human hands. There, didn't I tell you? Van gloated. I guess that shows there were living beings on the moon. He made minute changes in the adjustment of his marvellous instrument, and Bart watched in dazed astonishment as object after object materialised before their eyes. There were fragments of strange minerals, more fossils, marine life mostly, a roughly beaten silver plate, three diamonds, none of which was as large as what Van had taken to New York but all of considerable value. Well, this will be something for the papers, Van. Bart Madison was visioning the fame that was to come to his friend. Yeah, all but the diamonds. All but the diamonds is right. These words were spoken by a sarcastic voice, chill as an icicle that came from the open door. They wheeled to look into the muzzles of two automatic pistols that were trained on them by a stocky individual who faced them with a twisted, knowing grin. Damn Kelly, Bart gasped, raising his hands slowly to the level of his shoulders. He knew the ex-army captain was a dead shot with a service pistol, and a desperate man since his disgrace and forced resignation. What's the big idea? he demanded. You don't need to ask. Refused me alone this morning, didn't you? Now I'm getting it this way. Kelly turned savagely on Van, prodding his ribs with a pistol. Hey, get him up, you, he snapped. Well, Van had been slow in raising his hands, gaping in stupefied amazement at the intruder. Now he reached for the ceiling without delay. Oh, you'll serve time for this, Danny. Bart shouted. Shut up. I know what I'm doing. And back up to where... No, to the other door. Kelly was forcing him toward the door of the cellar at the point of one pistol as he kept Van covered with the other. Bart clenched his fist and brought it down in a sudden sweeping blow that raked Kelly's cheek and ear with stunning force. But the gunman recovered in a flash, dropped the muzzle of his pistol and pulled the trigger. Drilled through the thigh, Bart staggered through the open door and fell the length of the stairs into the darkness of the cellar. Kelly then laughed evilly as he slammed the door and turned the key. Hey, hold it, you! He snarled as he swung on Van, who dropped his hands and crouched for a spring. If I drill you, it won't be through the leg. Oh, I'll take those diamonds now. He pocketed one of his pistols and, keeping the other pressed to the pit of Van's stomach, went through his pockets. Then he added those on the tray by the crystal bowl to his collection, and he transferred the entire lot to his own pocket. Now, you clever engineer, he grinned, we'll just operate this trick machine of yours for a while and collect some more. You get to it. He watched narrowly as Van stretched his fingers to the control. No monkey business either, he grated. You will not change a single adjustment. I've been listening to you, and I know the clock of the telescope is keeping the ray trained on the same spot. You just operate that ray and nothing else, understand? Well, Van didn't think it expedient to tell him of the drift caused by inaccuracies in the clock and perturbations of the moon's motion. He was playing for time, trying to plan a course of action. But, um, there may not be any more diamonds, 
he offered as he tripped the release of the ray. Oh, there'll be more. Don't try and kid me. An irregular block of quartz materialised in the bowl, and Kelly tossed it to the floor in savage disgust. Then a small diamond, a very small, but he pocketed it nonetheless. The next object was a strange one, a dried seed pod about six inches in length and a brilliant red colour. The ray had shifted to a new position on the lunar surface. Another and another of these strange legumes followed, one of them bursting open and scattering its contents. Bright red like the enclosing pod to rattle over the floor like tiny glass beads. Kelly just snorted his disgust. Oh, uh, still some sort of vegetation out there, Van muttered. The eternal scientist in the man could not be downed by a mere hold-up. Can the chatter? Kelly snarled as the crystal bowl gave up another of these useless pods, and yet another. He gathered up the evidence of lunar vegetation, a half dozen of the pods, and threw them through the open doorway with a savage gesture. Are you trying to put one over on me? he bellowed. Well, how can I? Van retorted mildly. Well, I haven't touched a hand with you. He was wondering vaguely whether this lunar seed would grow in the earthly soil, or what sort of a plant it would produce under the new environment. But Kelly was becoming nervous now. It seemed that little was to be gained by hanging around this crazy man's laboratory. He had a sizable fortune in rough stones already. Well, that big one alone, when properly cut into smaller stones, would make him independently wealthy. Maybe there weren't any more anyway and the longer he stayed, the greater chance there was of getting caught. The advent of another of the pods decided it for him. A quick blow with the butt of his pistol stretched Van on the floor, and Kelly fled the scene. Bart was pounding furiously on the cellar door when Van first took hazy note of his surroundings. Several uncertain minutes had passed before he was able to stagger across the room and release his friend. Where is he? Bart demanded, swaying on his feet and blinking in the sudden light. Gone. Suck me and beat it with the diamonds. Van was mopping the blood from his eyes with a handkerchief. Oh, are you hit bad? he inquired. No, oh, just a flesh wound. Hurts like the devil, though. How about you? Bart limped to his side and sighed with relief when he examined his bleeding scalp. Ah, not so bad yourself, old man. Hey, uh, where's your first aid kit? Van was still somewhat dazed and merely pointed to the cabinet. A fine pair we turned out to be, he grumbled, after his head had cleared a bit under Bart's vigorous cleansing of the cut on his temple. Ah, here we stood, meek as a couple of lambs, and let that guy get away with murder. Yeah, but those forty fires made the difference. Oh! Bart winced as his friend poured fresh iodine over the wound in his leg. God, have a heart, will you? They were startled into silence by a hoarse, strangled scream that came from outside the laboratory. Help! Help! Someone repeated in a panicky voice, a voice which at once ended on a gurgled note of despair. Ah, oh, it is Kelly, Bart whispered. He's come back. And something's happened to him. He then started for the open door. Hey, um, wait a minute. Might be a trick to get us outside where he can pop us off. Oh, no. Oh, that isn't. Oh, for God's sake. Look at that. Bart had reached the door and was pointing at the ground with shaking forefinger. Oh, the entire clearing seemed to be alive with wriggling things. Long, rubbery tentacles that crawled along the ground reaching curling ends high in the air, and had even started climbing the trees at the edge of the clearing. Blood red they were, and partially transparent in the light of the setting sun. Growing things, attached by their thick ends to swelling mounds of red that seemed anchored to the ground. Translucent stalks rose from the mounds and sprouted huge buds that burst and blossomed into flaming flowers a foot in diameter, then withered and went to seed in a moment of time. Always the weaving tendrils shot forth with lightning speed, 
reaching and feeling their uncanny way along the ground and over tree stumps into the woods. One of them emerged from a hollow stump with its slender end coiled around the tiny body of a chattering grey squirrel. God, the moonflowers, Ban cried. Well, what do you mean, moonflowers? Dried seed pods. They came over into the bowl and Kelly threw them out. God, now look at the damn things. They're alive. Kelly's voice came to them once more from behind the barrier of rapidly growing vegetation. Help, he screamed. I'll give back the diamonds, anything. Just get me away from these things. Oh, we ought to just let them get him, Van growled. Bart shivered. Oh, too horrible, Van. They got an axe or anything. Yeah, there's a hatchet around the back. Maybe we can... But the young broker had already scuttled around the corner of the building, and Van looked after him anxiously. The vile red tendrils were reaching the east wall of the laboratory, and he saw that their inner surfaces were covered with tiny suckers like those of the arms of a devilfish. Carnivorous plants, undoubtedly, these awful half-animal, half-vegetable things whose seed had been transported across a quarter million miles of space. Man-eaters, deadly, and growing with incredible speed. And even the short-lived flowers were fearsome, as they opened their scarlet, pansy-like faces and stared a moment before they folded up and shriveled into the seed cases like those that had materialized in the crystal bowl. Then he noticed that the pods were opening and spreading more of the terrible seeds. Oh, nothing could stop this weird growth now. It would cover the country like a sea of flaming horror, overcoming and devouring every living thing. Cold fear clutched at Van as he realized the enormity of the calamity that had come to the earth. Bart was skirting the edge of the clearing with a hatchet in his hand, and Van tried to call out to him, to warn him. But his voice caught in his throat, and instead he ran to his assistance, circling the spreading menace to get around behind where Kelly was still shouting. Oh, damn Kelly, anyway. This never would have happened if he hadn't come on the scene. Kelly was in the woods now, wedged into the crotch of a tree, striking wildly at the clutching tendrils with his club pistol. They mashed easily and were dripping red, but were not to be deterred from their ghastly purpose. Kelly's time would have indeed been short, had not his erstwhile victims come to the rescue. One of the thickest of the twining things encircled his body and had him pinned to the tree. His breath was coming in gasps as its tightening coils increased their pressure. His coarse features were livid and his eyes bulged from their sockets. Bart hacked and hacked at the rubbery growth until he had him free, jerked him from his perch, blubbering and whining like a schoolboy. His shirt had been torn from his breast and they saw a great welt where the blood had been drawn through the pores by those terrible suckers. Oh, look out, Bart! Van shouted. Another of the creeping things had come through the underbrush and was wrapping its coils around Bart's ankle. Another and another wiggled through, and soon they were battling for their own freedom. Kelly staggered off into the woods and went crashing down the hill, leaving them to take care of themselves as best they might. The stench of the viscous liquid that oozed from the injured tendrils was nauseous. It had something of a soporific effect and the two friends found themselves fighting the terror in a growing mist of red that blinded and confused them. Then, miraculously, they were free, and Van assisted Bart as they ran through the forest. When they reached the road, weak and out of breath, they were just in time to see Kelly's roadster vanish around the bend. Yeah, he'd give back the diamonds. Oh, what an ass, Van muttered vindictively. Then, shrugging his shoulders, well, it won't be much good to him anyway. Won't be any good to us either, as far as that goes. What do you mean? Aren't they real? Bart was raising himself painfully into the seat of Van's car, his wounded legs suddenly very much in the way. Yeah, sure, they're real. But don't you realize what this thing means? This ungodly growth has started? Why, well, no. You mean it will keep growing? Yep, and how? 
Those inner stalks drop a new batch of seeds every five minutes or so. And there you go. A flock of new plants spring up ten feet from the first. Dozens of them for every pod that drops. Well, you know how geometrical progression works out. They'll cover the whole country. The whole world. God. Man alive. This is terrible. I hadn't thought of that before. What are we going to do? Yeah. That's the question. What can we do? Van started his motor and jerked the car to the road. First off, we're going to get away from here, and fast. Bart gripped his arm as he shifted into second gear. Oh, look, Van, he babbled. They're out of the woods already, loose. The red snakes are loose from their stalks. God damn it, they're alive, I tell you. And it was true. Several of the slimy red things were wriggling their way over the tarmac like great earthworms, but moving with the speed of hurrying pedestrians. Free and untrammeled by the roots and stems of the mother plants, they would set forth on their own in search for beings of flesh and blood to destroy. Millions of their kind would follow. Billions! In sudden panic, Van stepped on the gas. Fifteen minutes later, with shrieking siren, a motorcycle drew alongside and forced them to the curb. Hey, um, where's the fire? The sarcastic voice of a stern visaged officer demanded, when Van had brought his car to a screeching stop. Seventy-five, the speedometer had read, only a moment before. Look up, it's life and death, officer, Van started to explain. We must get to the proper officials to warn them. Ah, uh, tell it to the judge. Come on now, you follow me. But officer, there's death on its way from the hills, I tell you. Red creeping things that'll be here in a couple of hours. Move away from the wheel. I'll drive you in myself. Bart had opened the door on the side and was limping his way around the back of the car. This was serious. They had to get away. I had to spread the word in a way that would be believed before it was too late. The officer was tugging at Van's arm, astonishment and black rage showing in his weather-beaten countenance. Speeding, drunk, resisting an officer, oh, I'd never get out of this mess. But a swift uppercut interrupted the proceedings. Bart's leg was numb and stiff, but his good right arm was working smoothly, and with all its old-time precision. His second punch was a haymaker. With his full weight behind it, it drove straight to the chin and stretched the officer on the concrete. Thoughtfully, Bart removed his pistol from its holster before scrambling in at Van's side. Oh boy, we're in for it now, he gasped. Uh, we might as well make a good job of it while we're at it. Van let in his clutch with a jerk, and soon again they were breaking all traffic regulations. It was dusk when they roared in through the gate at the Rockland County Airport and pulled up at the hangar office. Van rushed in, shouting for Bill Peterson, and Bart followed. A slender, fair-haired youth in rumpled flying togs greeted them. Bill, it's my friend, Bart Madison, Van blurted without pausing for breath. Listen, you've got to have a plane right away. Got one with a radio? Yeah, but what's all the rush? Where are you going? Albany, right away. Make it snappy, will you? Sure, but what's it all about? Young Peterson was leading them to the field where a sleek monoplane was in waiting, as if they'd ordered it. Yeah, warm her up, Joe, he called to the mechanic. Listen, Bill, I never lied to you, did I? Van asked, when they were seated in the plane's cabin. Uh, not that I know of, but sometimes I've thought you were lying. Until I saw with my own eyes the things that you told me about. What is it this time? Death and destruction. Coming down out of the Ramapos. Oh, we've got to warn the country. Plants, Bill. Squirmy red plants with long feelers that can twist around and devour a man. Half animal they are. And the feelers break loose and crawl by themselves. Multiplying like nothing you ever saw. Millions of them in an hour. What? Peterson stared incredulously as his motor roared into life, and he gave his attention to the business of taking off. 
and jerked the thumb of his free hand toward the radio. Van's expert fingers manipulated the switches and dials of the portable apparatus, and its vacuum tubes glowed into life. 2BXX calling 2TIM, he droned into the microphone. Who's that? Bart asked. The drone of the motor was barely audible in the closed cabin and didn't interfere. At the times, trying to get Johnny Forbes. Well, if anyone can get this thing across, he can. Wait a minute, here they are. Closed his eyes as he listened to the murmuring voice in the headphones. Then he was talking rapidly, forcefully, and the young flyer gazed with owlish solemnity at Bart as they listened to this conversation. And it was plain that Bill was only half inclined to believe, though impressed by the earnestness and evident apprehension displayed by his two passengers. Yes, to be XX, Van was saying. Connect me with Johnny Force, please, <laughs> in a hurry. Yet, yeah. hello, Johnny, it's Van, uh, Carl Vandervander, you know. Yep, yeah. got a scoop for you, but first I want you to get it in the broadcast, got me? It's about a man-eating plant that's starting to overrun the country. No, listen now, I'm not dreaming, I'm not making this up, listen. The frantic scientist rambled on and on about the seed from the moon, the red death that was creeping down from the mountains, the horror of this calamity as he and Bart had visioned it. Then, with a sudden note of despair, his voice trailed off into nothingness, and he turned a drawn white face to his two friends. Oh, laughed at me. Hung up on me, he groaned. Oh, good God, we've got to do something, quick. Uh, we'll be in Albany in an hour, the pilot suggested. What are you going to do there? Well, he believed now. His expression of horror showed it. I see the governor, but, man, it's an hour wasted. We must stir up the country, get the word to Washington everywhere. It might be possible to fight the thing some way if we could mobilize state and national resources quickly enough. Bill, Bart, what can we do? The plane sped on through the night, under control of her gyro pilot, as the three men ragged their brains for a solution to the problem. If a hard-boiled newspaper man wouldn't believe the story, who would? Oh, um, yeah, I've got it, Bart shouted suddenly. Oh, can any of you pound a key, a uh, coat, I mean? Sure I can. Then what? Peterson returned. Oh, Fake an SOS, don't you see? All broadcasting has to stop, and every ship at sea, every airliner in this part of the country will be listening, standing by. Give them the story in code. I don't think we're in a ship from the moon. Captured by Lunarians, who are here to destroy the world with this weed of theirs. Anything. I'll make it as weird as possible. Well, most everyone will think it's a hoax. But there are 10,000 kids, amateurs, they'll be listening in. Somebody will believe it, and believe me, there'll be some investigating in the neighborhood of the growth in no time. God, I believe that'll do it, Van exclaimed, and the broadcasters listen in for an SOS themselves. Well, they got to, you know, so they know when to start up again. Well, some smart announcer will tell the story, maybe even believe it. Yeah, the trick will work, sure thing. The pilot glanced at his instruments and saw that the automatic gyro apparatus was functioning properly. Then he moved over to the radio and threw the switch that put the key in circuit instead of the microphone. Rapidly he ticked off the three dots, three dashes, and again three dots that spelled the dread danger signal of the air. Over and over he repeated the signal, and then he listened for results. It worked, he gloated after a moment. They're all signing off, the broadcasters. The Navy Yard in Brooklyn gives me the go-ahead. He then pounded out the absurd message with swift fingers, pausing occasionally to ask a pertinent question of Van or Bart. At Van's request, he added a warning to all residents of New York State, west of the Hudson River, and of northern New Jersey, to flee their homes without delay. He even asked that the message be relayed to the governors of the two states and that Governor Perkins of New York be advised that they were on their way to Albany to discuss the situation. But he balked at the story of the Lunarians, telling instead the equally strange truth regarding the origin of the deadly growth. 
adding the names of Van and Bart to lend authenticity to the tale. Then he signed off and switched the radio receiver to the loudspeaker before returning to the pilots. Bart tuned in to the various broadcasters as they resumed their programs, finally settling on WOR Newark, whose announcer was reading the strange message to his radio public with appropriate comment. A crime and an outrage, he called it. An affront to the industry and to the public. An insult to the government of the United States. But wait! A telephone call had just been received at the station from the village of Slopesburg. A reputable citizen of that town had reported the red growth at the edge of State Road. Huge red earthworms wriggling across the concrete. Another call, and then another. The announcer's voice was rising hysterically. Oh, it did work, Bart, Van exulted. And now the hell starts popping. Governor Perkins met them in person when they arrived at the municipal airport in Albany. A great crowd had gathered in the shadows outside the brilliance of the floodlights, and a police escort rushed them to the governor's private car. Oh, here's where you go to the Bastille for sucking that cop, Van observed. His spirits had risen appreciably since that successful SOS call. The governor was, nonetheless, in a serious mood as they made their way to the executive mansion through the milling crowds that lined the hilly streets of the capital city of New York State. Proofs had not been lacking of the truth of Bill Peterson's radio warning. Although the spreading Red Death had covered a circle some eight miles in diameter, covering farmlands and destroying the crops, blocking the roads and trapping many on the streets and in their homes in nearby towns. More than a hundred had lost their lives, and thousands were fleeing the threatened area. The country was in uproar. Gentlemen, the governor said, when they'd reached the privacy of his chambers, this is a serious matter. No time must be lost in dealing with it. Nevertheless, I want you, Mr. Van der Venter, to tell your story of the thing to me and to the radio system of the United States Secret Service. The president himself will be listening as will the chief executives of most of the states. Hold nothing back, as the fate of our people is at stake. And so Van faced the microphone and related the history of his work in the little laboratory in the Ramapo Mountains. He told of his interest in the Earth satellite, and of his first unsuccessful experiments with ultra-telescopes in the endeavor to explore its surface close at hand. Though the failure of a spaceship he'd built, of the final discovery of the ray, by means of which it was possible to transport solid objects from the one body to the other. He told of the discovery of man-made relics and of fossils. He told of the diamonds and of the attack by Dan Kelly, which had resulted in the spreading of the seed of the deadly moonweed. He even related the incident of the traffic policeman, at which the governor smiled. Yeah, that has been reported, he said, and you need have no fear on that score. The charges will be dropped. And I ask that you give us your opinion as to the best method of combating this new enemy. Have you any ideas? I have not, sir, Van replied gloomily. Though I believe it can be done only from the air, possibly bombing or gas of some sort. I don't know, but it will take time, Mr. Governor. Yes, and meanwhile the thing is overwhelming us at what rate? Well, as nearly as I can estimate it, the growth is moving with a speed of four or five miles an hour. So, um, by morning you expect it will have traveled forty or fifty miles in all directions? Yeah, I'm afraid so. A sharp buzz from the instrument on the governor's desk interrupted them. Oh, the president, he whispered. That is enough, governor, came the husky tones of President Alfred's voice. I shall communicate with Secretary Markley at once. All available army bombing planes will be rushed to the scene. You, sir, will mobilize the militia, as will the governors of the other states. Meanwhile, this young scientist is to report to the Bureau of Scientific Research in Washington tonight. Have him bring a supply of those seeds with him. And that was all. Governor Perkins offered no comment but merely rose from his seat to indicate that the discussion was ended. 
A solemn silence reigned in the room. Right, let's go, exclaimed Bill Peterson suddenly, unawed by the presence of the governor. Well, my ship's waiting, and we can stop off for a couple of those parts and still make Washington in two hours. Come on. Governor Perkins smiled. Good luck, boys, he said, as they were ushered from the room. My car will return you to the airport. I remember this. The country will be watching you now, and expecting much from you. Goodbye. They were to recall his words in the dark days ahead. Before they'd reached Newburgh, they saw a dull red glow in the skies that told them the news broadcast to which they'd been listening had not exaggerated. The red growth was luminous in the darkness. Off there to the southwest, it was as if a vast forest fire were lighting the heavens. No wonder the panics and rioting were getting out of control of the fleet. Coming up over Bear Mountain, they caught their first glimpse of the sea of fire that was the Red Death by night. Like a vast bed of glowing embers, it covered the countryside, extending eastward to Haverstraw, where it was temporarily halted by the broad Hudson. It was a shimmering, undulating mass of living, luminous things, eating their horrible way through all organic matter that stood in their path. Writhing, squirming, all absorbing monsters that sent out an advance guard of independent snake-like tendrils to capture and hold for the lagging mother plants whatever livestock and humanity they were able to find. You, uh, think they'll go over the river, Van? Bart asked. Oh, sure they will. Every fugitive who had a narrow escape after being in contact with the things is a potential carrier of the seed. Found several of them sticking to my clothing after we got away. I picked a couple off your coat, but I didn't tell you. Lord, what did you do with them? I put them in the ash receiver in my car, like a fool. Wouldn't have to go down for more if I kept them. Well, it can't be helped now. We'll have a job getting some down there now, too. I'll say so. And then Van lapsed into gloomy silence. They were over the landing field above Tomkins Cove. Bill turned on the siren whose raucous shriek operated the mechanism of the floodlight switches by sound vibrations. The field sprang into instant illumination, and they circled it once before swooping to a landing. They were but a mile now from the advancing town. The field was deserted, and the three men started off immediately in the direction of the oncoming wheat. Oh, we'll have to make it snappy, Van grunted. We've got about twelve minutes to get the parts and get back to the ship. Those damn things will be here by that time. They scrambled over fences and pushed through thickets. The lighted windows of a deserted farmhouse were directly ahead, and they ran through the open gate and across the fields. Ever the glow of the weed growing brighter. The terrified horse galloped wildly past them and crashed into the fence, whinnying piteously as it went down with a broken leg. They could see the red rim of the advancing horror just beyond the road. One of the detached tendrils slithered past, each glowing coil distinctly visible. Oh, lucky those things can't see, Bart shuddered. Yep, said Van. Have to dodge him to get in close enough to one of the plants. Keep your eyes peeled now, you fellas, in case one of us gets caught. A terrific explosion rocked the ground. They'd paid no heed to the roaring of motors overhead. The bombers were already on the job. Shooting skyward, a column of flame not a hundred yards from them showed where the high explosive had landed in the red mass. Then, slimy wriggling things rained all about them, fragments of the red weed that still squirmed and crawled and clung. Bill Peterson yelled and clutched at his neck where one of the things had taken hold. Another warning whistle of a falling bomb. Crash! More of the horror raining down and splattering as it fell. Oof, a huge blob of quivering, luminous jelly fell before them, a portion of one of the mother plants. Run! Van shouted. Run for the plane! We'll never make it now. Oh, damn those bombers. All along the advancing front, the bombs were bursting, 
shattering the air with their detonations and scattering the glowing red stems and tendrils in all directions. The din was appalling, and the increasing brightness of the crimson glow added to the horror of the situation. Stumbling and cursing, they ran for the plane. Fools! Fools! Bill was shouting. Can't they see the field in the plane? Why in the devil are they dropping them so near? Then Bart was down, clawing at a three-foot length of red tendril that had fallen on him and borne him to the earth. Bart! Bart! Van turned back and was tearing at the thing with fingers that were slippery with the sap that oozed from its torn skin. Oh, monstrous earthworms! Cut them apart and each portion lived on, took on new vigour. And these vile things could sting like a jellyfish. Where each sucker touched the skin, a burning sore remained. Bill helped them break away from the thing, and all three fought on toward the lights of the landing field. Only a short way off now, but it seemed that they would never reach it. The bombers were dropping their missiles with unceasing regularity, and the Red Death only spread the faster. When they scrambled into the cabin of the plane, the red wall of creeping horror was almost upon them. Advancing speedily out from the red-lit darkness, it seemed to halt momentarily when it emerged into the brilliance of the great arc lights which illuminated the field. And then, more slowly and with seemingly purposeful deliberation, the wriggling feelers reached out from the mass and bore down upon them. Bill slammed the door and latched it, then fumbled frantically with the starter switch. The most welcome sound was the answering roar of the motor. The pilot yanked his ship into the air, taking off with the wind rather than running the risk of remaining on the ground long enough to taxi around and head into it. The plane acted like a frightened bird as Bill struggled with the controls, darting this way and that, and once missing a crash by inches as the tail was lifted by the treacherous groundwind. And then they were clear, a slowly gained altitude and a steep climb. Oh, Van exclaimed mopping his red splattered forehead with his handkerchief. That was a narrow escape, boys. We haven't got the seeds yet, unless we can find a few on our clothing. Oh, who said so? Bart gloated. <laughs> Look at this. He then opened his clenched fist and disclosed one of the pods, unbroken and gleaming horribly scarlet in the dim light of the cabin. Bill heaved a sigh of relief as he banked the ship and swung around toward the south. He dreaded another landing near the Sea of Moonweed. Van chortled over their good fortune as he examined the mysterious part. One good thing the bombers had done, anyway. Blow one of the things into his friend's hands. Bart and the young pilot found themselves very much out of the picture when they reported with Van at the research building in Washington. The government had no use for them in this emergency. It was a scientist they wanted and he was immediately rushed into conference with the heads of the Bureau. His two friends were left to shift for themselves, and they joined the crowds in the street. The name of Carl van der Venter was on everyone's tongue. Cursing and reviling him they were, for the hare-brained experiment which had been the cause of this terrible disaster. Ah, oh, fools. Bart seethed with rage and nearly came to blows with a number of the vociferous agitators who were advocating a necktie party. Why hadn't the officials published the entire story as Van had told it over the Secret Service radio? There was no mention of Dan Kelly in the broadcast news, nor of the fact that the police were searching for him in every city and town in the country. Another instance of the results of secrecy in governmental activity. Well, we'd better find ourselves a room and turn in, Bart growled. Let's get out of this mob before I slam somebody. Bill Peterson was only too willing. He was suddenly very tired. In the Willard Hotel, they were assigned to an excellent room, and Bart insisted on switching on the broadcasts and listening to the news. Far into the night, he sat by the loudspeaker, or paced the floor as an exceptionally calamitous happening was reported. But Bill slept through it all. The army bombers had been recalled. Their efforts had worked more harm than good. 
the invincible moonweed now would cross the Hudson River at Nyack and Piermont. Tarrytown was overrun, and many of the inhabitants had lost their lives either in the moors of the insatiable monsters, or in the panics and rioting that accompanied the evacuation of the town. New Jersey was covered as far south as New Brunswick, and west of Phillipsburg and Belvedere. At Marsh Chunk, the contents of twenty oil tanks had been diverted to the Delaware River, and the floating oil film was proving at least a temporary protection to a considerable portion of the state of Pennsylvania. In New York State, the growth had buried hill and valley, town and village, as far as Monticello, and along the Hudson, extended as far north as Kingston. At Poughkeepsie, on the opposite side of the river, frantic householders had armed themselves with rifles and shotguns, and were killing off all refugees who attempted to land from boats at that point. But the militia was on guard at the bridges, assuring safe crossing to the thousands who fled the Red Death over these routes. There was no keeping the seed of the moonweed from finding its way east. At some points fire had been used with considerable success as a barrier, hundreds of acres of forest lands being destroyed in the endeavour to stem the crimson tide. But after the ashes would cool, germination would recur, and the weed would continue on its triumphant way. Acid sprays and poisonous gas of various kinds have been tried without appreciable effects. The casualty estimates already ran into the tens of thousands. Rumour had it that nearly 100,000 had lost their lives in the city of Newark alone. There was no way in which the figures could be checked while everything was in a state of confusion. Communication lines were broken, roads blocked, gas and electricity supply systems paralysed and the railroads were helpless. Trains could not be driven through the glutinous, wriggling mass that piled high on the tracks. Only the radio and the airlines were operative in the stricken area, and even these were of little value to the unfortunates who, in many cases, were surrounded and cut off from all hope of succor. Four in the morning, with aching heart and reeling brain, Bart threw himself on the bed without undressing, fell into the troubled sleep of exhaustion and despair. The next day brought no encouragement, though it was reported that the growth developed with less rapidity after sunrise than it had during the night. Bart endeavoured to get Van on the telephone, but was curtly informed by the operator at the research building that no incoming calls could be transferred to the laboratory where he was working. Knowing his friend, he pictured him as working feverishly with the government engineers and giving no thought to sleep or food. Well, he'd kill himself for sure, but such a death even was preferable to the red one of the moonweed. The Canadians and Mexicans had been quick to protect their borders and forbid the landing of any American aircraft or the passage of trains and automobiles. But the seed had reached Europe. One of the twelve-hour night airliners, having carried a thousand refugees who had sufficient foresight and the means to engage passage, it was a world catastrophe that they faced. By mid-afternoon, the streets of Washington were almost deserted. It was less than twenty-four hours since the first moon seed had taken root, and already the crimson growth had progressed nearly a hundred miles southward from the point of origin. Another twenty or thirty hours, and it would reach the capital city. Unless Van and those engineers over in the research building discovered something. A miracle. Mark tried the phone once more and was overjoyed when the operator, all apologies now, informed him that Van had been trying to reach him for several hours. Listen, old man, his friend's voice came over the wire. I've been worried as the devil not knowing where you were. I want you and Bill to stick around where I can get you any time. I may need you. Where are you staying? The Willard. Um, have you doped out something? Bart answered in quick excitement. Well, maybe. Can't let anything out yet. Not till we've tested it thoroughly. But I can tell you that a hundred factories are already working on machines that we've devised. By good luck, it only means minor changes to an apparatus that's already on the market in large quantity. Ah, great stuff. Oh, the city's nearly emptied itself, you know. And boy, how they've been razzing you over the radio and in the papers, howling for your hide. Oh, damn country. 
Yeah, I know. Ban's voice was calm, but Bart sensed in it something of a cold fury that was new to him and his friend. The young scientist was bitterly resentful of the attitude of the public. Can we see you, Van? No, don't call me either. Better hang around the hotel and wait for a call from me. Okay, so long for now, Bart. I gotta get busy. So long. Bart then gazed solemnly at Bill Peterson, who'd been listening abstractedly to the one-sided conversation. Bill had given up hope and was resigned to the inevitable. I says he may need us, Bill, said Bart. Yeah, well, we'll be ready for anything he wants us to do. It's no use, though. Not anything. What do you mean, no use? You never saw a van licked yet, did you? Well, sure I did. I used super telescopes and that rocket ship. Yeah, but this is different. Bart was a staunch defender of his friend. He glared at Bill for a moment and then switched on the news broadcast, which he knew he detested. The progress of the moonweed continued unabated. In the city of New York, a million souls were reported as having lost their lives, and this in spite of the difficulty experienced by the uncanny moonweed in obtaining a foothold in Manhattan. It had been thought that the asphalt and concrete would prove an effective barrier, and so they did, for a time. But with the seed active in the parks and along the waterfronts, it wasn't long before the powerful roots of the greedy plants worked their way underneath, ripping up pavements and wriggling into cellars as they progressed. The city was a mass of wreckage and a maelstrom of fighting, fighting and dying humanity. Entire regiments of the National Guard were wiped out as they fought off the weed with axe and bayonet, in the effort to provide time for the refugees to clear from their homes in certain localities. All transportation facilities to the south and west were taxed to the utmost. There was fighting and killing for the possession of automobiles and planes, and for rooms in trains and buses. Airline terminals and railroad stations were the scenes of dreadful massacres, as the police and military guards fought off the crazed and desperate creatures who attacked them en masse. And still, the news announcers prated of the responsibility of one Carl Vanderventer. The telephone bell rang, and Bart answered it in relief. At last they were to see some action. But no, it was merely the desk clerk, notifying him that all employees were leaving the hotel and that they would be left to shift for themselves. Yes, there was plenty of food in the kitchens, and they were welcome to it, and a permanent telephone connection would be made to their room. The frightened clerk then wished them the best of luck. In endless monotone, the voice of the news announcer droned on. Binghamton and Elmira, Albany and Schenectady, New Haven, Philadelphia, Allentown, all had succumbed. The casualty estimates now ran into the millions. Ah, oh, the mist, the red mist that rose from the steaming weed, was drifting westward and spreading the seed with ever-increasing rapidity. For now, the monstrous growth from out of the sky was adapting itself to its environment, providing the seed with feathery tufts that permitted the winds to carry them far and wide like the seed of a dandelion. Oh, turn off that damn thing, Bill shouted, and he jumped to his feet, his eyes glinting strangely in the twilight gloom of the room. Bill was close to the breaking point. Ah, I guess you're right, Bart mumbled. Not good for either of us to listen to that stuff. He switched off the receiver, and they sat in silence as darkness fell over the city. Bill shivered and felt for the button of the electric light which he pressed with a trembling finger. They blinked in the sudden illumination, but it cheered them somewhat. It wasn't good to sit in the darkness and think. Besides, they knew that the turbine generators of Potomac Edison were still running, some brave souls were sticking to their jobs, for the time being at least. God, Bill suddenly groaned, after an endless time of dead silence. My sister, she lives in Pittsburgh, you know. I wonder if she and the kids got away. And it won't be long before the damn stuff gets there. 
Bart thanked his lucky stars that he had no family ties. Ah, uh, that's okay, they've had plenty of warning. He tried to console Bill. For hours, you know, and the westbound lines are in good shape from there. I wouldn't worry about them too much if I were you. And then there was utter silence once more. Even the customary street noises were lacking. Both men jumped nervously when the shrill siren of a police motorcycle sounded in the distance. Bart thought grimly of his fracas with a police officer who tried to arrest Van. God, how long ago that seemed, and how inconsequential an incident. Their windows faced north, and by midnight they could make out the red glow of the moonlight, an awful band of flickering crimson that painted the horizon the color of blood. The telephone clamored for attention. Bill stifled a hysterical sob as the terrifying sound broke the eerie stillness. Van was on the way to get them. He had a government car, and they were going to go to Arlington for Bill's plane. Well, then what? He refused to commit himself. They must follow him blindly. Anything was better than this inactivity, though. Bart shouted with glee. We're going north. Van replied shortly, in answer to Bart's question when they entered the official car in front of the hotel. After Dan Kelly. After Dan Kelly? What, they got a line on him? Yep. Secret Service reports him in Toronto. The Canucks are after him now, but by God, I'm going to get him myself. Van was haggard and wan, his eyes gleaming with a fanatical light. The strain had done something to him, something Bart didn't like at all. Uh, this was a different van from the man who had entered his office two days previously. Unshaven and unkempt, he looked and talked like a drunken man on the verge of delirium. Okay, what's the idea of that? He asked gently. I'm going to get him, I tell you. That scumbag. It's his fault the whole world's against me. I'll get him, Bart. I'll kill him with my bare hands. And so that was it. The combination of grueling labor and the effort to save mankind from the dread moonweed, and bitter censure from the very people he was trying to save, it had been too much for Van. He'd developed a fixation, unreasoning and murderous. He'd get even with the man who'd caused this trouble, and nothing could deter him from his purpose. Bart could see that. Might as well humour him and help him. Well, it made a little difference anyway, with the Red Doom spreading at its present rate. They'd all be victims within a few days. They were speeding through the streets of Washington at a breakneck rate. Van bent over the wheel, and like a demented man glued his wildly staring eyes to the road. Why about your work? Bart asked after a while. Has anything been accomplished? Oh, yes, and no. They'll be ready to shoot in a few hours. Don't know whether it'll be a complete success or not. But I sneaked away anyhow. This other thing's more important to me right now. What is it? Can you tell us now? Sure. I've got one of the machines in the car, and I'll explain when we're on our way to Canada. Well, this wasn't like Van. Never secretive and always in good humor. He was treating his friends like annoying strangers. But you can't land in Canada, Bill ventured, as they pulled up at the gate of the airport. Ah, like hell you can't. You watch my smoke and let any bloody canuck up there try and stop me. He was lifting a small black case from the luggage carrier of the car as he replied. Bart silenced the airman with a look. When they'd taken off and were well underway, Bart opened his black case and set a vacuum tube apparatus in operation. They were nearing the fringe of the glowing sea of red that was the vast blanket of moonweed. It now extended to within a few miles of Baltimore and stretched northward as far as the eye could see. Ah, it was a cinch, Van was explaining. When I first saw that the growth slowed up under the arc lights of Tompkins Cove, it gave me the glimmering of an idea. Then on the following day, when we learned that the weeds spread more slowly in sunlight, I was convinced. The stuff is dormant on the moon, you know. Why? Bart asked breathlessly. 
because there's no atmosphere surrounding the moon, and the sun's rays are not filtered before they reach its surface as they are here. The invisible rays, ultraviolet and such, are present in full proportion, and the moonweed cannot flourish when subjected to light of the higher frequencies. When it died out when the moon lost its atmosphere, and only revived on being brought to Earth. Probably a million more times prolific in our dense and damp atmosphere and rich soil. Ah, this thing's easy to wipe out. <laughs> yeah? Bart commented dryly. Oh, Van was now talking and he could have bitten off his tongue for interrupting him. This machine of Van's was a generator of invisible light in the ultra indigo range, Van explained. You couldn't see its powerful beam, but they'd proved in the laboratory that it was certain doomed to the moon. They'd grown the stuff from seed in steel cages, and played with it until they were satisfied. And now would come the final test. Ten thousand planes were being equipped with this new generator, which was merely an adaptation of standard directional television transmitters. And tonight, these would start out to fight the weed. It was as simple as that. Beneath them, the red cauldron seethed and tossed as they sped northward, the crimson blanket of death that was steadily covering the country. Drop to a thousand feet, Bill, the scientist called. Then watch below, but don't slow down. We've got to get to Toronto. The ship nosed down and soon leveled off at the prescribed altitude. Van's vacuum tubes lighted to full brilliancy, and a black spot appeared on the glowing surface just beneath them. A black spot that extended into a streak as the plane continued on its way. They were cutting a swath of blackness fifty feet wide through the heart of the grove. Oh, see that? Van gloated. Oh, it's killing them by millions. And the best of it is the effect it leaves behind. The soil is permeated to a depth of several inches, and the stuff will not germinate in the spots where the ray is contracted. Oh, it works to perfection. Well, Bill was exuberant. His hopes revived miraculously. He gave his motor the gun and got out of it every last revolution that it could turn up. Oh, he had to get Van to Canada. Oh, not such a bad idea, this going after Kelly. Bart was voluble in his praise, and then caught himself short as he remembered that he doubted Van only half an hour previously. Doubted him and despaired. But now Van, lapsing into gloomy silence after his triumph, was again thinking of nothing but revenge. The getting of Dan Kelly meant more to him than the extinction of the moonweed. When they landed at the Toronto airport, they were welcomed with open arms instead of with rifle fire, as Bill had anticipated. The news had gone ahead of them. Already a thousand planes flying over the United States were driving back the sea of destruction. The invisible ray was a success, and the name of Carl van der Venter was now a thing with which to conjure, rather than one on which to heap imprecation and insult. Van grimaced wryly at this last bit of news. And of Danny Kelly? No one at the airport had ever heard of him. Van telephoned into the city, to police headquarters. Oh yes, they had apprehended the fugitive American at the request of Washington, but he was a slippery customer. He'd escaped. And so Van raged and fumed. Of what use were the congratulations of the night flyers who still loitered in the hangar? Of what consolation the radio reports of the success of the Ultra Indigo Ray in the States and in Europe. Ah, he had come after his man, and he'd failed. And defeat was a bitter pill. These broadcasts from the States were jubilant, and became increasingly so during the night. The moon weed was being driven back on a wide front, and by morning would be entirely surrounded. There would be no further loss of life and little more destruction of property. Carl van der Venter had saved the day. Van grunted his disgust whenever an announcer mentioned his name. When daylight came, they prepared to return. Little use there was of searching the highways and byways of Canada for the fugitive. 
He'd simply have to wait until the Canadians were able to get a line on Dan Kelly again. Oh, it was maddening. But Bart was glad. The light of reason was returning to his friend's eyes in the reaction. Then there was a telephone call from the city for Van. Police headquarters wanted him. The fanatical glint returned to his eyes when he ran for the hangar to answer the call. Perhaps they'd already captured Kelly, and he had an order in his pocket for the man's return to the States. He'd been made a deputy, and with Kelly released to him, anything might happen. Something would surely happen. But the police were reporting the unexplainable reappearance of the moonweed just outside the city limits at a point near Cooksville. Would uh, Mr. Van de Venter be so kind as to fly over there and destroy it before any lives were lost? Yes, he would. The growth had covered an acre of ground by the time they reached the spot designated, but it was the work of only a minute to blast it out of existence with the ultra indigo ray. Van then surveyed the blackened and shriveled mass with satisfaction. Let's land and take a look at it, he said. Bart thought he saw a look of exultation flash over his careworn features. Soon they were wading deep in the blackened remains of the moon wheat. The stems and tendrils snapped and crumbled into powder as they passed through. The stuff was done for, no question of that. Bill Peterson yelled and pointed a shaking forefinger at an object that lay in the blackened ruin. It was a human skeleton. The bones bare of flesh and gleaming white in the light of the early morning sun. Van was on his knees, quick as a flash, feeling around the gruesome thing, pouring at the shreds of clothing that remained. And then he was on his feet, his face shining with unholy glee. In his hands were a half dozen small, smooth objects which looked like pebbles. The diamonds. <laughs> I thought so he exclaimed. It's Kelly. Only way the sea could have gotten up here. He had some on his clothes and he didn't know it. Well, I couldn't get him myself, but anyway, I am satisfied. Well, he staggered and would have fallen had not Bart caught him in his arms. Poor old Van. Nearly killed him, this thing had, but he'd be himself again after it was all over. No wonder he'd gone out of his head with the horror of it, and the blame that had been so cruelly laid on it. No wonder he'd become obsessed with this idea of getting square with Dan Kelly. But now he was content, sleeping like a babe in Bart's arms. Tenderly they carried him to the plane and laid him out on the cushions in the back. They'd let him sleep as long as he could, returning to Washington where he'd receive his just dues in recognition for his services. Van would follow the work of reconstruction and rehabilitation. Van would glory in that. Bart regarded his sleeping friend thoughtfully as they winged their swift way toward the American border. The harsh lines that showed on his face during the past few hours were smoothed away, and in their place was an expression of deep contentment. He was at peace with the world once more. Good old Van. What a difference there would be when he awakened to full realization of the changed order of things. What satisfaction and relief. The Gate to Zora He sat in a small, half-darkened booth, well over in the corner, the man with the strangely glowing blue-green eyes. The booth was one of a score that circled the walls of the Maori hut, a popular nightclub in the San Fernando Valley, some five miles over the hills from Hollywood. It was nearly midnight. Half a dozen couples danced lazily in the central dancing space. Other couples remained tete-a-tete -tete in the secluded booths. In the entire room, only two men were dining alone. One was a slender, grey-haired little man with the weirdly glowing eyes. The other was Blair Gordon, a highly successful young attorney of Los Angeles. Both men had the unmistakable air of waiting for someone. 
Blair Gordon's college days were not so far distant that he'd yet lost any of the splendid physique that had made him an all-American tackle. In any physical combat with a slight grey-haired stranger, Gordon knew that he should be able to break the other in two with one hand. Yet, as he studied the stranger from behind the potted palms that screened his own booth, Gordon was amazed to find himself slowly being overcome by an emotion of dread so intense that it verged upon sheer fear. There was something indescribably alien and utterly sinister in that dimly seen figure in the corner booth. The faint eerie light that glowed in the stranger's deep-set eyes was not the lambent flame seen in the Chitoyan orbs of some night-prowling jungle beast. Rather, it was the blue-green glow of phosphorescent witch-light that flickers and dances in the night mists above steaming tropical swamps. The stranger's face was classically perfect in its rugged outline as that of a Roman war god, yet those perfect features seemed utterly lifeless. In the twenty minutes that he had been intently watching the stranger, Gordon could have sworn that the other's face had not moved by so much as the twist of an eyelash. Then a new couple entered the Maori hut, and Gordon promptly forgot all thought of the puzzlingly alien figure in the corner. The new arrivals were a vibrantly beautiful blonde girl and a plump, sallow-faced man in the early forties. The girl was Leia Keith, Hollywood's latest screen sensation. The man was Dave Redding, her director. A waiter seated Leia and her escort in a booth directly across the room from that of Gordon. It was a manoeuvre for which Gordon had tipped lavishly when he first came to the hut. A week ago, Leia Keith's engagement to Blair Gordon had been abruptly ended by a trivial little quarrel that two volatile temperaments had fanned into flames which apparently made reconciliation impossible. A miserably lonely week had finally ended in Gordon's present trip to the Maori hut. He knew that Leia often came here, and he had an overwhelming longing to at least see her again, even though his pride forced him to remain unseen. Now, as he stared glumly at Leia through the palms that effectively screened his own booth, Gordon heartily regretted that he'd ever come. The sight of Leah's clear, fresh beauty merely made him realise what a fool he'd been to let that ridiculous little quarrel come between them. Then, with a sudden tingling thrill, Gordon realised that he was not the only one in the room who was interested in Leah and her escort. Over in the half-darkened corner booth, the eerie stranger was staring at the girl with an intentness that made his weird eyes glow like miniature pools of shimmering blue-green fire. Again. Gordon felt that vague impression of dread, as though he were in the presence of something utterly alien to all human experience. Gordon turned his gaze back to Leia, then caught his breath sharply in sudden amazement. The necklace about Leia's throat was beginning to glow with the same uncanny blue-green light that shone in the stranger's eyes. Faint, yet unmistakable, the shimmering radiance pulsed from the necklace in an aura of nameless evil. And with the coming of that aura of weird light around her throat, a strange trance was swiftly sweeping over Leia. She sat there now as rigidly motionless as some exquisite statue of ivory and jet. Gordon stared at her in stark bewilderment. He knew the history of Leia's necklace. It was merely an oddity and nothing more, a freak piece of costume jewellery made from fragments of Arizona meteorite. Leo had worn the necklace a dozen times before without any trace of the weird phenomena that was now occurring. Dancers again thronged the floor to the blaring music while Gordon was still trying to force his whirling brain into a decision. He was certain that Leia was in deadly peril of some kind, yet the nature of that peril was too bizarre for his mind to imagine. Then the stranger with the glowing eyes took matters into his own hands. He left his booth and began threading his way through the dancers toward Leia. As he watched the progress of that slight grey-haired figure, Gordon refused to believe the evidence of his own eyes. The thing was too utterly absurd, and yet Gordon was positive that the strong oak floor of the dancing space was visibly swaying and creaking beneath the stranger's mincing tread. The stranger paused at Leia's booth only long enough to utter a brief, low voice command. Then Leia still in the grip of that strange trance, rose obediently from her seat to accompany him. Dave Redding rose angrily to intercept her. The stranger seemed to barely brush the irate director with his fingertips, and yet 
Reading real back as though struck by a pile driver. Leah and the stranger started for the door. Redding scrambled to his feet again and hurried after them. It was only then that Gordon finally shook off the stupor of utter bewilderment that had held him. Springing from his booth, he rushed after the trio. The dancers in his way delayed Gordon momentarily. Leia and the stranger were already gone when he reached the door. The narrow little entrance hallway to the hut was deserted, save for a figure sprawled there on the floor near the outer door. It was the body of Dave Redding. Gordon shuddered as he glanced briefly down at the huddled figure. A single mighty blow from some unknown weapon had crumpled the director's entire face in like the shattered shell of a broken egg. Gordon charged on through the outer door just as a heavy sedan came careening out of the parking lot. He had a flashing glimpse of Leia and the stranger in the front seat of that big car. Gordon then raced for his own machine, a powerful low-slung roadster. A single vicious jab at the starting button and the big motor leaped into roaring life. Gordon shot out from the parking lot onto the main boulevard. A hundred yards away, the sedan was fleeing toward Hollywood. Gordon tramped hard on the accelerator. His engine snarled with the unleashed fury of a hundred horsepower. The gap between the two cars was swiftly lessening. Then the stranger seemed to become aware for the first time that he was being followed. The next second, the big sedan accelerated with the hurtling speed of a flying bullet. Gordon sent his own foot nearly to the floor. The roaster jumped at 80 miles an hour, and yet the sedan continued to leave it remorselessly behind. Two cars started up the northern slope of Cahuenga Pass, with the sedan nearly 200 yards ahead and gaining all the time. Gordon wondered briefly if they were to flash down the other side of the pass, and on into Hollywood at their present mad speed. Then, at the summit of the pass, the sedan swerved abruptly to the right and fled west along the Mulholland Highway. Gordon's tire screamed as he swerved the roadster in hot pursuit. The dark, winding mountain highway was nearly deserted at the hour of the night, save for an occasional automobile that swerved frantically to the side of the road to dodge the roaring onslaught of the racing cars. Gordon and the stranger had the road to themselves. The stranger seemed no longer to be trying to leave his pursuer hopelessly behind. He allowed Gordon to come within a hundred yards of him, but that was as near as Gordon could get, in spite of the roaster's best efforts. Half a dozen times Gordon trod savagely upon his accelerator in a desperate attempt to close the gap, but each time the sedan fled with the swift grace of a scudding phantom. Finally, Gordon had to content himself with merely keeping his distance behind the glowing red taillight of the car ahead. They passed Laurel Canyon, and still the big sedan bored on to the west. Then, finally, half a dozen miles beyond Laurel Canyon, the stranger abruptly left the main highway and started up a narrow private road to the crest of one of the lonely hills. Gordon slowly gained in the next two miles. When the road ended in a winding gravel driveway into the grounds of what was apparently a private estate, the roaster was scarcely a dozen yards behind. The stranger's features as he stood there stiffly in the vivid glare of the roaster's headlights were still as devoid of all expression as ever. The only things that really seemed alive in that mask of a face were the two eyes, glowing eerie blue-green fire like twin entities of an alien evil. Gordon wasted no time in verbal sparring. He motioned briefly to Leia Keith's rigid form in the front seat of the sedan. Miss Keith is returning to Hollywood with me, he said curtly. Will he let her go peaceably, or shall I? He left that question unfinished, but its threat was obvious. Or you shall do what? asked the stranger quietly. There was an oddly metallic ring in his low, even tone. His words were so precisely clipped that they suggested some origin more mechanical than human. Or I shall take Miss Keith with me by force, Gordon flared angrily. You can try to take the lady by force, if you wish. There was an unmistakable jeering note in those metallic tones. The taunt 
was the last thing needed to unleash Gorton's volatile temper. He stepped forward and swung a hard left hook at that expressionless mask of a face. But the blow never landed. The stranger dodged it with uncanny swiftness. His answering gesture seemed merely the gentlest possible push with an outstretched hand, and yet Gordon was sent reeling backward a full dozen steps by the terrific force of that apparently gentle blow. Recovering himself, Gordon grimly returned to the attack. The stranger again flung out one hand in the contemptuous gesture which one would brush away a troublesome fly. But this time Gordon was more cautious. He neatly dodged the stranger's blow, then swung a vicious right squarely for his adversary's unprotected jaw. The blow smashed solidly home with all of Gordon's weight behind it. The stranger's jaw buckled and gave beneath that shattering impact. Then abruptly, his entire face crumpled into distorted ruin. Gordon staggered back a step in sheer horror at the gruesome result of his blow. The stranger then flung up a hand to his shattered features. When his hand came away again, his whole face came away with it. Gordon had one horror-stricken glimpse of a featureless blob of rubbery bluish-gray flesh in which fiendish eyes of blue-green fire blazed in malignant fury. And then the stranger fumbled at his collar, ripping the linen swiftly away. Something lashed out from beneath his throat, a loathsome, snake-like object, slender and forked at the end. For one ghastly moment, as the writhing tentacle swung into line with him, Gordon saw its forked ends glow with strange fire. One a vivid blue, the other a sparkling green. And then the world was abruptly blotted out for Blair Gordon. Consciousness returned to Gordon as swiftly and painlessly as it had left him. For a moment he blinked stupidly in a dazed effort to comprehend the incredible scene before him. He was seated in a chair, over near the wall of a large room that was flooded with livid red light from a single globe overhead. Beside him sat Leia Keep, also staring with dazed eyes in an effort to comprehend her surroundings. Directly in front of them stood a figure of stark, nightmare horror. The weirdly glowing eyes identified the figure as that of the stranger at the Maori hut, but there every point of resemblance ceased. Only the cleverest of facial masks and body padding could have ever enabled this monstrosity to pass unnoticed in a world of normal human beings. And now that disguise was completely stripped away. His slight frame was revealed as a grotesque parody of that of a human being, with arms and legs like pipe stems, a bald oval head that merged with neckless rigidity directly into a heavy-shouldered body that tapered into an almost wasp-like slenderness at the waist. He was naked save for a loincloth of some metallic fabric. His bluish-gray skin had a dull, oily sheen strangely suggestive of fine-grained, flexible metal. The creature's face was hideously unlike anything human. Beneath the glowing eyes was a small circular mouth orifice with a cluster of gill-like appendages on either side of it. Patches of lighter-coloured skin on either side of the head seemed to serve as ears. From a point just under the head, where the throat of a human being would have been, dangled the foot-and-a-half-long tentacle whose forked tip had sent Gordon into oblivion. Behind the creature, Gordon was dimly aware of a maze of complicated and utterly unfamiliar apparatus ranged along the opposite wall, giving the room the appearance of being a laboratory of some kind. Gordon's obvious bewilderment seemed to amuse the bluish-grey monstrosity. "'May I uh, introduce myself?' he asked with a mocking note in his metallic voice. "'I am Arlok of Zoran. I am an explorer of space, and, more particularly, an opener of gates. My home is upon Zoran, which is one of the eleven major planets that circle about the giant blue-white sun that your astronomers call Rigel. I am here to open the gate between your world and mine. Gordon placed a reassuring hand over Leia. All memory of their quarrel was obliterated in the face of their present parent. He felt her slender fingers twined firmly with his. 
Warm contact gave both of them new courage. We of Zoran need your planet and intend to take possession of it, Arlok continued. But the vast distance which separates Rigel from your solar system makes it impracticable to transport any considerable number of our people here in space cars, for though our space cars travel with practically the speed of light, it requires over 540 years for them to cross that great void. So I was sent as a lone pioneer to your Earth to do the necessary work here in order to open the gate that would enable Zoran to cross the barrier in less than a minute of your time. That gate is the one through the fourth dimension, for Zoran and your planet in a four-dimensional universe are almost touching each other in spite of the great distance separating them in a three-dimensional universe. We of Zoran, being three-dimensional creatures like you Earthlings, cannot even exist on a four-dimensional plane. But we can, by the use of apparatus, open a gate, pass through a thin sector of the fourth dimension, and emerge in a far distant part of our three-dimensional universe. The situation of our two worlds, Arlok continued, is somewhat like that of two dots on opposite ends of a long strip of paper that's curved almost into a circle. To two-dimensional beings capable of only realizing and traveling along the two dimensions of the paper itself, those dots might be many feet apart, yet in the third dimension straight across free space they might be separated by only the thousandth part of an inch. In order to take that shortcut across the third dimension, the two-dimensional creatures of the paper would have only to transform a small strip of the intervening space into a two-dimensional surface like their paper. They could do this, of course, by the use of proper vibration-creating machinery, for all things in a material universe are merely a matter of vibration. We of Zoran plan to cross the barrier of the fourth dimension by creating a narrow strip of vibrations powerful enough to exactly match and nullify those of the fourth dimension itself. The result will be that this narrow strip will temporarily become an area of three dimensions only, an area over which we can safely pass from our world to yours. Arlok indicated one of the pieces of the apparatus on the opposite wall of the room. It was an intricate arrangement of finely wound coils with wires leading to scores of needle-like points which constantly shimmered and crackled with tiny blue-white flames. Thick cables ran to a bank of concave reflectors of some gleaming greyish metal. There is the apparatus which will supply the enormous power necessary to nullify the vibrations of the fourth dimensional barrier, Arlok explained. It is a condenser and adapter of the cosmic force that you call the Millikan rays. In Zoran, a similar apparatus is already set up and finished, but the gate can only be opened by simultaneous actions from both sides of the barrier. That is why I was sent on my long journey through space to do the necessary work here. I am now nearly finished. A few more hours will see the final opening of the gate, and then the fighting hordes of Zoran can sweep through the barrier and overwhelm your planet. When the gate from Zoran to a new planet is first opened, Arlok continued, our scientists always like to have at least one pair of specimens of the new world's inhabitants sent through to them for experimental use. So tonight, while waiting for one of my final castings to cool, I improved the time by making a brief raid upon the place you call the Maori Hut. The lady here seemed an excellent type of your earthling women, and the meteoric iron in her necklace made a perfect focus for electric hypnosis. Well, her escort was too inferior a specimen to be of value to me, so I killed him when he attempted to interfere. When you gave chase, I lured you on until I could see whether you might be usable. You proved an excellent specimen, so I merely stunned you. Very soon now, I shall be ready to send the two of you through the gate to our scientists in Zora. A cold wave of sheer horror swept over Gordon. It was impossible to doubt the stark and deadly menace promised in the plan of this grim visitor from an alien universe, a menace that loomed not only for Gordon and Lea, but for the teeming millions of a doomed and defenceless world. Let me show you Zora, Arlok offered. Then you may be better able to understand. He turned his back carelessly upon his two captive and strode over to the apparatus along the opposite wall. 
Gordon longed to hurl himself upon the unprotected back of the retreating Zoranian, but he knew that any attempt of that kind would be suicidal. Arlok's deadly tentacle would strike him down before he was halfway across the room. He searched his surroundings with desperate eyes for anything that might serve as a weapon, and his pulse quickened with sudden hope. There on a small table near Leia was the familiar bulk of a forty-five caliber revolver, loaded and ready for use. It was included in a miscellaneous collection of other small earthly tools and objects that Arlok had apparently collected for study. There was an excellent chance that Leia might be able to secure the gun unobserved. Gordon pressed her fingers in a swift attempt at signalling, then jerked his hand ever so slightly toward the table. A moment later, the quick answering pressure of Leia's fingers told him that she'd understood his message. From the corner of his eye, Gordon saw Leia's other hand begin cautiously groping behind her for the revolver. Then... Both Gordon and Leia froze into sudden immobility as Arlok faced them again from beside an apparatus slightly reminiscent of an earthly radio set. Arlok threw a switch, and a small bank of tubes glowed pale green. A yard square plate of bluish grey metal on the wall above the apparatus glowed with milky fluorescence. It is easy to penetrate the barrier with light waves, Arlok explained. That is a gate that can readily be opened from either side. It was through it that we first discovered your Earth. Arlok then threw a rheostat on to more power. The luminous plate cleared swiftly. And there, Earthlings, is Zora, Arlok proclaimed proudly. Leia and Gordon gasped in sheer amazement as the glowing plate became a veritable window into another world, a world of utter and alien terror. The livid light of a giant red sun blazed mercilessly down upon a landscape from which every vestige of animal and plant life had apparently been stripped. Naked rocks and barren soil stretched endlessly to the far horizon in a vast monotony of utter desolation. Arlok twirled the knob of the apparatus, and another scene flashed into view. In this scene, great gleaming squares and cones of metal rose in towering clusters from the startly barren land. Hordes of creatures like Arlok swarmed in and around the metal buildings. Giant machines whirled countless wheels in strange tasks. From a thousand great needle-like projections on the buildings spurted shimmering sheets of crackling flame, bathing the entire scene in a whirling mist of fiery vapors. Gordon realized dimly that he must be looking into one of the cities of Zoran, but every detail of the chaotic whirl of activities was too utterly unfamiliar to carry any real significance to his bewildered brain. He was as hopelessly overwhelmed as a savage would be if transported suddenly into the heart of Times Square. Arlok again twirled the knob. The scene shifted, apparently to another planet. This world was still alive, with rich verdure and swarming millions of people strangely like those of Earth. But it was a doomed world. The dreaded gate to Zoran had already been opened here. Legions of bluish-grey Zoranians were attacking the planet's inhabitants, and the attack of those metallic hosts was irresistible. The slight bodies of the Zoranians seemed as impervious to bullets and missiles as though armor-plated. The frantic defense of the beleaguered people of the Doom Planet caused hardly a casualty in the Zoranian ranks. The attack of the Zoranians was hideously effective. Clouds of dense yellow fog belch from countless projectors in the hands of these bluish-grey hosts, and beneath that deadly miasma all animal and plant life on the doomed planet was crumbling, dying and rotting into a liquid slime. And then even the slime was swiftly obliterated, and the Zoranians were left triumphant upon a world starkly desolate. That was one of the minor planets in the swarm that make up the solar system of the sun that your astronomers call Canopus, Arlok explained. Our first task in conquering a world is to rid it of the unclean surface scum of animal and plant life. When this noxious surface mold is eliminated, the planet is then ready to furnish us sustenance, for we Zoranians live directly upon the metallic elements of the planet itself. Our bodies are of a substance of which your scientists have never even dreamed. Deathless. Invincible. 
living metal. Arlok again twirled the control of the apparatus, and the scene was shifted back to the planet of Zora, this time to the interior of what was apparently a vast laboratory. Here scores of Zoranian scientists were working upon captives who were pathetically like human beings of Earth itself, working with lethal gases and deadly liquids as human scientists might experiment upon noxious pests. The details of the scene were so utterly revolting, the tortures that were being inflicted so starkly horrible, that Leia and Gordon sank back in their chairs, sick and shaken. Arlok snapped off a switch, and the green light in the tubes died. That last scene was the laboratory to which I shall send you to presently, he said callously as he started back across the room toward them. Gordon lurched to his feet, his brain a seething whirl of hate in which all thought of caution was gone as he tensed his muscles to hurl himself upon that grim monstrosity from the bleak and desolate realm of Zoran. Then he felt Leia tugging surreptitiously at his right hand. The next moment the bulk of something cold and hard met his fingers. It was the revolver. Leia had secured it while Arlok was busy with his interdimensional televisor. Arlok was rapidly approaching them now. Gordon hoped against hope that the menace of that deadly tentacle might be diverted for the fraction of a second necessary for him to get in a crippling shot. Leia seemed to divine his thoughts. She suddenly screamed hysterically and flung herself on the floor, almost at Arlok's feet. Arlok stopped in obvious wonder and bent over Leia. Gordon took instant advantage of the Zoranian's diverted attention. He whipped the revolver from behind him and fired point-blank at Arlok's unprotected head. The bullet struck squarely, but Arlok barely even staggered. A tiny spot of bluish-gray skin upon his oval skull gleamed faintly for a moment under the bullet's impact. Then the heavy pellet of lead thoroughly flattened as though it had struck the triple armor of a battleship, dropped spent and harmless to the floor. Arlok straightened swiftly. For the moment he seemed to have no thought of retaliating with his deadly tentacle. He merely stood there quite still with one thin arm thrown up to guard his glowing eyes. Gordon sent the remainder of the revolver's bullets crashing home as fast as his finger could press the trigger. At that murderously short range, the smashing rain of lead should have dropped a charging gorilla. But for all the effects Gordon's shots had upon the Zoranian, his ammunition might as well have been pellets of paper. Arlok's glossy hide merely glowed momentarily in tiny patches as the bullet struck and flattened harmlessly. And that was all. His last cartridge fired. Gordon flung the empty weapon squarely at the blue monstrosity's hideous face. Arlok made no attempt to dodge. The heavy revolver struck him high on the forehead, then rebounded harmlessly to the floor. Arlok paid no more attention to the blow than a man would to the casual touch of a wind-blown feather. Gordon then desperately flung himself forward upon the Zoranian in one last mad effort to overwhelm him. Arlok dodged Gordon's wild blows, then gently swept the Earthman into the embrace of his thin arms. For one helpless moment, Gordon sensed the incredible strength and adamantine hardness of the Zoranian slender figure, together with an overwhelming impression of colossal weight in that deceptively slight body. Then Arlok contemptuously flung Gordon away from him. As Gordon staggered backward, Arlok's tentacle lashed upward and leveled upon him. His twin tips again glowed bright green and livid blue. Instantly, every muscle in Gordon's body was paralyzed. He stood there as rigid as a statue, his body completely deadened from the neck down. Beside him stood Leia, also frozen motionless in that same weird power. Earthling, you were beginning to try my patience, Arlok snapped. Can you not realize that I am utterly invincible in any combat with you? The living metal of my body weighs over 1,600 pounds in your measurements. The strength inherent in that metal is sufficient to tear a hundred of your Earthmen to shreds. But I do not even have to touch you to vanquish you. The electric content of my bodily structure is so infinitely superior to yours 
that with this tentacle organ of mine I can instantly short-circuit the feeble currents of your nerve impulses and bring either paralysis or death as I choose. But enough of this. Our luck broke off abruptly. My materials are now ready, and it is time that I finish my work. I shall put you out of my way for a few hours until I am ready to send you through the gate to the laboratories of Zora. The green and blue fire of the tentacles' tips flamed to dazzling brightness. The paralysis of Gordon's body swept swiftly over his brain, and black oblivion engulfed him. When Gordon again recovered consciousness, he found he was lying on the floor of what was apparently a narrow hall, near the foot of a stairway. His hands were lashed tightly behind him, and his feet and legs were so firmly pinioned together that he could scarcely move. Beside him lay Leia, also tightly bound. A short distance down the hall was the closed door of Arlok's workroom, recognisable by the thin line of red light gleaming beneath it. Moonlight through a window at the rear of the hall made objects around Gordon fairly clear. He looked at Leia and saw tears glistening on her long lashes. Oh, Blair, I was afraid you'd never waken again, the girl sobbed. I thought that fiend had killed you. Her voice was breaking hysterically. Steady, darling, Gordon said soothingly. You simply can't give up now, you know. If that monstrosity ever opens that accursed gate of his, then our entire world is doomed. There must be some way to stop him. I've got to find that way and try it, even if it seems only one forlorn chance in a million. Gordon shook his head to clear the numbness still lingering from the effect of Arlok's tentacle. The Zoranian seemed unable to produce a paralysis of any great duration with his weird natural weapon. Accordingly, he had been forced to bind his captives like two trust fowls while he returned to his labours. Lying as close together as they were, it was a comparatively easy matter for them to get their bound hands within reach of each other. But after fifteen minutes of vain work, Gordon realised that any attempt at untying the ropes was useless. Arlok's prodigious strength had drawn the knots so tight that no human power could ever loosen them. Then Gordon suddenly thought of one thing in his pockets that might help them. It was a tiny cigarette lighter, of the spring trigger type. It was in his vest pocket, completely out of reach of his bound hands. But there was a way out of that difficulty. Gordon and Leia twisted and rolled their bodies like two contortionists, until they succeeded in getting into such a position that Leia was able to get her teeth into the cloth of the vest pocket's edge. A moment of desperate tugging, and the fabric gave way. The lighter dropped from the torn pocket to the floor, where Leia retrieved it. Then they twisted their bodies back to back. Leia managed to get the lighter flaming in her bound hands. Gordon groped in an effort to guide the ropes on his wrists over the tiny, flickering flame. Then there came the faint, welcome odour of smouldering rope, as the lighter's tiny flame bit into the bond. Gordon bit his lips to suppress a cry of pain as the flame seared into his skin as well. The flame bit deeper into the rope, and a single strand snapped. Then another strand gave way. To Gordon the process seemed endless as the flame scorched rope and flesh alike. A long minute of lancing agony that seemed hours, and then Gordon could stand no more. He tensed his muscles in one mighty agonised effort to end the torture of the flame. The weakened rope gave way completely beneath that pain-maddening lunge. Gordon's hands were free. It was now an easy matter to use the lighter to finish freeing himself and Leia. They made their way swiftly back to the window at the rear of the hall. It slid silently upward. Then, a moment later, they were out in the brilliant moonlight. Free! They made their way around to the front of the house. Behind the drawn shades of one of the front rooms, an eerie glow of red light marked the location of Arlok's workroom. They heard the occasional clink of tools inside the room as the Zoranian diligently worked to complete his apparatus. They crept stealthily up to where one of the French windows of Arlok's workroom swung slightly ajar. 
Through the narrow crevice they could see Arlok's grotesque back as he laboured over the complex assembly of the apparatus against the wall. One heavy stone flung through the window would probably wreck that delicate mechanism completely, yet the two watchers knew that such a respite would only be a temporary one, as long as Arlok remained alive on this planet to build another gate to Zoran. Earth's eventual doom was certain. Complete destruction of Arlok himself was Earth's only hope of salvation. The Zoranian seemed to be nearing the end of his labours. He held the apparatus momentarily and walked over to a workbench where he picked up a slender rod-like tool. Donning a heavy glove to shield his left hand, he selected a small plate of bluish-grey metal and pressed a switch in the handle of the tool in his right hand. A blade of blinding white flame, seemingly as solid as a blade of metal, spurted the length of a foot from the tool's tip. Arlok began cutting the plate with the flame, the blade shearing through the heavy metal as easily as a hot knife shears through butter. The sight brought a sudden surge of exultant hope to Gordon. He swiftly drew Leia away from the window, far enough to the side that their low-voiced conversation could not be heard from inside the workroom. Leia... There's our one chance, he explained excitedly. That blue fiend is vulnerable, and that flame tool of his is the weapon to reach his vulnerability. Did you notice how careful he was to shield his other hand with a glove before he turned the tool on? He can be hurt by that blade of flame, and probably hurt badly. Leia nodded in quick understanding. If I could lure him out of the room for just a moment, you could slip in through the window and get that flame tool, Blair she suggested eagerly. Oh, that might work, Gordon agreed reluctantly. But Leia, don't run any more risks than you absolutely have to. He then picked up a small rock. Here, take this with you. Open the door into the hall and attract Arlok's attention by throwing the rock at his precious apparatus. Then the minute he sees you, try to escape through the hall again. He'll leave his work to follow you. When he returns to his workroom, I'll be in there waiting for him. And I'll be waiting with a weapon that can stab through even that armor-plated hide of his. They separated then. Leia to enter the house, Gordon to return to the window. Arlok was back over in front of the apparatus, fitting into place the piece of metal he'd just cut. The flame tool, his switch now turned off, was still on the workbench. Gordon's heart pounded with excitement as he crouched there, with his eyes fixed upon the closed hall door. The minutes seemed to drag interminably. Then suddenly, Gordon's muscles tensed. The knob of the hall door had turned ever so slightly. Leia was at her post. The next moment, the door was flung open with a violence that sent it slamming back against the wall. The slender figure of Leia stood framed in the opening her dark eyes blazing as she flung one hand up to hurl her missile. Arlok whirled around just as Leia threw the rock straight to the intricate gate-opening apparatus. With incredible speed, the Zoranian flung his own body over to shield his fragile instruments. The rock thudded harmlessly against his metallic chest. And then Arlok's tentacle flung out like a striking cobra, its fork-tipped flaming blue and green fire as it focused upon the open door. But Leia was already gone. Gordon heard her flying footsteps as she raced down the hall. Arlok promptly sped after her in swift pursuit. As Arlok passed through the door into the hall, Gordon flung himself into the room and sped straight for the workbench. He snatched the flame tool up, then darted over to the wall by the door. He was not a second too soon. The heavy tread of Arlok's return was already audible in the hall just outside. Gordon prepared to stake everything upon his one slim chance of disabling that fearful tentacle before Arlok could bring it into action. He pressed the tiny switch in the flame tool's handle just as Arlok came through the door. Arlok, startled by the glare of the flame tool's blazing blade, whirled toward Gordon, but too late. That thin, searing shaft of vivid flame had already struck squarely at the base of the Zoranian's tentacle. A seething spray of hissing sparks marked the place where the flame bit deeply home. Arlok screamed, a ghastly metallic note of anguish like nothing human. 
The Zeranian's powerful hands clutched at Gordon, but he leaped lively backward out of their reach. Then Gordon again attacked, the flame tool's shining blade licking in and out like a rapier. The searing flame swept across one of Arlok's arms, and the Zeranian winced. Then the blade stabbed swiftly at Arlok's waist. He half doubled as he flinched back. Gordon shifted his aim with lightning speed and sent the blade of flame lashing in one accurate, terrible stroke that caught Arlok squarely in the eyes. Again Arlok screamed in intolerable agony as that tearing flame darkened forever his glowing eyes. In berserker fury, the tortured Zeranian charged blindly toward Gordon. Gordon warily dodged to one side. Arlok, now sightless, and his tentacle crippled, still had enough power in that mighty metallic body of his to tear a hundred earthmen to pieces. Gordon stung Arlok's shoulder with a the flame, then desperately leaped just to one side in time to dodge a flailing blow that would have made pulp of his body had it landed. Arlok went stark wild in his frenzied efforts to come to grips with this unseen adversary. Furniture crashed and splintered to kindling wood beneath his threshing feet. Even the stout walls of the room shivered and cracked at the incredible weight of Arlok's body as it crooned against them. Gordon circled lithely around the crippled blue monstrosity like a timber wolf circling a wounded moose. He began concentrating his attack upon Arlok's left leg. Half a dozen deep slashes with a searing flame, then suddenly the thin leg crumpled and broke. And Arlok crashed helplessly to the floor. Gordon was now able to shift his attack to Arlok's head. Dodging the blindly flailing arms of the Zeranian, he stabbed again and again at that oval-shaped skull. The searing thrusts began to have their effect. Arlok's convulsive movements became slower and weaker. Gordon sent the flame stabbing in a long final thrust in an attempt to pierce through to that alien metal brain. With startling suddenness, the flame burned its way home to some unknown centre of life force in the oval skull. There was a brief but appalling gush of bright purple flame from Arlok's eye sockets and mouth orifice, and then his twitching body stiffened. His bluish-grey hide darkened with incredible swiftness into a dull black. Arlok was dead. Gordon, sickened at the grisly ending to the battle, snapped off the flame tool and turned to search for Leia. He found her already standing in the hall door, alive and unhurt. I escaped through the window at the end of the hall, she explained. Arlok quit following me as soon as he saw that you two were gone from where he'd left us tied. She shuddered as she looked down at the Zoranian's mangled body. I saw most of your fight with him, Blair. It was terrible, awful. But Blair, we've won. Yeah, now we'll make sure of the fruits of our victory, Gordon said grimly, starting over toward the gate-opening apparatus with the flame tool in his hand. Only a few minutes' work with the shearing blade of flame reduced the intricate apparatus to a mere tangled pile of twisted metal. Our lock, gate-opener of Zoran, was dead and the gate to that grim planet was now irrevocably closed. Blair, do you feel it too? That eerie feeling of countless eyes still watching us from Zora. There was Frank Orr in Leia's half-whispered question. You know Arlok said that they'd watched us for centuries from their side of the barrier. I'm sure they're watching us now. Will they send another opener of gates to take up the work where Arlok failed? Gordon took Leia into his arms. Well, I don't know, dear, he admitted gravely. They may send another messenger, but I doubt it. This world of ours has had its warning, and we'll heed it. The Watchers of Zoran must know that in the 540 years it would take their next messenger to get here, the Earth will have done more than enough to prepare an adequate defense for even Zoran's minute. Well, I doubt if there'll ever again be an attempt made to open the gate of Zoran. The Destroyer 
The pencil in the hand of Alan Parker refused to obey his will. Some strange unseen force pushed his will aside and took possession of the pencil point, so that what he drew was not his own. It was the same when he turned from drawing board to typewriter. The sentences were not of his framing. The ideas were utterly foreign to him. This was the first hint he received of the fate that was drawing in like night upon him and his beautiful wife. Parker, a young writer of growing reputation who illustrated his own work, was making a series of pencil sketches for a romance partly finished. The story was as joyous and elusive as sunlight, and until today his sketches had held the same quality. Now he couldn't tap the reservoir from which he'd taken the wind-blown hair and smiling eyes of Madeline, his heroine. When he drew or wrote, he seemed to be submerged in the dark waters of a measureless evil pit. The face that mocked him from the paper was stamped with a world-old knowledge of forbidden things. Parker dropped his pencil and leaned back, tortured. He and his wife, Betty, had taken this house in Pine Hills, a small and extremely quiet suburban village, solely for the purpose of concentration on the book which was to be the most important work he'd ever done. He went to the door of the room that he used for a studio and called out. Betty, can you come here a moment, please? There was a patter of running feet on the stairs, and then a girl of twenty or thereabouts came into the room. Oh, any man would have said she was a blessing. Her hair was yellow like ripe corn, and her vivid blue eyes held depth and character and charm. Well, uh, look, exclaimed Parker. Mm. What do you think of this stuff? For a moment there was silence. Then Alan Parker saw something he'd never seen before in his wife's face, for him or for his work. A look of complete disgust. Well, I wouldn't have believed you capable of doing anything so... so horrid, she said coldly. How could you? Uh, I don't know. His arms, which had been ready to take her to him for comfort, dropped. The work has been um, difficult lately. It's as though something was pulling at my mind. But well, not like this. I mean, it isn't me. Well, it must be you since it came out of you. She turned away and moved restlessly to one of the windows. Look, through me, muttered Parker. Ideas come through me. You have to do something. Yeah, what? I don't know what to do. Why not go see that new doctor? Asked Betty over her shoulder. You know, Dr. Friedrich von Stein. Von Stein? Repeated Parker vaguely. Don't know him. Anyhow, I don't need a doctor. What in the world made you think of that? Nothing. Except I can see his house from here. He's taken what they call the old Reynolds place, you know, opposite the church. We looked at it and thought it was too large for us. Oh, he's uh, made a lot of alterations. Oh, uh, yeah. Parker had placed the newcomer, more recent than himself. Yeah, I had an idea that he was a doctor of philosophy, though, not medicine. Oh, he has half a dozen degrees, they say. Certainly he's a stunning-looking man. I saw him on the street. Oh, maybe he doesn't practice. The artist was gazing, baffled and sick at heart upon what he'd wrought. And what could he do, unless it's my liver? Well, he might be a psychoanalyst or something like that, she replied slowly. Yeah, but oh, why the wild interest in this particular doctor? Parker got up and looked at her. He felt irritable and was ashamed of it. Only for your work said Betty. A faint pink touched her cheeks. Alan Parker had a sudden feeling of certainty that his wife was lying to him. To one who knew the Parkers, it would have been equally impossible to think of Betty as lying, or of her husband as believing such a thing. And Parker was outraged by his own suspicion. He sprang up and began to pace the floor. All right, then, he exploded. My work is going to the dogs. Right. There's an appointment with Cartwright tomorrow to show him these sketches, and the last few chapters I've done. Look, we'll go now. If this man can't do anything for me, I'll try somebody else. 
In ten minutes they were walking up the quiet street toward the present home of Dr. Friedrich von Stein. Despite his self-absorption, Parker could not help noticing that his wife had never looked more attractive than she did at this moment. Her colour had deepened. Little wisps of hair curled against her cheeks, and there was a sparkle in her eyes which he knew came only on very particular occasions. Even from the outside, it was apparent that many strange things had been done to the dignified house of Reynolds. A mass of aerials hung above the roof. Some new windows had been cut at the second floor and filled with a glass of a peculiar reddish-purple tinge. A residence had been turned into oh, a laboratory, in sharp contrast to the charming houses up and down the streets and the church of grey stone that stood opposite. Beside the door at the main entrance, a modest plate bore the legend, Dr. Friedrich von Stein. Parker pressed the bell, then he squared his broad shoulders and waited. A very miserable, very likeable young man with a finely shaped head and a good set of muscles under his well-cut clothes. Well, he brought his sketches, but he was uncomfortable with the portfolio under his arm. It seemed, well, it seemed like it was contaminating him. The door opened to reveal a blocky figure of a man in a workman's blouse and overalls. The fellow was pale of eye, towel-headed, and he appeared to be good-natured but of little intelligence. The only remarkable thing about him was a livid welt that ran across one cheek from nose to ear. Beside him a glossy-coated dachshund wagged furiously after having barked once as a matter of duty. Um, may we see Dr. Von Stein? asked Parker. Or if he's in. I'll ask Herr Doctor if he is in, replied the man stiffly. I Dummkopf roared a voice from inside the house. An instant later, the man and the dog shrank back along the hall, and there appeared in their place one of the most striking personalities Alan Parker had ever seen. Dr. Friedrich von Stein was inches more than six feet tall, and he stood perfectly upright, with the unmistakable carriage of a well-drilled soldier. He was big-boned, but lean and every movement was made with military precision. More than any other feature, his eyes impressed Parker. They were steady, penetrating, and absolutely black. But through a thread of grey hair here and there, his well-kept beard and hair were black. He might have been any age from forty to sixty, so deceptive was his appearance. Come in, if you please, he said before Parker could speak. Von Stein's voice was rich and deep, but with a metallic quality which somehow corresponded with his mechanical smile. Except for the guttural R's, there was hardly a hint of the foreigner in his speech. It is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Parker, I believe. I am Dr. Von Stein. He stood aside for them to pass into the hallway, and while they murmured their thanks, he shot a volley of German at the man whom he called Heinrich. The frightened servant vanished, and the Parkers were taken into a living room, furnished carelessly, but in good enough taste. Betty took her place on a couch, to which the doctor led her with a bow. Parker sank into an overstuffed chair not far from the window. I learned your names because of the uh, beauty of the madame, said von Stein, as he stood looming above the mantel. Again he bowed. One could not see her without wishing to know how such a charming woman was called. You are my neighbours from down the street, I believe. Uh, yes, replied Alan. He wanted to be agreeable, but found it difficult. And I uh, think Mrs. Parker has developed a great admiration for you. She persuaded me to come here today. Listen, um, are you by chance a psychoanalyst? I don't even know that you're a doctor of medicine, but... Uh, Oh, I know a very great deal about the human mind, interrupted Dr. von Stein calmly. I know a great deal about many things. I'm not going to practice medicine here in Pine Hills because I have research work to do. But I will help you if I can. Now, ah, what is your trouble? The question brought back to Parker the mood of half an hour ago. Almost savagely, he snapped the portfolio open and spread out a few of his recent drawings 
with some of the earlier ones for comparison. Look, he cried, these vicious things are what I'm doing now. I, I can't help myself. The pencil does not obey me. Apparently I have no emotional control. It's as though my normal ideas were shouldered aside like people in a crowd. And my writing today was as bad as these illustrations. I'm doing a book. Oh, consider these things carefully, Doctor. They're not obscene except by inference. They can't be censored. Well, the book would go through the mails, but they are deadly. Look at my heroine in these two pictures. In one she's like... like violets, and in the other she looks capable of any crime. God, what is she? A vampire? If there is such a thing. A witch? I can almost believe in demonology since I made these last drawings. Parker, in spite of his excitement, tried to read the face of Dr. Friedrich von Stein. He found nothing but the automatic smile upon that mask. Yet it seemed to the artist that this time there was a hint of real pleasure in the curve of his lips. Was it possible that anyone could like those drawings? Parker began to think that he was going insane. Well, this is most unfortunate for you, rumbled the doctor. I understand, but I trust that the condition can be remedied if it persists. You, Mr. Parker, and you, madame, do you understand something of physics, of uh, psychology, or metaphysics? Oh, I fear that I am rather ignorant, answered Betty. Certainly I am in comparison with a man of your attainments. Dr. Von Stein once again bowed. He then turned his black eyes upon Parker. And you, sir, I must adjust my explanation to, uh, what shall I say, uh, to your knowledge of the higher reaches of scientific thought. Well, I uh, majored in philosophy in college, said Parker, hesitatingly. But that was quite a time ago, Herr Doctor. Of course, I've tried to keep up with the conclusions of science, but a writer or a painter doesn't have too much opportunity. He has his own problems to concern him. Ah, uh, yes, uh, indeed. Dr. von Stein was thoughtful. So, and uh, especially for the benefit of the madame, I shall speak in terms of the uh, concrete. Oh, please don't consider me stupid, begged Betty, but I do want to understand. Certainly, except that you are not stupid, madame. I will proceed. Uh, well, both of you, I assume, know something of the radio. Very good. You know that the etheric wave transmits the message and that it is received and amplified so it is within the range of the human ear. These waves were there when Paleolithic man hunted his meat with a stone-tipped club. But to use them, it was necessary to invent the microphone and a receiving instrument. Now, what I have said you already know, but here is what may startle you. Human thought is an etheric wave of the same essential nature as the radio wave. They are both electrical currents external to man. Thoughts sweep across the human mind as sound currents sweep across the aerials of a radio. Oh, I told you! Alan Parker turned a triumphant face to his wife. Oh, pardon me, Herr Doctor. I've tried to convince Mrs. Parker that my idea came from outside. Ah, exactly. Dr. Stein took no offense. And the difference between the mind and the radio set is that with the radio you tune in upon whatever you choose and when you choose. But the mind is under no such control, although it should be. It receives that to which it happens to be open, or that thought which has been uh, intensified and strengthened by having been received and entertained by other minds. Now, in India, they say, 5,000 died of the plague and 50,000 died of fear. Uh, do you both follow me? Well, it was unnecessary to ask. Betty sat on the edge of the couch, intent upon every word. Parker, although more restrained, was equally interested. Moreover, he was delighted to have what he had felt instinctively confirmed, in a way, by a man of science. And Herbert Spencer said, continued the doctor, that no thought, no feeling is ever manifested save as a result of a physical force. 
This principle will before long be a scientific commonplace, and Huxley predicted that we would arrive at a mechanical equivalent of a consciousness. But I will not attempt to bolster my position with authorities. I know, and I can prove what I know. You, Mr. Parker, have been receiving some particularly annoying thoughts, which have been intensified, it may be, by others, or by one other. Human willpower can alter the rate of vibration of the line of force, or etheric wave. So-called good thoughts have a high rate of vibration. Those which are called bad ordinarily have a low rate. Have you perhaps an enemy? Well, uh, not that I know of, replied Parker in a low voice. And it would follow that uh, this is accidental. Good God, do you mean that well, do you mean to say that someone could have done this to me maliciously? Ah, oh, so far my experiments leave something to be desired, said Dr. Von Stein, without answering directly. No doubt you are peculiarly susceptible to thoughts which bear in any way on your work. Oh, but isn't there any help for it? asked Betty. She was regarding her husband with the eyes of a stranger. I believe I can do something for Mr. Parker. There was a knock on the door then. The doctor bombed an order to come in. Heinrich, with a dachshund at his heels, entered bearing a tray with a bottle of wine and some slices of heavy fruitcake. He drew out a table and placed the tray on it. Do not bring that dog in when I have guests, said Von Stein. He spoke with a gleam of bright white teeth. You know what will happen, Heinrich? Ja, Herr Doctor. I take Hans out. The man was clearly terrified. He gathered the dog into his arms and fairly fled from the room. Dr. Von Stein turned with a smile. I have to uh, discipline him, he explained. He's a stupid fellow, but faithful. I can't have ordinary servants about. There are scientific men who would be willing to bribe them for a look at my laboratory. Well, I didn't know such things were done among scholars, said Betty slowly. Uh, what I have accomplished means power, madame, exclaimed the doctor. There are jackals in every walk of life. If an unscrupulous man of science got into my laboratory, a physicist, for instance, well, he might find out certain things. Dr. Von Stein then returned to his duties as host. He filled their glasses and watched with satisfaction Betty's obvious enjoyment of the cake. A box of mellow Havanas appeared from a cabinet, imported cigarettes from a smoking stand. But Parker, in spite of a liking for good wine and tobacco, was far too much concerned about his work to forget the errand that had brought him there. So, um, you think... Uh, he said when there's an opportunity, that you can help me, Dr. Von Stein. I can, replied Von Stein firmly. But before attempting anything, I'd like to wait a day or two. The attacking thoughts may become less violent, or your resistance greater. In either of which cases the condition will fade out. You will either get better or much worse. If you are worse, come to see me again and I promise that I will do something to help you. Okay, I'll come back, and thank you. Parker felt better and more cheerful than he had since the beginning of this disturbance. Well, few things could make me suffer so much as trouble with my work. Ah, that's what I thought, agreed Dr. Von Stein. Betty got up. Her husband caught the look in her eyes as they met the bright, black gaze of Dr. Von Stein, and he went cold. That look had always been for him alone. Her feet seemed to linger on the way to the door. Oh, she's wonderful, she breathed as they started down the uneventful street. Well, scientific things never interested me before, but he kind of makes them vital, alive. And yet, said Parker thoughtfully, there's something really strange and uncanny about that man. Oh, nonsense, exclaimed Betty. It's because he's a genius. 
Don't be so small, Alan. And Parker gasped and remained silent. He could remember a time when his wife had ever spoken to him in quite that way. They finished the little journey home without speaking again, and Parker went directly to the studio. He sat down with the drooping shoulders and considered the mess he'd made of his book. Well, there was nothing to do but to see Cartwright tomorrow and face the music. Dinner that night was a mournful affair, the soft footsteps of the servant going in and out of the dining room, the ticking of the clock were almost the only sounds. Betty was deep in her own thoughts. Parker was too miserable to talk. He went to bed early and lay staring into the darkness for what seemed like an eternity of slow, moving hours. The tall, deep-voiced clock in the hallway downstairs had just struck one when suddenly Parker's room was flooded with light. He sat up, blinking, and saw Betty standing near the bed. Her fingers twisted against one another. Her face was drawn and white. Alan, she whispered. I'm afraid. Instantly he was on his feet. His arms went around her and the yellow head dropped wearily against his shoulder. Afraid of what? he cried out. What is it, sweetheart? I don't know. All at once her body stiffened and she pulled away from him. Then she laughed. Oh, oh, nonsense. I must have been having a bad dream. It's nothing. Oh, I'm sorry I woke you up, Alan. And she was gone before he could stop her. Oh, bewildered, he didn't know whether to follow. Oh, better not, he thought. She'd sleep now and... Perhaps he would, too. But he was worried. Betty was becoming less and less like herself. At last Parker did sleep, to awaken shortly after daylight. He got a quick breakfast and took an early train to New York. When John Cartwright, a shrewd and kindly man, well advanced in years, arrived at his office, Alan Parker was right there waiting for him. Cartwright had shown real affection for the younger man, almost a paternal interest. He beamed, as usual, until he sat down with the new drawings. Slowly the smile faded from his face. He went over them twice, three times, and then he looked up. My boy, he said, did you do these? Yes. Do you know that you're turning a delicate and beautiful romance into a lascivious libel on the human race? <laughs> it's being done, replied Parker in a low voice. And I... I can't help myself. What do you mean by that? I mean that when I start to draw, Madeline, my hand produces that woman of Babylon. The writing is just as bad. It's full of snaring hints, double meanings. I'll destroy the stuff. I've been to see a psychoanalyst. Ah, he said thoughtfully. Perhaps you're tired, Alan. Why not take Betty on a cruise or something? There'll still be time for fall publication. I'm going to try everything possible. I'd rather be dead than to do work like this. When Parker left his friend, he was somewhat encouraged. After the first shot, Cartwright had been inclined to make light of the difficulty, and by the time Alan Parker reached Pine Hills, his stride had the usual swing and snap. He ran up the steps of his house and burst into the living room with a smile. Betty was sitting by one of the windows, her hands lying relaxed in her lap. She turned with a somber face toward her husband, and spoke before he had time to say a word of greeting. You knew that Cordelia Lyman died a short time ago, didn't you? Hey, what's that? exclaimed Parker, bewildered. Lyman? Oh, uh, the old lady down the street who left her money to found a home for aged spinsters. What about it? But she didn't leave her money to found a home for aged spinsters, Alan. She'd said she was going to do it, but, well, and everyone thought so. Her will was admitted to probate, or whatever they call it, yesterday. She left half a million, all she had, to Dr. Friedrich von Stein, to be used as he thinks best for the advancement of science. Good God. Parker stared at her. Why, I didn't know she knew him. 
He'd only been here a week or so when she died. Well, there isn't a flaw in the will, they say. Well, you can imagine that all oh, the Pine Hills is talking. Well, said Parker, philosophically, well, he's lucky. I hope he does something good with it. He will, replied Betty with conviction. He'll do many good things. Parker told her of his interview with Cartwright, but she seemed little interested. He didn't try to work that day, but after he put the offending drawings and manuscript out of sight, he wandered, read, smoked, and in the evening persuaded Betty to take a moonlight walk with him. They passed the house of Dr. Von Stein, from which came a faint humming that sounded like a dynamo. Across the street the church was alight for some service. Triumphant music drifted to them. The moon hung above the spire, with its cross outlined darkly against the brilliant sky. The windows were great jewels, and Betty drew a deep breath. Sometimes, Alan, she said, I feel like praying. Well, you are a beautiful prayer, whispered Parker. She walked close to him, holding his arm, and repeated softly, Are not two prayers a perfect strength? And shall I feel afraid? But that was the end of that mood. By the time they arrived home, Betty was again in that strange, aloof, and cold, and slightly hard woman of the past few days. Again, depression settled upon Alan Parker. The next morning, he breakfasted alone and went directly to the studio, without seeing Betty. Sun streamed into the room, and the pencil moved swiftly. For a brief time, Parker thought he was himself again, as Madeline grew upon the block of paper. But by the end, it was terrible. The last few strokes made her grotesque. This time the woman he'd drawn was not merely evil, she was a mocking parody of his heroine. He threw the drawing and pencil across the room. But no real artist can be discouraged short of death, so he went to work again and laboured until lunchtime. The results were no better, although they varied. Now it seemed that some malevolent power was playing with him, torturing him to the accompaniment of devilish laughter. He was haggard and actually stooped of body when he bathed his face and went down to the dining room. From across the table, Betty regarded him curiously. Fleming Proctor shot himself last night, she announced calmly. This morning they found him dead in his office. Proctor? You don't mean the president of the Pine Hills National Bank? Yes. The expression on Betty's face did not change. There was a note saying that he was sorry. It seems he'd made a large loan without security to an unknown person, and the bank examiner was coming today. Prater said he couldn't help what he did. The note was confused as though he were trying to tell something and just couldn't. I think his mind must have given way, particularly as they can't trace the loan although the money is undoubtedly gone. Wait, well, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Parker was stunned. He'd known Fleming Proctor and liked him. They met often at the country club. Oh, Proctor was honest and a fine businessman. Well, it did happen, Alan. Hmm. I'd like to know more about it. That would have been another case for Dr. Von Stein to take in hand. Perhaps, said Betty in a voice like ice. But I'm more interested in finding out how soon you're going to return to normal. Frankly, I'm beginning to get bored. Without a word, Parker rose and left the room. Never before had his wife hurt him like this. Doubly sensitive just now, he was suffering alone in the studio when the telephone rang. Dr. Von Stein speaking. Are you better, Mr. Parker? Worse. Much worse. Then come to my house this evening at nine. May I expect you, oh, and alone? Yeah. There was much Parker wanted to say, but he choked the words back. Yeah, I'll be there, and alone. And I shall be ready for you. Goodbye. 
Alan Parker hung up the phone. He didn't leave the studio again until evening. As Parker approached the house of Dr. Friedrich von Stein, he saw that the church was lighted as it had been the night before. In a clear sky the moon rode above the spire. He paused to let his glance sweep up and along the beautiful line that ran from earth to the slender cross. That was how he felt. He wanted to rise as that line rose, from cumbering earth to clarity and beauty. He mounted the steps and rang the bell. Dr. von Stein met him, with eyes and teeth agleam in the hallway light. Wearily, Parker stepped inside. His mood of the moment before was now fading. I go upstairs to my laboratory, if you please, said the doctor. It is best that I see you there, for it may be that you will need treatment. Oh, I need something, replied Parker as he went up a long flight of stairs. I'm in a bad way. Without answer, von Stein led him down a short corridor and held open a door. Alan Parker stepped into a room that bewildered him with its strange contrasts. At a glance he saw that nearly the whole upper floor of the building had been converted into one gigantic room. There were a big stone fireplace where burning driftwood sent up its many tinted flames. Heinrich stood rigidly at attention. Hans, the dachshund, crouched at his feet. When the dog started to meet Parker, a guttural command stopped him. Here there were bearskins on the floor, huge stuffed chairs, footrests, little tables, humidors, pipe racks, and all that one could desire for absolute comfort. Two German dueling swords were crossed above the mantel. But beyond this corner, everything was different. Parker saw the mass windows of reddish-purple glass. He saw apparatus for which he had no name, as well as some of the ordinary paraphernalia of the chemical laboratory. There was wiring everywhere, and a multitude of lighting fixtures. Utilitarian tables, desks, and chairs were placed about with mathematical precision. There were plates and strips of metal set into the glass smooth flooring, which was broken by depressions and elevations of unusual form. The most striking thing in the room was a huge copper bowl that hung inverted from the ceiling. In it, and extending down below the rim was what seemed to be a thick and stationary mist. It looked as though the bowl had been filled with a silver-gray mist and then turned bottom side up, but the cloud did not fall or float away. I can uh, think and speak best from my desk, von Stein was saying. Please sit down facing me in the chair which Heinrich will place for you, and then we will talk. Heinrich rolled one of the overstuffed chairs noiselessly to a position about six feet from the desk. Parker noticed a long metal strip in the floor between him and the doctor. Just then Hans wriggled forward and the artist scratched his ears, to be rewarded by a grateful tongue. Again a command from Heinrich brought the dog to heel, but the voice was not so gruff this time. Together they returned to the fireplace. Von Stein let his hands rest upon the desktop. The surface covered with levers, electric switches, push buttons, and contrivances the nature of which Parker could not guess. The doctor leaned forward. He threw over a switch. The lights in the room became less bright. He pressed a button. The dance macabre of Saint-Saëns floated weirdly upon the air, as though the music came from afar off. Um... Is that part of the treatment? asked Parker with a faint smile. It's not exactly cheering. Uh, merely an idiosyncrasy of mine, answered von Stein, showing his teeth. Before anything is done I must, in order to aid the receptivity of your mind, go a little further with the explanation of certain things which I mentioned the other day. I promise not to bore you, but more than that, Mr. Parker, I promise that you will be more interested than you have ever been in anything else. It seemed to Parker that there was something sinister in the manner and speech of Dr. Von Stein. The dance of death. Did that music have a meaning? <laughs> Impossible. It was only his sick mind that was allowing such thoughts to come to him. Well, um, anything that will help, he murmured. You have noticed that copper bowl? 
Von Stein did not wait for a reply. The misty appearance inside and underneath it is given by thousands upon thousands of minute platinum wires. When it is in use, a slight electrical current is passed through it, varying in power according to the rate of vibration needed. That instrument, my dear sir, is a transmitter of thought. I may call it the uh, microphone of the mind. I can tune in on any mind in the world by experimenting up and down the vibration range to determine the susceptibility of the particular person. The human mind does not need an amplifier, as the radio receiving set does. Rather, it acts as its own amplifier, that is, once after having received the thought. I invented one, though, just to prove that it could be done. I equipped Heinrich with it, and in half an hour, by suggestion, reduced him to his present state of docile stupidity. I have. Mr. Parker, the means of moving people to do my bidding. Von Stein stopped abruptly, as overemphasis and to allow his astounding statements to take effect. Parker sat stunned, struggling to grasp all the implications of what he'd just heard. Suddenly they became clear. He saw events in order and in relation to each other. So that's how it was with Cordelia Lyman, he cried hoarsely, leaning forward. And it was you who had that money from Fleming Proctor. Oh, you are not unintelligent, remarked Dr. Von Stein. Better that science should have the Lyman money than a few old women of no particular use. As for Proctor, he was a fool. I would have protected him. And my pictures... My book. I can cure you, Mr. Parker, if I choose. And anyone is at the mercy of this man, groaned Parker. Not absolutely, I am sorry to say, replied the doctor. The action of thought on the human consciousness is exactly like that of a sound on the tuning fork. When the mind is tuned right, or say for illustration, the lower vibrations are not picked up out of the ether. But as few minds are tuned right, and as all vary from time to time, I am practically omnipotent. You... you change the nature of my wife. Parker was getting a hold of himself again and could speak with a degree of calmness. Well, that's a worse crime than the one you've committed against me directly. Mr. Parker said the doctor impressively. You are in a web. I am the spider, you are the fly. I don't particularly desire to hurt you, but I do want your wife. This is the crux of the matter. She is the woman to share my triumphs, and already I have aroused her interest. Give her up, and you will continue your work as before. Refuse and you will lose her just as certainly as though you give her to me. For, my dear sir, you will be insane in less than a month from now. I promise you that. Alan Parker was not one to indulge in melodrama. For a long moment he sat looking into the black eyes of Von Stein. And then he spoke carefully. If my wife of her own will loved you and wanted freedom, I'd let her go. But this is a kind of hypnosis, and it's diabolical. Who but the devil was the father of magic? asked the doctor cheerfully. Hypnosis is unconsciously based on a scientific principle which I have mastered. Repeated advertising of a toothbrush or a box of crackers is mild mental suggestion. Hypnosis, if you will. Now, my dear fellow, be sensible. No, <sighs> growled Parker. Von Stein laughed. He moved a lever upon a dial and a sheet of blue flame quivered between them. With another movement of the lever, it vanished. I could destroy you instantly, he said, and completely, and no one could prove a crime. I shall not do it, though. I have no time to be bothered with investigations. Think of the fate I promised you. Think and I have no doubt you will give her up. Never. I won't. 
Harker wiped cold drops from his forehead, but the doctor frowned thoughtfully. I'll intensify her desire to come here tonight, he said. She herself will persuade you. Parker set his fingers into the arms of his chair as von Stein rose and walked to the copper bowl. He now stood directly under it and put on goggles with shields fitting close to his feet. At the pressure of his foot, a table-like affair rose from the floor in front of him. This, like the desk, was equipped with numerous dials, buttons and levers. Von Stein started to manipulate them. The great cap of copper descended until his head was enveloped by the mist of platinum wires. A faint humming grew in the room, and a tiny bell tinkled. Ah, the connection is made, murmured Von Stein. He lifted a hand for silence. Then his fingers leaped among the gadgets on the table. After that came a brief period, measured by seconds, of immobility. Then the table sank from view, the copper bowl lifted, and Dr. Von Stein went back to his chair. Ah, she will be here shortly, he said. If that does not change your mind. He then shrugged. Parker knew what that shrug meant. He searched his mind for a plan and found none. Better to die fighting than yield, or risk the vengeance of Friedrich Von Stein. If he could get the doctor away from the desk where he controlled the blue-white flame, there might be a chance to do something. Von Stein was by far the larger man, but Parker had been an athlete all of his life. So if... So that mass of copper and platinum, he said tentatively, that'll make you the master of the world? My brain, my intelligence has made me master of the world corrected von Stein proudly. He was touched in the right spot now. You have not seen it all yet. He sprang up and went to one of the tables. From his pocket he took a piece of paper and crumbled it into a ball while, with the other hand, he made some electrical connections to a plate of metal set into the surface of the table. Next he placed the wad of paper on the plate. Then, standing at arm's length from the apparatus, he pressed a button. Instantly, the paper disappeared behind a screen of the colours of the spectrum, from red to violet. The banded colours were there for a minute fraction of a second, and then there was nothing where the paper had been on the plate. Von Stein smiled as he stepped away from the table. The electron is formed by the crossing of two lines of force, he said, and the interaction of positive and negative polarity. The electron is a stress in the ether, nothing more, but it is the stuff of which all matter is made. Thought is vibration in one dimension, matter in two. You've just seen me untie the knot, dissociate the electrons, as you will. In plain language, I have caused matter to vanish utterly. That paper is not burned up. No, it no longer exists in any form. The earth upon which we stand, Parker, can be dissolved like mist before the sun. Appalled as he was at this man who boasted and made good on his terrible boasts, Alan Parker had not forgotten the purpose that was in him. Now was his chance, while von Stein stood smiling triumphantly between the table and desk. Parker shot from his chair with the speed of utter desperation. He fainted and drove a vicious uppercut to the jaw of Dr. Friedrich von Stein. The doctor reeled, but he did not go down. His fists swung. But Parker found him to be no boxer, and beat a tattoo upon his midriff. Von Stein began to slump, and then two thick muscled arms closed around the artist from behind, and he was lifted clear of the floor. He kicked, tried to turn, but it was useless. The doctor recovered himself, and his eyes blazed in fury. Put him in the chair, Heinrich, he roared. For this I will show you what I can do, Herr Parker. At that instant, little Hans, who had been yelping on the edge of the battle, suddenly dashed in. He leaped for the throat of von Stein, and the doctor kicked him brutally. A shriek of agony from Hans loosened the arms of Heinrich, though, and Parker got his footing again. 
he saw the clumsy serving man spring forward and gather his dog up to his chest. So again, Parker rushed for his enemy. It was clear now that von Stein was cut off from the controls he wanted, and without Heinrich he could no longer master Parker in a fight. For an instant, he stood baffled. Then he retreated the length of the room, taking what blows he couldn't beat off. He staggered upon a plate of metal set in the floor, righted himself, and failed in an attempt to catch hold of Parker. Suddenly he bowed in the direction of the distant doorway. Alan turned. It was Betty. She was coming down the room, staring and breathless. Leben Sie wohl, cried von Stein. Farewell, madam. I should like to take you with me. A great flash of colours from the spectrum sent Parker reeling back. Dr. Friedrich von Stein had gone the way of the crumpled ball of paper. There was a long moment of silence, and Alan Parker found his wife in his arms, clinging to him. Are not two prayers of perfect strength? she murmured, sobbing gently against his heart. The Earthman's Burden. Denny O'Lear was playing blackjack when the colonels orderly found him. He hastily buttoned his tunic and, in a few minutes, alert and very military, was standing at attention in the little office on the ground floor of the Denver IFP barracks. His swanky blue uniform fitted without a wrinkle. His little round skull cap was perched at the regulation angle. O'Lear, said the colonel. They're having a little trouble at the Blue River Station, Mercury. Trouble? Oh, oh, O'Lear said placidly. The colonel looked him over. He saw a man past his first youth, thirty-five, possibly forty. O'Lear was well knit, sandy-haired, not over five feet six inches in height. His hair was close-cropped, his features phlegmatic, his eyes a light blue with thick, short, light-coloured lashes. His teeth excellent. The scar, dead white on a brown cheekbone, was a reminder of an encounter with one of the numerous Saurians of Venus. I'm sending you, explained the colonel, because you're more experienced and not like some of these kids, always spoiling for a fight. There's something strange about this affair. Moronis factor of the Blue River Post, reports that his assistant has disappeared, vanished, simply gone. But only three months ago, the former factor, Ramonas was his assistant, disappeared too. No hide, no hair of him. Moronis reported to the company the Mercurian trading concession, and they called me. Something, they think, is definitely rotten. Oh, yes, sir. I guess I needn't tell you, the colonel went on, that you have to uh, use tact. People don't seem to appreciate the falls. What with the lousy politicians begrudging every cent we get, and a bunch of suspicious foreign powers afraid we'll get too good. Yeah, I know. Tact. That's my motto. No rough stuff. He saluted, turned on his heel. Hey, just a minute. The colonel had arisen. He was a fine, ascetic type of man, and he held out his hand. Goodbye, O'Lear. Watch yourself. When O'Lear had taken his matter-of-fact departure, the colonel ran his fingers through his widening hair. In the past several months, he had sent five of his best men on dangerous missions, missions requiring tact, courage, and, so it seemed, very much luck. And only two of the five had come back. In those days, the interplanetary flying police did not enjoy the tremendous prestige it does now. The mere presence of a member of the force is enough, in these humdrum days of interplanetary law and order, to quell the most serious disturbance anywhere in the solar system. But it was not always thus. This astounding prestige had to be earned with blood and courage, in many a desperate and lonely battle. It had to be snatched from the dripping jaws of death. O'Lear checked over his flying ovoid, got his bearings from the port astronomer, 
said his coordinate navigator, and shoved off. Two weeks later, he plunged into the thick, misty atmosphere on the dark side of Mercury. Ancient astronomers had long suspected that Mercury always presented the same side to the Sun, but they were ignorant that the little planet had water and air. Its sunward side is a dreary, sterile, hot and hostile desert. Its dark side is warm and humid, and resembles to some extent the better-known jungles and swamps of Venus. But it has a favoured belt, some hundreds of miles wide around its equator, where the enormous sun stays perpetually in one spot on the horizon. Sunward is the blinding glare of the desert, and on the dark side, enormous banks of lowering clouds. On the dark margin of this belt are the ring storms, violent thunderstorms that never cease. They are the source of the mighty rivers which irrigate the tropical habitable belt and plunge out, boiling far into the desert. O'Lear's little ship passed through the ring storms, and he didn't take over the controls until he recognized the familiar mark of the trading company, a blue comet on the aluminum roof of one of the larger buildings. Visibility was good that day. But despite the unusual clarity of the atmosphere, there was a suggestion of the sinister about the lifeless scene. The vast, irresistible river. The riotously coloured jungle roof. The vastness of nature dwarfed man's puny work. One horizon flashed incessantly with livid lightning. The other was one blinding blaze of the nearby sun. And almost lost below in the savage landscape was man's symbol of possession a few metal sheds in a clear, fenced space of a few acres. O'Lear cautiously checked speed, skimmed over the turbid surface of the great river, and set her down on the ground within the compound. With his pencil-like ray tube in his hand, he stepped out of the hatchway. A Mercurian native came out of the residence, his hands together in the peace sign. For the benefit of Earth lovers whose only knowledge of Mercury is derived from the teleview screen, it should be explained that Mercurians are not human, even if they do slightly resemble us. When they hatch from eggs, pass one life phase as frog-like creatures in their rivers, and in the adult stage turn more human in appearance. But their skin remains green and fish belly white. There's no hair on their warty heads, and their eyes have no lids, and have a particular dead, staring look when they sleep. And they carry a peculiar, fishy odour with them at all times. This Mercurian looked at O'Lear seemingly without interest. Where is Moronas? the officer inquired. Moronas, the native piped in English. Inside, he's busy. All right, I'm coming in. He's busy? <laughs> yeah, move over. Though the native was a good six inches taller than O'Lear, he stepped aside when the officer pushed him. Men and Mercurians had a way of doing that when they looked into those colourless eyes. They were not as phlegmatic as the face. Moronis was sitting in his office. Well, I'm here, O'Lear announced, helping himself to a chair. Yes, he said sourly. Who invited you? O'Lear looked at the factor levelly, appraising him. A big, fat man, but the fat was well distributed. Saturnine face, dark hair, dark and bristly beard. The kind that thrived where other men became weak and fever-ridden. Also to judge by his present appearance, an unpleasant companion and a nasty enemy. Well, I don't see what difference it makes to you, Olea answered in his own good time. But the company invited me. Ah, oh, they would, Moronis growled. His eyes flickered to the door, and, quick as a cat, O'Lear leapt to one side, his ray pencil in his hand. Well, Moronis hadn't moved. In the door stood the native, motionless and without expression. Moronis laughed nastily. <sighs> kind of jumpy, eh? What is it, Nargil? Nargil burst into a burbling succession of native phrases, which O'Lear had some difficulty following. Oh, uh, Nargil wants you to move your ship into one of the sheds, but the activator key's gone. Yeah, I know, O'Lear assented casually. I've got it. 
Leave the ship until I get ready, and I'll put it away. Like, get out and argue. The native hesitated. Then, on the lift of Moroni's eyebrows, he departed. O'Lear shifted a chair so that he could watch both Moroni's in the door. He reopened the conversation easily. Well, um, we understand each other. You don't want me here, and I'm here. So what are you going to do about it? Moroni's flushed. He struggled to keep his temper down. What do you want to know? What happened to the factor who was here before you? I don't know. The Translucine wasn't coming in like it should. Samus went out into the jungle for a palaver with the chiefs to find out why, and he didn't come back. You didn't find out where he went. I just told you, Marona said impatiently. He went out to see the native chiefs. Alone? Of course alone. There are only two of us Earthmen here. Oh, I couldn't abandon this post to the Wileys, could we? Not that it would make much difference. Well, except for Nargil. None will come near. And, um, you never heard of him again? No, damn it, no. Say, didn't they have any dumber strappers around than you? I told you once, I'll tell you again. I never saw hide nor hair of him after that. All right, all right. Ole regarded Moronis placidly. And so you took the job of Factor and radioed for an assistant. And when the assistant came, he disappeared too. Moronis grunted. He went out to get acquainted with the country and didn't come back. Ole masked his close scrutiny of the Factor under his idle and expressionless gaze. He wasn't ready to jump to the conclusion that Moronis' uneasiness sprang from a sense of guilt. Guilty or not, he had a right to feel uneasy. The man would be dense indeed if he didn't realize he was in line for suspicion, and he didn't look dense. Indeed, he was obviously a shrewd character. Let me see your Lucine. Moronis rose. Despite his bulk, he stepped nimbly. He had the nimbleness of a Saturnian bear, which is great, as some of the earlier explorers learned to their dismay. That's the first sensible question you've asked, Moronis snorted. Take a look at our Lucene. Have a good look. He led the way across the compound, waved his hand before the door of a strongly built shed in a swift, definite combination, and the door opened, revealing the interior. He waved him in invitingly. Well, uh, you go first, Olea said. With a sneer, Moronis stepped in. Ah, you're safe, boy, you're safe. Olea looked at the small pile on the floor in astonishment. Instead of the beautiful, semi-transparent chips of translucine, the dried sap of a Mercurian tree which is invaluable to the world as the source of an unfailing cancer cure, well, there were only a few dirty, dried-up shavings, hardly worth shipping back to Earth for refining. The full significance of the affair began to dawn on the officer. The translucine trees grew only in this favoured section of Mercury, and the Earth Company had a monopoly on the entire supply. Justly, for only Earth was cancer known, and it was on the increase. That small, almost useless pile on the floor connoted a terrible drug famine for the human race. Moronez's smile might have been a grin of satisfaction at Olea's question. Is that all you've brought since the last freighter was here? It is, he replied. The last load went off six months ago, and this here shed should be full to the eaves. Oh, there'll be hell to pay. Well, it may not be tactful, Ole remarked, but if you've got your takings cashed away somewhere to hold up the earth for a big ransom, you'd better come across right now. You can't get away with that, fellow. You should have close to six million dollars worth of it, and you can't get away. You just can't. At this, Moronis controlled his anger with some effort. Ah, like any dumb strapper, you've made your mind up, ain't you? Oh, go ahead. Get something on me. Here I was, almost set to give you a lead that might get you somewhere. And you're coming off, well, trying to make out I stole the Lucine and killed those two fellas, eh? Go ahead. Get something on me. 
but not on company grounds, no. You're leaving now. And with that, he made a lunge at the officer, quite beside himself with rage. O'Lear could have burnt him down, but he was far too experienced for such an amateurish trick. Instead, he ducked and evade Moronis's blow, but the big man was as agile as a panther. In midair, so it seemed, he changed his direction of attack. The big fist swept downward, striking O'Lear's head a glancing blow. But the men of the force have always been fighters, whatever their shortcomings as diplomats. O'Lear countered with a strong right to the body, thudding solidly, for Moronis's softness did not go far below the surface. The factor whirled instantly, but not quite fast enough to bar the door. O'Lear was out and inside his ship in a few seconds, slamming the hat. Ah, oh, tact, he grinned to himself, inserting the activator key. Ah, oh, tact is what a fella needs. The little space flyer shot aloft until the tiny figure of the factor stopped shaking its fist and entered the residence. The post had a flyer of its own, of course, but Moronis was too wise to use it in pursuit. O'Lear considered what was best to do. Well, of course, he could have placed Moronis under arrest. Still could, but that wouldn't solve the mystery of the two deaths and the missing Lucine. If the choleric factor was really guilty of the crimes, it'd be better to let him go his way in the hope that he'd betray himself. O'Lear regretted that he'd not kept his tongue under closer curb, but there was no use regretting. Well, perhaps, after all, he ought to turn back to Pump Moronis for some helpful information. His mind made up. He descended again until he was hovering a few feet from the ground. Moronis, he called. Moronis. He held the hatch open. Moronis came to the door of the residence. He had a tube in his hand, a long-range weapon. Moronis, O'Lear declared pompously, I place you under arrest. Well, the effect was instantaneous. Moronis lifted the tube, and a glimmering, iridescent beam sprang out. The ship was up and away in a second, lurching and shivering uncomfortably every time the beam struck it in its upward flight. A good few seconds continued impingement, but a miss is as good as a light year. Miles high, O'Lear looked into his telens. Moronis had laid aside his tube and was working with an instrument like a twin transit plotting the ship's course naturally. O'Lear set his course for the Earth, and kept on it for a good twenty-four hours. Moronis, if he was still watching him, would think he'd gone back for reinforcements. Of course, such an assumption would be incredible now, but that was before the IFP had achieved its present tremendous reputation. Beyond observation range, O'Lear curved back toward Mercury again, was almost inside its atmosphere when he made a discovery that caused him to lose for a moment his natural indifference, and to clamp his jaws in anger. The current oxygen tank had become empty, and when he removed it from the rack and put in a new one, he found that someone had let out all of his essential gas. The valve of every one of his spare tanks had been opened. Had O'Lear actually continued on his way to Earth, he would have perished miserably of suffocation long before he could have returned to the Mercurian atmosphere. The officer whistled tunelessly through his teeth as he considered this fact. The visibility was by this time normal, or well, that is, so poor it would not have been possible to land very close to the trading station. But O'Lear was taking no chances, and came down a good three Earth miles away. The egg-shaped hull sank through the glossy, brilliant treetops, through twisted vines, and was buried in the dank gloom of the jungle. Here it might remain hidden for a hundred years. The twilight of the jungle was almost darkness. There were no landmarks, but O'Lear made a few small inconspicuous marks on the trees with his knife until he came to an outcropping of rock. He'd noticed the scar-like white of its slashing through the jungle from the air, and used it as a guide to direct his stealthy return to the trading post. His belt chronometer told him it would be about time for Moronis to get up from his uh, night's sleep. A little discreet observation might tell much. 
long before he reached the compound. O'Lear heard the rushing of the great blue river in its headlong plunge to the corrosive heat of the desert. And then, through the mists, he glimpsed the white metal walls of the company's sheds. He climbed a tree and for a long time watched patiently, lying prone on a limb. Blood-sucking insects tortured him, and flat tree lice resembling discs with legs crawled over him inquisitively. O'Lear tolerated them with stoic indifference until at last his patience was rewarded. Morones was coming out of the compound. He was alone and obviously did not suspect that he was being watched, but he stepped out briskly. Once in the jungle, he walked even faster, watching out warily for the panther-like carnivora that were the most dangerous to man on Mercury. O'Lear shinned to the ground and followed cautiously. Morones had his ray tube with him, as any traveller in these jungles should. O'Lear could and did draw fast, but a dead trader would be valueless to him in this investigation. So he stalked him with every faculty strained to maintain complete silence. Often, in occasional clearings where the brown darkness grew less, he had to grovel on the slimy ground, picking up large bacteria that could be seen with a naked eye, and which left tiny, festering red marks on his skin. The trader seemed to be heading for the higher ground, for the path led ever upward, though not far from the tossing waters of the river. And then, suddenly, he disappeared. O'Lear didn't immediately hurry after him. A canny fugitive, catching sight of his pursuer, might suddenly drop to the ground and squirm to the side of the trail, there to wait and catch his pursuer as he passed. So O'Lear sidled into the all but impenetrable underbrush and slowly, with infinite caution, wormed his way along. Presently he came to the little rise of ground where Moronis had disappeared. But a painstaking search did not reveal the fact. There were, however, a number of other trails that joined the very faint trail that he had been following. And now there was a well-defined track which continued to lead upward. With a grimace of disgust, O'Lear again plunged into the odorous underbrush and travelled parallel to the trail. Uh, that was well he did so, for several Mercurians passed swiftly, intent, so it seemed, in answering to a shrill call that at times came faintly to the ear. They carried slender spears. Several more Mercurians passed. The growth was thinning out, and O'Lear did not dare to proceed further. However, from his hiding place he could discern a number of irregular cave openings, apparently leading downward. They were apparently the entrances to one of the native cavern colonies, or perhaps a meeting place. No earthman had ever entered one, but it was thought that they had underground openings into the river. As the cave openings were obviously natural, O'Lear conjectured that there might be others that were not used. After an anxious search he found one, narrow and irregular, well hidden under the broad glossy leaves of some uncatalogued vegetation. As it showed no evidence of use, O'Lear unhesitatingly slid down into it. It was very narrow and irregular, so that often he was barely able to squeeze through. The roots of trees choked the passage for a dozen feet or so, requiring the vigorous use of a knife. Bathed in sweat, his uniform a filthy mass of rags, O'Lear at last saw light. The passage ended abruptly near the roof of a large natural cavern. Lights glistened on stalactites which cut off O'Lear's larger view, and voices came from below. By craning his neck, the officer could look between the pendant icicles of rock and see a fire burning on a huge oblong block of stone. Figures were sitting on the floor around this block, hundreds of Mercurians. The leaping flames made their white and green faces and bodies look frog-like and less human than usual. But the figure that dominated the whole assemblage, both by its own hugeness and the magnetic power that flowed from it, was not of Mercury, but of Pluto. Ah, for the benefit of those who have never seen a stuffed Plutonian in our museums, and they are very rare, let me refer you to the pious books still to be found in ancient library collections. Ah, the ancients personified their fears and hates in a being they called 
the devil. The resemblance between the devil of their imagination and a plutonian is really astounding. Horns, hooves, tail, almost to the smallest detail, the resemblance is clearly there. Our philosophers have written books on the coincidence in appearance of the ancient devil and the modern decadent plutonians. The plutonians were once numerous and far advanced in science, and no doubt they called on the earth many times in prehistoric days, and the so-called devil was a true picture of those vicious invaders, who were somewhat less human than usually portrayed. What was once classed as superstition was therefore a true racial memory. Long before our ancestors came out of their caves to build houses, plutonians had mastered interplanetary travel, only to forget the secret until human ingenuity should reveal it once more. The modern plutonian in that dank cave was over ten feet tall, and it's easy to see why he dominated the assemblage. His black visage was set in an evil smile, his ebony body glistened in the firelight. He held a three-pronged spear in one hand and sat on a pile of rocks, a sort of rough throne, so that he towered magnificently above all others. He spoke the Mercurian language, although the liquid intonations came harshly from his sneering lips. Ah, ye assembled frog folk, that ye may hear the decision of your thinking ones, he asked. A respectful, peeping chorus signified assent. But in that there was a hint of unrest, even of fear. Speak, ye thinking one, your commands. Hear me first. An old Mercurian, unusually tall, faded and dry-looking, his thick hide wrinkled like crushed leather, rose slowly to his feet and stepped before the oblong stone. His back was to the Plutonian, his face to the crescent of chiefs. Ah, oh, the wise one! A twittering murmur went around the assemblage. Hear the old wise one! My people, I like this not, began the ancient. The lords of the Green Star have dealt with us fairly. Each phase they have brought us the things we wanted. He touched his spear and a few gaudy ornaments on his otherwise naked body. In exchange for the worthless white sap of our trees. If we longer offend the lords of the Green Star. A raucous laugh interrupted the Mercurian's feeble voice, and it echoed eerily from the walls of the chamber. Valueless, you call the white sap, sneered the Plutonian. You hear me. That sap you call valueless is dearer than life itself to the lords of the Green Star, for they are afflicted in great numbers with a stinking death they call cancer. It destroys their vitals, and nothing, nothing in this broad universe can help save them, save this white sap that you give them. In your hands you have the power to bring the proud lords of the Green Star to their knees. They would fill this chamber many times with the most priceless treasures for the sap you give them so freely. Withhold the sap, and your thinking ones may go to the Green Star itself to rule over its lords. They are desperate. Their emissaries may even now be on the way to beg your pleasure. Speak, thinking ones. Would you not rule the Green Star? But the chiefs failed to become enthused. One of them rose and addressed the Plutonian. O oh Lord of the Outer Orbit, for near one full phase have you dwelt among us, and well should you know we have no desire for conquest. We fear to go to the Green Star to rule. Then let me rule for you, exclaimed the Plutonian instantly. My brothers will abide with you as your guests. She'll see that you receive a fair reward for the white sap, and I'll convey your commands to the lords of the Green Star. To this the old wise one raised his withered hands, so that the uncertain twittering of voices which followed the Plutonian suggestion subsided. My children, piped the feeble old voice, the Black Lord has spoken cunning words, but they are false. It's plain to see he desires to rule the Green Star, and our welfare does not concern him. If so, it be that the white sap is of great value to the lords of the Green Star, 
it is still of no value to us. And if the gifts they bring us are of no value to them, they are dear to us. The Plutonian sneered at this, dearer than the paste of strange dreams. A startled hush fell among the assembled Mercurians. They looked guiltily at one another, avoiding the eyes of the old wise one. What is this? he shrilled, turning furiously to the Plutonian. Have you brought the paste of evil to Arabold, knowing well the strict prescription of our tribe? Fool, your death is now upon you. But the Plutonian only grinned and spread his glistening black hands in a careless gesture. High overhead, peering through the stalactites, O'Lear instantly understood the Plutonian's strange power, the paste of strange dreams, a fearsome narcotic of that far-swinging dark planet. More insidious and devastating than any drug ever produced on Earth, it had wrought frightful havoc among many solar races. The Earth man had opened the lanes, broken the age-old barriers of distance, so that the harpies of evil could traffic their poison from planet to planet. And so the paste of strange dreams was added to the Earthman's burden. Seize him, the evil one, shrieked the old chief. But the Mercurian sat sullen and silent, and the Plutonian sneered. Finally, one of the chiefs arose, and with an effort faced the old wise one and said, The strange dreams are dearer to us than all else. Do as he says. The piping voices rose in eager acclamation, but the old wise one held up his claws, waiting until silence returned. Wait, wait, before you commit this folly, hear the green star man. Many times has he demanded audience. Let him come in. It is not permitted, demurred one of the chiefs. You permitted this being of evil to enter. Let him enter also. He is in the outer chambers now, one of the guards spoke. His face is like the centre of a ringstorm. Let him enter. And so Moronis strode into the room angrily. Blinded by the fire after the darkness of the antechambers, he didn't at first see the Plutonian. He strode up to the ancient chief and glared at him. Does the old wise one learn wisdom at last? he rasped. The ancient shrank away from him, as did the nearer of the lesser chiefs. The old wise one thinks less of his wisdom, he replied wearily. Behold! He pointed to the enthroned Plutonian. Moroni started. His hand flashed to his side and came away empty. Deaf fingers had extracted his ray tube. But he was a man of courage, and never could it be said to his shame that an Earthman cringed in the sight of lesser races. So, it's you, my friend, he snarled in English. The Plutonian, accomplished linguist, replied, As you see, oh, you don't look very happy, Mr. Moronis. Moronis regarded him impassively, his eyes frosty. Uh, that explains everything, he said at last with cold deliberation. First Samus, then Boyd. Gonna finish me next, I suppose. The Plutonian twisted the end of an eyebrow and smiled. Interested in them? What do you do with their bodies? The Plutonian jerked his thumb carelessly. Ah, the river you call the Blue is swift and deep. But before you follow them, there is certain information I wish to get from you. Where is the soldier who came to visit you? A crafty light came into Moronis' face. Oh, he's not far from here, and waiting for me. O'Lear, in his cramped hiding place, could not help feeling a warm glow of admiration for Moronis' nerve, because Moronis thought him well on his way to Earth. Nargil, what did your master do with the visitor? Drove him back to the Green Star, Nargil said promptly. And the oxygen tanks, did you empty them? I let them hiss. Nargil's grin was sharkish. 
News to you, eh, Moronis? Your office as corpse has probably dropped into the sun by this time. Tell me, why did you drive him off? Moronis sagged perceptibly. To gain a little more time, he said truthfully, I knew I should be blamed and ruined for life. I didn't know you were here, damn you. I hope to get this mess with the natives straightened up before he'd come back with reinforcements. Yes, well, you owe some months of life already. Your presence here has been more or less embarrassing, but I had to let you live or I'd have the whole IFP here to investigate. Now that you've failed in keeping them from getting interested, you may do me one more service. The black giant then grinned. I often wondered at the Earthmen's prestige all over the solar system. Even tonight, soft and helpless as you are, these natives fear you. You will, therefore, be an object lesson in the helplessness of Earthmen. Moronis was pale but courageous. With contempt in every line of him, he watched some of the less frightened chiefs at the command of the Plutonian push aside some of the blazing blocks of fungus on the stone to make room for his body. At last he raised his hand. Frogfolk, he cried, if you do this thing, the laws of the Green Star will come. They'll come with fires hotter than the sun, and they'll blast your rivers with a power greater than the thunder of the ringstorms. They'll fill your caves with a purple smoke that turns your bones to water. Shrill cries of fear almost drowned out his words. All the Mercurians had seen evidence of the dreadful power of the Earthmen. They began milling around, and then stood rooted by the roar of the Plutonian's voice. Lies, all oh, lies, he bellowed. See, they are weak as egglets. He stepped down, picked Moronis up by one shoulder, and held him dangling high over the heads of all. Moronis clawed and tore at the brawny arm, but he made a ludicrous picture. Soon the simple natives made a sniffling sound of mirth, and the Plutonian, satisfied at last, set him down again. He tells the truth, the old wise one had climbed to the top of the stone block. The lords of the Green Star have their power, not in their bodies, but it is great. It's greater far than the frog folk. It's greater than the lords of the outer orbit. Oh, they will come, even as the surly one has said, and great shall be our sorrow. It's not too late yet. Release him. Release him and deliver to him the white sap. Seize this evil one. And so the feeble, fickle minds were being swayed again. In a gust of impatience, the Plutonian stepped down, seized the aged chief's skinny body in his great black hands, and snapped him in two. There was a rough tearing of cords and tissue, and the two halves fell into the fire. Oh, for an instant the Mercurians were stunned. Then some of them vented hissing sounds of rage, while others prostrated themselves on the floor. The black giant watched them narrowly for a moment, then turned his attention back to Moronis. He seized him by the arm and drew him slowly and irresistibly to him. The murder of the old wise one had been done so quickly that Olir was unable to prevent it. Had he been able to use his ray weapon, he could have burned the Plutonian down, but it had been bent at one of the narrow turns of the crevice he'd come down. And so it was that the need for extreme lightness in weapons was rather overdone in those early times, and just a little rough handling made them useless. So now Olir, weaponless except for the service knight at his belt, began the hazardous undertaking of climbing among the stalactites to a position approximately above the Plutonian's head. This job required judgment. Some of the stone masses were insecurely anchored and would crash down at the slightest touch. Some were spaced so closely together he couldn't get between them, but others were so far apart it was difficult to get from one to another. Yet he made it somehow, and, unnoticed, for all eyes were being turned on the tense drama being enacted below. From almost directly overhead, he saw Moronas being drawn upward. You saw, the Plutonian was saying triumphantly in Mercurian, you saw me unmake your old fool, 
Now you'll see that a lord of the Green Star is even softer, even weaker. Moronus, in that pitiless grasp, turned his face to the hateful, grinning visage above him. In his last extremity, he was still angry. You devil! Moronis shouted. You may murder me, but they'll get you. They will get you. Who'll get me? The Plutonian purred silkily, deferring the pleasure of the kill for another moment. Moronis was having trouble with his breathing. His face was red, lolling from side to side. His eyes rolled in agony. But suddenly, he saw Olea. Unbelieving, he relaxed. Oh, I'm seeing things, he breathed. Oh, get me, persisted the Plutonian, applying a little more pleasure. The IFP, Moronis gasped. Oh, you little son of a... O'Lear thought, and then he jumped. He landed a straddle the neck of the Plutonian, which was almost like forking a horse. One brawny arm seized a horn, the other, with a lightning-swift dart, brought the point of the long service knife to the pulsating black throat. Put him down, O'Lear spoke in the great pointed ear. Easy now. Back on his feet, Moronis began bellowing at the Mercurians. Utterly demoralized, they fled pell-mell. But Moronis came back and said, oh, Nothing to tie him up with. That's all right, O'Lear replied, studiously keeping the knife point at exactly the right place. I'll ride him in. Now you get going and be tactful when you go through the door, or this sticker of mine might slip. With extreme care, the Plutonian did exactly as O'Lear had ordered him to. It was necessary to radio for one of the larger patrol ships to take O'Lear's enormous prisoner back to Earth for his trial. The officer testified, of course, and the Plutonian was duly sentenced to death for the murder of the old Mercurian. Execution by dehydration was decreed, so that the body would be uninjured for scientific study, and today it's considered one of the finest specimens extant. In his testimony, however, O'Lear so minimized his own connection with the case that he received no public recognition. It wasn't until some months afterward, when Moronis, on leave, rode back with a shipload of Translucine, that the whole story came out, emphatically and profanely. O'Lear finally consented to speak a few words for the Telephoto News Corporation, and as he stepped off the little platform, deferential hands tried to push him back. "'You haven't told them who you are,' protested the announcer. "'Give them your name and rank.' "'Ah, oh, they don't have to do that,' O'Lear rejoined, keeping on going. "'They know it's one of the force, and that's all they have to know. "'Besides,' There's a blackjack game going on, and I'm losing money every minute I'm out of it. The Terrible Tentacles of L-472 By Sewell Peasley Wright Commander John Hansen of the Special Patrol Service records another of his thrilling interplanetary assignments. Oh, it was a big mistake. I shouldn't have done it. By birth, by instinct, by training, by habit, I am a man of action. Or, oh, well, I was. Strange that an old man cannot remember that he's no longer young. It was a mistake for me to mention that I'd recorded for the archives of the Council the history of a certain activity of the Special Patrol, a bit of secret history which may not be mentioned here, and now they insist, and by they I refer to the chiefs of the Special Patrol Service, that I write of other achievements of the service, other adventures worthy of note. Perhaps that's the penalty of becoming old. From commander of the Booty, one of the greatest of the Special Patrol ships, to the duties of recording ancient history for younger men to read and dream about. Well, that's a shrewd blow to one's pride. But if I can, in some small way, add luster to the record of my service, 
It will be a fitting task for a man grown old and grey in that service. Work for hands too weak and palsied for sterner duties. But I shall tell my stories in my own way. After all, they are my stories. And I shall tell the stories that appeal to me most. The universe has had enough and too much of dry history. These shall be adventurous tales to make the blood of the young man who reads them run a trifle faster and perhaps the blood of the old man who writes them. This, the first, shall be the story of the star L-472. Oh, you know it today as Ibit, port of call for interplanetary ships and the source of Okrite for the universe. But to me it will always be L-472, the world of terrible tentacles. Now my story begins nearly a hundred years ago, reckoned in terms of Earth time, which is proper since I am a native of Earth, when I was a young man. I was a sub-commander at the time of the Khalid, one of the early ships of the Space Patrol. We had been called to Xenia on special orders, and Commander Jameson, after an absence of some two hours, returned to the Khalid with his face shining, one of his rare smiles telling me in advance that he had news, and good news. He hurried me up to the deserted navigating room and waved me to a seat. Hanson, he said, I am glad to be the first to congratulate you. You are now Commander John Hanson of the Special Patrol Ship Carlet. Sir, I gasped, do you mean... His smile broadened, and the breast pocket of the trim blue and silver uniform of our service, he drew a long, crackling paper. Your commission said. I'm taking over the Borellis. It was my turn to extend congratulations then. The Borellis was the newest and greatest ship of the service. We shook hands, that ancient gesture of good fellowship on earth. But as our hands unclasped, Jameson's face grew suddenly grey. I have uh, more than this news for you, though, he said slowly. You are to have a chance to earn your comet hardly. I smiled broadly at the mention of the comet, the silver insignia worn over the heart that would mark my future rank as commander, replacing the four-rayed star of a sub-commander which I now wore on my chinny. Um, tell me more, sir, I said confidently. You've heard of the special patrol ship Philanus? asked my late commander gravely. Hmm, reported lost in space, I replied promptly. And the, uh, Dora Loss? Why, yes, she was at base here at our last call, I said, searching his face anxiously. Peter Wilson was second officer, one of my best friends. Why would you ask about her, sir? Mm, the, uh, Doros is missing also, said Commander Jameson solemnly. Both of those ships were sent upon a particular mission. Neither of them has returned. It's concluded that some common fate has overtaken them. The Garlet, under your command, is commissioned to investigate these disappearances. You're not charged with the mission of these other ships. Your orders are to investigate their disappearance. Of course, together with the official patrol orders, I shall hand you presently, but with them go verbal orders. You are to lay and keep the course designated, which will take you well out of the beaten path to a small world which has not been explored but which has been circumnavigated a number of times by various ships remaining just outside the atmospheric envelope, are found to be without evidence of intelligent habitation. In other words, without cities, roads, canals, or any other evidence of human handiwork or civilization. Now, I believe your instructions give you some of this information, but not all of it. This world, unnamed because of its uninhabited condition, is charted only as L-472, well, your larger charts will show it, I'm sure. The atmosphere is reported to be breathable by inhabitants of Earth and other beings having the same general requirements. Vegetation is reported as dense, covering the five continents of the world to the edges of the northern and southern polar caps, which are small. Well, topographically, the country is rugged in the extreme, with many peaks, apparently volcanic, but now inactive or extinct, on all of its five large continents. And, um, I'm to land there, sir, I asked eagerly. Your orders are very specific upon that point, said Commander Jameson. 
You are not to land until you've carefully and thoroughly done a recon from above at a low altitude. You will exercise every possible caution. Your specific purpose is simply this, to determine, if possible, the fate of the other two ships and report your findings at once. The chiefs of the service will then consider the matter and take whatever action may seem advisable to them. Jameson then rose to his feet and thrust out his hand in Earth's fine old salute to farewell. Now I must be going, Hanson, he said. I wish this patrol were mine instead of yours. You are a young man for such a responsibility. But, I replied with the glowing confidence of youth, I have the advantage of having served under Commander Jameson. He smiled as we shook again and shook his head. Uh, discretion can be learned only by experience, he said. But I wish you success, Hanson, on this undertaking and on many others. Supplies are on their way now. The crew will return from leave within the hour. A young Xenian by the name of Duval, I believe, is detailed to accompany you as scientific observer. Purely unofficial capacity, of course. He's been ordered to report to you at once. You are to depart as soon as feasible. You know what that means. Oh, I believe that's so. Oh, yeah, I'd almost forgotten. Here in this envelope are your orders and your course, as well as all available data on L-472. And this little casket is your comet, Hanson. I know your word with honor. Thank you, sir, I said, a bit huskily. I saluted then, and Commander Jameson acknowledged the gesture with stiff precision. Commander Jameson always had the reputation of being something of a martinet. When he'd left, I picked up the thin blue envelope he'd left me. Across the face of the envelope, in the, to my mind, jagged and unbeautiful universal script, was my name, followed by the proud title, Commander Special Patrol Ship Carlet. <sighs> my first orders. There was a small oval box of blue leather, with a silver crest of the service in base relief on the lid. I opened the case and gazed with shining eyes at the gleaming silver comet that nestled in there. And slowly I unfastened the four-eight star on my left breast and placed in its stead the insignia of my commandership. Worn smooth and shiny now, it's still my most precious possession. Kincaid, my second officer, turned and smiled as I entered the navigating room. L-472 now registers maximum attraction, sir, he reported. Dead ahead and coming up nicely. My last figures, completed about five minutes ago, indicate that we should reach the gaseous envelope in about ten hours. Kincaid was also a native of Earth, and we commonly used Earth time measurements in our conversation. As is still the case, Ships of the Special Patrol Service were commanded without exception by natives of Earth, and the entire Office of Personnel held largely from the same planet, although I have had several Xenian officers of rare ability and courage. I nodded and thanked him for the report. Maximum attraction, eh? Well, that, considering the small size of our objective, meant we were much closer to L-472 than to any other regular body. Mechanically, I studied the various dials about the room. The attraction meter, as Kincaid had said, registered several degrees of attraction, and the red slide on the rim of the dial was squarely at the top, showing that the attraction was coming from the world at which our nose was pointed. The surface temperature gauge was normal. Internal pressure, normal. Internal moisture content, a little high. Kincaid, watching me, spoke up. I've already given orders to dry out, sir, he said. Very good, Mr. Kincaid. Well, it's a long trip, and I want the crew in good condition. I studied the two charts, one showing our surroundings laterally, the other vertically. All bodies about us represented as glowing spots of green light, of varying sizes. And the ship itself is a tiny scarlet spark. Everything's ship shape, perhaps a degree or two of elevation when we were a little closer. May I come in, sir? broke in a gentle, high-pitched voice. Certainly, Mr. Duval, I replied, answering in the universal language in which the request had been made. You're always very welcome. Duval was a typical Xenian of the finest type, 
slim, very dark, and with the amazingly intelligent eyes of his kind. His voice was very soft and gentle, and like the voice of all his people, clear and high-pitched. Thank you, he said. I guess I'm over-eager, but there's something about this mission of ours that worries me. I seem to feel... He broke off abruptly and began pacing back and forth across the room. I studied him, frowning. The Xenians have a strange way of being right about such things. Their high-strung, sensitive natures seem capable of responding to these delicate, vagrant forces which even now are only incompletely understood and classified. You're uh, not used to work of this sort, I replied, as bluffly and heartily as possible. Well, there's nothing to worry about. The commanders of the two ships that disappeared probably felt the same way, sir, said Duval. I should have thought the chiefs of the Special Patrol Service would have sent several ships on a mission such as this. Uh, easy to say, I laughed bitterly. Well, if the Council would pass the appropriations we need, we might have ships enough so that we could send a fleet of ships when we wished. Uh, instead of that, the Council, in its infinite wisdom, builds greater laboratories and schools of higher learning, unless the patrol get along as best it can. It was from the laboratories and the schools of higher learning that all these things sprang, replied Duval quietly, glancing around at the array of instruments which made navigation in space possible. Eh, true, I admitted rather shortly. Oh, we must work together. And as for what we shall find upon the little world ahead, we shall be there in nine or ten hours. You may wish to make some preparations. Nine or ten hours? That's Earth time, isn't it? Uh, let's see. It's about two and a half enaros. <laughs> Correct, I smiled. The universal method of reckoning time had never appealed to me. For those of my readers who may only be familiar with Earth time measurements, an enar is about 18 Earth days, an enaren a little less than two Earth days, and an enaro nearly four and a half hours. Well, the universal system has the advantage, I admit, of a decimal division, and I found it clumsy always. I may be stubborn and old-fashioned, but a clock face with only ten numerals and one hand still strikes me as being unbeautiful and inefficient. Two and a half in our oats, repeated Duval thoughtfully. I believe I shall see if I can get a little sleep now. I should not have brought my books with me, I'm afraid. I read when I should sleep. Will you call me should there be any developments of interest? I assured him that he would be called as he requested, and he left. A ah, decent sort of chap, sir, observed Kincaid, glancing at the door through which Duval had just departed. A student, I nodded, with the contempt of violent youth for the man of gentler pursuits than mine, and turned my attentions to some calculations for entry in the law. Busied with the intricate details of my task, time passed rapidly. The watch changed, and I joined my offices in the tiny, arched dialing salon. It was during the meal that I noticed for the first time a sort of tenseness. Every member of the mess was unusually quiet. And though I would not have admitted it then, I was not without a good deal of nervous restraint myself. Gentlemen, I remarked when the meal was finished, I believe you understand our present mission. Primarily, our purpose is to ascertain, if possible, the fate of two ships that were sent here and who have not returned. We're now close enough for reasonable observation by means of the television disc, and I shall take over its operation myself. There's no gainsaying the fact that whatever fate overtook the two other patrol ships might also lay in wait for us. My orders are to observe every possible precaution and to return with a report. And I'm going to ask that each of you proceed immediately to his post and make ready, and so far as possible, for any eventuality. Warn the watch which has just gone off to be ready for instant duty. The disintegrator ray generators should be started and be available for instant emergency use, maximum power, and have the bombing crews ready for standby. What do you anticipate, sir? asked Corey, my new sub-commander. The other officers waited tensely for my reply. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Corey, I admitted reluctantly. We have no information upon which to base an assumption. 
We do know that two ships have been sent there, and neither of them have returned. Something prevented that return. We must endeavor to prevent that same fate from overtaking the Carlet and ourselves. Part 2 Hurrying back to the navigating room, I posted myself beside the cumbersome, old-fashioned television instrument. Well, 472 was near enough now to occupy the entire field, with a range hand at maximum. One whole continent and parts of two others were visible. Not many details could be made out, though. I waited grimly while an hour, then two hours, went by. My field narrowed down to one continent, then to a part of one continent. I glanced up at the surface temperature gauge and noted that the hand was registering a few degrees above normal. Corey, who had relieved Kincaid as navigating officer, followed my gaze. Shall we reduce speed, sir? he asked crisply. To twice atmospheric speed, I nodded. When we enter the envelope proper, reduce to normal atmospheric speed. Order your course upon entering the atmosphere proper and work back and forth along the emerging twilight zone, from the North Polar Cap to the Southern Cap, and so on. Yes, sir, he replied, and repeated the orders to the control room forward. I pressed the attention signal of Duval's cubicle, and informed him that we were entering the outer atmospheric fringe. Thank you, sir, he said eagerly. I shall be with you immediately. In rapid succession I called various officers and gave terse orders. Double crews on duty in the generator compartment, the ray projectors, the atomic bomb magazines, and the release tubes. Observers at all observation posts. Operators at the two smaller television instruments to comb the terrain and report instantly about any object of interest. With the three of us searching, it seemed incredible that anything could escape us. At atmospheric altitudes, even the two smaller television instruments would be able to pick up a body the size of one of the missing ships. Duval entered the room as I finished giving my orders. Ah, strange world, Duval, I commented, glancing towards the television instrument. Covered with trees, even the mountains, and what I presume to be volcanic peaks. They crowd right down to the edge of the water. He adjusted the focusing lever slightly, his face lighting up with the interest of a scientist gazing at a strange specimen, whether it be a microbe or a new world. Strange. Strange, he muttered. A universal vegetation. No variation of type from equator to polar cap, apparently. And the water. Did you notice its color, sir? Purple, I nodded. It varies on the different worlds, you know. Yeah, I've seen pink, red, white, and black seas, as well as the green and blue of Earth. Hmm, and no small islands, he went on, as though he'd not even heard me. Not in the visible portion, at any rate. I was about to reply when I felt the peculiar surge of the car lid as she reduced speed. I glanced at the indicator, watching the hand drop slowly to atmospheric speed. Keep a close watch, Duval, I ordered. We shall change our course now to comb the country for traces of two ships we're seeking. If you see the least suspicious sign, let me know immediately. He nodded, and for a time there was only a tense silence in the room, broken at intervals by Corey as he spoke briefly into his microphone, giving orders to the operating room. Perhaps an hour went by, I'm not sure. It seemed like a longer time than that, though. Then Duval called out in sudden excitement, his high, thin voice stabbing the silence. Here, sir, look. A little clearing, artificial, I judge. And the ships, both of them. Stop the ship, Mr. Corey, I snapped as I hurried to the instrument. Duval, take those reports. I gestured towards the two attention signals that were glowing and softly humming and thrust my head into the shelter of the television instrument's big hood. Oh, Duval had made no mistake. Directly beneath me, as I looked, was a clearing, a perfect square with rounded corners, obviously blasted out of the solid forest by the delicate manipulation of sharply focused disintegrator rays, and upon the naked, pitted surface thus exposed, side by side in orderly array, were the missing ships. I studied the strange scene with a heart that thumped excitedly against my ribs. 
And what should I do? Return and report? Descend and investigate? There was no sign of life around the ships, and no evidence of damage. Well, if I brought the Khalid down, would she make a third to remain there, to also be marked lost in space on the records of the service? And reluctantly I drew my head from beneath the shielding hood. What were the two reports, Duval? I asked, and my voice was thick. The other two television observers. Yes, sir. They report that they cannot positively identify the ships with their instruments, but feel certain that they are the two that we seek. Very good. Tell them, please, to remain on watch, searching space in every direction, and to report instantly anything suspicious. Mr. Curry, we will descend until this small clearing becomes visible through the ports to the unaided eye. I'll give you the corrections to bring us directly over the clearing. And I read the finer scales of the television instrument to him. He rattled off the figures, calculated an instant, and gave his orders to the control room, while I kept the television instrument bearing upon the og clearing and the two motionless, deserted ships. As we settled, I could make out the insignia of the ships, could see the pitted, stained earth of the clearing, brown with the dust of disintegration. I could see the surrounding trees very distinctly now. They seemed really similar to our weeping willows on earth, which I perhaps should explain, since it's impossible for the average individual to have a comprehensive knowledge of the flora and fauna of the entire known universe, is a tree of considerable size, having long, hanging branches arching from its crown and reaching nearly to the ground. These leaves, like typical willow leaves, were long and slender, and of rusty green colour. The trunks and branches seemed to be black or dark brown, and the trees grew so thickly that nowhere between their branches was the ground visible. Five thousand feet, sir, said Kari, directly above the clearing. Shall we descend further? A thousand feet at a time, Mr. Kari, I replied, after a moment's hesitation. My orders are to exercise the utmost caution. Mr. Duval, please make a complete analysis of the atmosphere. I believe you are familiar with the traps provided for the purpose. Yes. Um, you propose to land, sir? I propose to determine the fate of those two ships and the man who brought them here, I said with sudden determination. Duval did not reply, but as he turned to obey orders, I saw that his presentiment of trouble had not left him. Four thousand feet now, sir, said Corrie. I nodded, studying the scene below us. The great hooded instrument brought it within, apparently, fifty feet of my eyes, but the great detail revealed nothing of interest. The two ships lay motionless, huddled close together. The great circular door of each was open, as though open that same day, or maybe a century before. Three thousand feet, sir, said Corrie. Proceed at the same speed, I replied. Whatever fate had overtaken the men of the other ships had caused them to disappear entirely, and without sign of a struggle. But what conceivable fate could that be? Two thousand feet, sir, said Corrie. Good, I said grimly. Continue with the descent, Mr. Corrie. Duval hurried into the room as I spoke. His face was still clouded with foreboding. I have tested the atmosphere, sir, he reported. It is suitable for breathing by either men of Earth or Xenia. No trace of noxious gases of any kind. It is probably rather rarefied, such as one might find on Earth or Xenia at high altitudes. One thousand feet, sir, said Corey. I hesitated for an instant. Undoubtedly the atmosphere had been tested by the other ships before they landed. In the case of the second ship, at any rate, those in command must have been on the alert against danger and yet both of those ships lay there motionless, vacant, deserted. I could feel the eyes of the man on me. My decision must be delayed no further. We will land, Mr. Corey, I said grimly. Near the two ships, please. Very well, sir, nodded Corey, and spoke briefly into the microphone. I might warn you, sir, said Duval quietly to govern your activities once outside, free from the gravity pads of the ship, on a body of such small size, well, an ordinary step will probably cause a leap of considerable distance. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Duval. 
That is a consideration that I'd overlooked. I shall warn the men. We must... And at that instant, I felt the slight jar of landing. I glanced up, met Corrie's grave glance squarely. Uh, grounded, sir, he said quietly. Very good, Mr. Corrie. Keep the ship ready for instant action, please, and call the landing crew to the forward exit. Will you accompany us, Mr. Duval? Certainly, sir. Good. You understand your orders, Mr. Corrie? Yes, sir. I then returned his salute and led the way out of the room, Duval close on my heels. The landing crew was composed of all men not at regular stations, nearly half of the Khalid's entire crew. They were equipped with the small atomic power pistols as sidearms, and there were two three-man disintegrator ray squads. We all wore menors, which were unnecessary in the ship, but decidedly useful outside. Oh, I might add that the menorah of those days was not the delicate, beautiful thing that it is today. It was comparatively crude, a clumsy band of metal in which were embedded the vital units in the tiny atomic energy generator, and was worn upon the head like a crown. But for all its clumsiness, it conveyed and received thought, and, after all, that was all we demanded of it. I caught a confused jumble of questioning thoughts as I came up and took command of the situation promptly. It will be understood, of course, that in those days men had not learned to blank their minds against the menorah, as they do today. It took generations of training to perfect that ability. Open the exit, I ordered Kincaid, who was standing by the switch, key in the lock. Yes, sir, he thought promptly, and unlocking the switch, released the lever. The great circular door revolved, backing slowly on its fine threads, gripped by the massive gimbals which, as at last the ponderous plug of metal freed itself from its threads, swung the circular door aside, like the door of a vault. Fresh clean air swept in, and we breathed it gravely. Science can revitalize air, take out impurities and replace used-up constituents, but it cannot give the freshness of pure natural air, even the science of today. Mr. Kincaid, you'll stand by with five men. Under no circumstances are you to leave your post until ordered to do so. No rescue parties, under any circumstances, are to be sent out unless you have those orders directly from me. Should any untoward thing happen to this party, you will instantly reseal this exit, reporting at the same time to Mr. Corey, who has his orders. You will not attempt to rescue us but will return to the base and report in full, with Mr. Corrie in command. Is that clear? Certainly, came back his response instantly, but I could sense the rebellion in his mind. Kincaid and I were old friends as one of his fellow officers. I smiled at him reassuringly and directed my orders to the waiting man. You are aware of the fate of the two ships of the patrol that have already landed here? I thought slowly, to be sure they understood perfectly. What fate overtook them, I do not know. That's what we're here to determine. Now, it's obvious that this is a dangerous mission. I'm not ordering any of you to go. Any man who wishes to be relieved from landing duty may remain inside the ship, and without reproach. Those who do go should be constantly on the alert and keep information, the usual column of twos. Be very careful when stepping out of the ship to adjust your stride to the lessened gravity of this small world. Watch this point. I then turned to Duval, motioned him to fall in at my side. Without a backward glance, we marched out of the ship, treading very carefully to keep from leaping into the air with each step. Twenty feet away, I glanced back. There were fourteen men behind me. Not a single man of the landing crew had remained in the ship. I'm proud of you, man, I thought heartily and no emanation from any menorah was ever more sincere. Cautiously, eyes roving ceaselessly, we made our way towards the two silent ships. It seemed a quiet, peaceful world, an unlikely place for tragedy. The air was fresh and clean, although, as Duval had predicted, rarefied like the air at an altitude. The willow-like trees that hemmed us in rustled gently, their long, frond-like branches with their rusty green leaves swaying. Do you notice, sir? 
came a gentle thought from Duval, an emanation that could hardly have been perceptible to the men behind us. That there is no wind, and yet the trees are swaying and rustling. I glanced around, startled. I hadn't noticed the absence of a breeze. Oh, I tried to make my response reassuring. Yeah, there's probably a breeze higher up. It doesn't dip down into this little clearing, I ventured. At any rate, it's not important. These ships are what interest me. What will we find there? Oh, we shall soon know, replied Duval. Here's the Dolos, the second of the two, was it not? Yes. I came to a halt beside the gaping door. There was no sound from within, no evidence of life there, no sign that men had ever crossed that threshold, save that the whole fabric was the work of man's hands. Mr. Duval and I will investigate the ship, with two of you men, I directed. The rest of the detail will remain on guard, and give the alarm at the least sign of any danger. You first two men, follow us. The indicated man nodded and stepped forward. There, yes sirs, came surging through my menore like a single thought. Cautiously, with Duval at my side and the two men at our backs, we stepped over the high threshold into the interior of the door lock. Part 3 The ethon tubes overhead made everything as light as day, and since the Dorlos was a sister ship of my own Carlit, I had not the slightest difficulty in finding my way about. There was no sign of a disturbance anywhere. Everything was in perfect order. From the evidence, it would seem that the officers and men of the Dorlos had deserted the ship of their own accord, and then failed to return. Well, nothing of value here. I commented to Duval. We might as well. There was a sunk commotion from outside the ship. Startled shouts rang through the hollow hull, and a confused medley of excited thoughts came pouring in. With one accord, the four of us dashed to the exit, Duval and I in the lead. At the door we paused, following the stricken gaze of the men grouped in a rigid knot just outside. Oh, some forty feet away was the edge of the forest that hemmed us in, a forest that was now lashing and writhing as though in the grip of some terrible hurricane, trunks bending and whipping, long branches writhing, curling, lashing out. Two of the men, sir, shouted a non-commissioned officer of the landing crew as we appeared in the doorway. Oh, in his excitement he forgot his menorah and resorted to the infinitely slower but more natural speech. Some sort of insect came buzzing down, like an earth bee, but larger. One of the men slapped it and jumped aside, forgetting the low gravity here. While well, he shot into the air, and another of the men made a grab for him. Oh, they both went sailing into the trees. Look! But I'd already spotted the two men. The trees had them in their grip. Long tentacles curled around them. A dozen of the great willow-like growths apparently fighting for possession of the prizes. And all around, far out of reach, the trees of the forest were swaying restlessly, their long pendulous branches, like tentacles, lashing out hungrily. The racer, snapped the thought from Duval, like a flash of lightning. Concentrate the beams, strike at the trunks. Right. My orders emanated on the heels of the thought more quickly than one word could have been uttered. The six men who operated the disintegrator rays were stung out of their startled immobility, and the soft hum of the automatic power generators deepened. Strike at the trunks of the trees. Beams narrowed to a minimum. Action at will. The invisible rays swept long gashes into the forest as the trainers squatted behind their sights, directing their long, gleaming tubes. Branches crashed to the ground, suddenly motionless. Thick brown dust dropped heavily. A trunk, shortened by six inches or so, dropped into its stub and fell with a prolonged sound of rending wood. The trees against which it had fallen tugged angrily at their trapped tentacles. One of the men rolled free, staggered to his feet and came lurching toward us. Trunk after trunk dropped onto its severed stub and fell among the lashing branches of its fellows. The other man was caught for a moment in a mass of dead and motionless wood. 
but a cunningly directed ray dissolved the entangling branches around him, and he lay there, free but unable to arise. But the rays played on ruthlessly. The brown heavy powder was falling like greasy soot. Trunk after trunk crashed to the ground, slashed into fragments. Right, cease action, I ordered, and instantly the eager whine of the generators softened to a barely discernible hum. Two of the men, under orders, raced out to the injured man, while the rest of us clustered around the first of the two to be freed from the terrible tentacles of the trees. His menorah was gone, his tight-fitting uniform was in shreds and blotched with blood. There was a huge crimson world across his face, and blood dripped slowly from the tips of his fingers. God, he muttered unsteadily, as kindly arms lifted him with eager tenderness. They're alive, like snakes, and they're hungry. Take him to the ship, I ordered. He's to receive treatment immediately. I turned to the detail that was bringing in the other victim. The man was unconscious and moaning, but suffering more from shock than anything else. A few minutes under the helio emanations and he'd be fit for light duty. As the men hurried him to the ship, I turned to Duval. He was standing beside me, rigid, his face very pale, and his eyes fixed on space. What do you make of it, Mr. Duval? I questioned him. Of the trees? He seemed startled, as though I'd aroused him from deepest thought. They are not difficult to comprehend, sir. There are numerous growths that are primarily carnivorous. We have the fintal vine on Xenia, which coils instantly when touched, and thus traps many small animals which it wraps about with its folds and digests through sucker-like growths. On your own earth there are, we learn, hundreds of varieties of insectivorous plants. The Venus flytrap, known otherwise as Dionia muscupula, which has a leaf hinged in the median line with teeth-like bristles. The two sections of the leaf snap together with considerable force when an insect alights upon the surface, and the soft portions of the catch are digested by the plant before the leaves open again. The pitcher plant is another native of Earth, and several varieties of it are found on Xenia and at least two other planets. It traps its game without movement, but is nevertheless insectivorous. You have another species on Earth that is, or well, was, very common, the Mimosa pudica. Perhaps you know it as the sensitive plant. It doesn't trap insects, but it has a very distinct power of movement, and is extremely irritable. So it's not at all difficult to understand a carnivorous tree, capable of violent and powerful motion. This is undoubtedly what we have here, a decidedly interesting phenomena, but not difficult to comprehend. Well, uh, it seems like a long explanation, as I recorded here, but emanated as it was, it took but an instant to complete it. Mr. Duval went on without a pause. I believe, however, that I have discovered something far more important. How is your menorah adjusted, sir? With minimum. Turn it to maximum, sir. I glanced at him curiously, but obeyed. And new streams of thought poured in upon me. Kincaid, the guard at the exit, and, well, something else. I blanked out Kincaid and the men, feeling Duval's eyes searching my face. There was something else. Something... I focused on the dim, vague emanations that came to me from the circlet of my menorah, and gradually, like an object seen through heavy mist, I perceived the message. Wait, wait. We're coming through the ground. The trees disintegrate them, all of them, all you can reach. But not the ground, not the ground. Peter... I shouted, turning to Duval. That's Peter Wilson, second officer of the Doros. Duval nodded, his dark face alight. Let's see if we can answer him, he suggested, and we concentrated all of our energy on a single thought. We understand. We understand. Well, the answer came back instantly. Oh, good. Thank God. Sweep them down, Hanson. Every tree. Kill them. Kill all of them. Kill them. The emanation fairly shook with hate. We're coming to the clearing. Wait. While you wait, use your rays upon those accursed hungry trees. 
Grimly and silently we hurried back to the ship. Duval, the savant, snatching up specimens of earth and rock here and there as he went. The disintegrator rays of the portable projectors were no more than toys compared with the mighty beams that Carlid was capable of projecting, with her great generators to supply power. Even with the beams narrowed to the minimum, they cut a swath a yard or more in diameter, and their range was tremendous. Although working rather less rapidly as the distance and power decreased, they were effective over a range of many miles. From their blasting beams the forest shriveled and sank into tumbled chaos. A haze of brownish dust hung low over the scene, and I watched with a sort of awe. It was the first time I'd ever seen the rays at work on such wholesale destruction. The startling thing became evident soon after we began our work. This world, which we had thought to be void of animal life, proved to be teeming with it. From out of the tangle of broken and harmless branches, Thousands of animals appeared. The majority of them were quite large, perhaps the size of full-grown hogs, which earth animal they seemed to resemble, save that they were a dirty yellow colour and had strong, heavily clawed feet. These were the largest of the animals, but there were myriads of smaller ones, all of them pale or neutral in colour, and apparently unused to such strong light, for they ran blindly, wildly seeking shelter from the universal confusion. Still, the destructive beams kept about their work, until the scene had changed utterly. Instead of resting in a clearing, the Khaled was now in the midst of a tangle of fallen, wilting branches that stretched like a great still sea as far as the eye could see. Cease action, I ordered suddenly. I'd seen, or thought I'd seen, a human figure moving in the tangle not far from the edge of the clearing. Corrie relayed the order, and instantly the rays were cut off. My menor, free from the interference of the great atomic generators of the Khalid, emanated the moment the generators ceased functioning. Enough, Hansa. Cut the rays. We're coming. We've ceased action. Come on, now. I hurried to the still open exit. Kincaid and his guards were staring at what had been the forest. They were so intent that they didn't notice I'd joined them, and no wonder. A file of men were scrambling over the debris, gaunt men with dishevelled hair, practically naked, covered with dirt and the greasy brown dust of the disintegrator ray. In the lead, hardly recognisable, his menor, awry upon his tangled locks, was Peter Wilson. Wilson! I shouted, and in a single great leap I was at his side, shaking his hand, one arm about his scarred shoulders, laughing and talking excitedly, all in the same breath. Wilson, tell me, in God's name, what's happened? He looked up at me with shining happy eyes, deep in black sockets of hunger and suffering. Ah, oh, the part that counts, he said hoarsely, is that you're here, and we're here with you. My men need rest and food. Not too much food at first, but we are starving. I'll give you the story of as much of it as I know while we eat. I sent my orders ahead. For every man of that pitiful crew of survivors, there were two eager men of the Khalid's crew to minister to them. In the little dining salon of the officers' mess, Wilson gave us the story, while he ate slowly and carefully, keeping his ravenous hunger in check. Oh, that's a weird sort of story, he said. I'll cut it as short as I can. I'm too weary for details. Now well, the door loss, as I suppose you know, was ordered to L-472 to determine the fate of the Philonus, which had been sent here to determine the feasibility of establishing a supply place here for a new interplanetary ship line. It took us nearly three days, Earth time, to locate this clearing and the Philonus, and we grounded the Dorlos immediately. Our commander, you probably know him, Hanson, David McClellan, big red-faced chap. I nodded, and Wilson continued. Our oh, commander McClellan was a choleric person, as courageous a man as ever wore the blue and silver of the service, and very thoughtful of his men. We had a bad trip. Two swarms of meteorites had worn our nerves thin, and a faulty part in the air purifying apparatus had nearly done us in. While the exit was being unsealed, he gave the interior crew permission to go off duty, get some fresh air, with orders, however, to remain close to the ship, under my command. Then, with the usual landing crew, 
he started for the filler. He'd forgotten, under the stress of the moment, that the force of gravity would be very small on a body no larger than this. The result was that, as soon as they hurried out of the ship, away from the influence of our own gravity pads, they hurled into the air in all directions. Wilson paused, and several seconds passed before he could go on. Well, the trees, I suppose you know something about them, reached out and swept up three of them. Oh, McClellan and the rest of the landing crew rushed to their rescue. Oh, they were caught up, man. Oh, God, I can see them. I can hear them even now. Oh, I couldn't stand there and see that happen to them. With the rest of the crew behind me, we rushed out, armed with only our atomic pistols. We didn't dare use the rays. There were a dozen men caught up everywhere in those hellish tentacles. I don't know what I thought we could do. I knew only that I must do something. Our leaps carried us over the tops of the trees that were fighting for the... well, for the bodies of McClellan and the rest of the landing crew. I saw then, when it was too late, there was nothing we could do. The trees had done their work. They, um... They were feeding. Well, perhaps that's why we escaped. We came down in a tangle of whipping branches... Several of my men were snatched up. The rest of us saw how helpless our position was, and that there was nothing we could do. We saw, too, that the ground was literally honeycombed, so we dove down these burrows, out of the reach of the trees. Oh, there were nineteen of us that escaped. I can't tell you how we lived, and I wouldn't if I could. The burrows had been dug by the pig-like animals that the trees live upon, and they led eventually to the shore where there was water. Got horrible, bitter stuff, but not salty, and apparently not poisonous. We lived on these pig-like animals, and we learned something of their way of life. The trees seem to sleep, or at least become inactive at night. Unless they're touched, do they lash out with their tentacles. At night the animals feed, largely upon the large, soft fruit of these trees. Of course, large numbers of them make a fatal step each night, but they are prolific, and their ranks don't suffer. Well, of course, we tried to get back to the clearing and the door loss, first by tunneling. Well, that was impossible, we found, because the rays used by the Philonus in clearing a landing place had acted somewhat upon the earth beneath. They had turned to powder. Our burrows fell in upon us faster than we could dig them out. Well, two of our men lost their lives that way. Then we tried creeping back by night, but we couldn't see as can the other animals here. And we quickly found out it was suicide to attempt such tactics. Two more of the men were lost in that fashion, and that left fourteen of us. Well, we decided then to wait. We knew there'd be another ship along sooner or later. Luckily one of the men had somehow retained his menor, and we treasured that as we treasured our lives. Today, when deep in our runways beneath the surface we felt, or heard, the crashing of the trees, we knew the service had not forgotten us. I put on the manure. Well, I think you know the rest now, gentlemen. There were eleven of us left. Here we are, all that's left of the Dorlos crew. We found no trace of any survivor of the Philonus. Well, unaware of the possibility of danger, they were undoubtedly all victims of the trees. Wilson's head dropped forward on his chest. He straightened up with a start and an apologetic smile. I believe, Hanson, uh, he said slowly. I'd better get a little rest. And he slumped forward on the table in the death-like sleep of utter exhaustion. And there the interesting part of the story ends. The rest is history, and there's too much dry history in the universe already. Duvall wrote three great volumes on L-472, or Ibit as it's called now. One of them tells in detail how the presence of constantly increasing quantities of volcanic ash robbed the soil of that little world of its vitality, so that all forms of vegetation except the one became extinct, and how through a process of development and evolution those trees became carnivorous. The second volume is a learned discussion of the tree itself. It seems that a few specimens were spared for study, isolated on a peninsula on one of the continents, and turned over to Duval for observation and dissection. All I can say for the book is that it's probably accurate. 
certainly it's neither interesting nor comprehensible. And then, of course, there is his treatise on Ulcrite. How he happened to find the ore, the probable amount available on L472, or Ibit if you prefer, and an explanation of his new method of refining it. I saw him frantically gathering specimens while we were getting ready to leave, but it wasn't until after we'd departed that he mentioned what he'd found. Well, I have a set of these volumes somewhere. Duval autographed them and presented me with them. They established his position, I understand, in this world of science, and, of course, the discovery of this new source of ochrite was a tremendous find for the whole universe. Interplanetary transportation wouldn't be where it is today if it weren't for this inexhaustible source of power. And yes, Duval became famous and very rich. I received the handshakes and the gratitude of the eleven men we rescued, and exactly nine words of commendation from the chief of my squadron. You are a credit to the service, Commander Hanson. Well, perhaps, to some who read this, it will seem that Duval fared better than I. But to men who have known the comradeship of the outer space, the heartfelt gratitude of eleven friends is a precious thing. And to any man who has ever worn the blue and silver uniform of the Special Patrol Service, those nine words from the Chief of Squadron will sound strong. Chiefs of Squadrons in the Special Patrol Service, at least in those days, gave scant praise. But it might be different in these days of soft living and political pull. In tonight's story, Dr. Bird and his friend Carnes unravel another criminal web of scientific mystery. The Black Lamp by Captain S. P. Meek. The clue, Carnes, said Dr. Bird slowly, lies in those windows. Operative Carnes of the United States Secret Service shook his head before he glanced at the windows of the famous scientist's private laboratory on the top floor of the Bureau of Standards. I usually defer to your knowledge, Doctor, he said, but this time I think you're off on the wrong foot. If the thieves came in through the windows, what was their object in cutting that hole through the roof? The marks are very plain, and they indicate that the hole was cut in some manner from the inside. Dr. Bird smiled enigmatically. Well, that is too evident for discussion, he replied. I grant you that the thieves entered from the roof uh, through that hole. After they'd secured their booty, they left by the same route. I presume that you've noticed the marks on the roof were an aircraft of some sort, probably a helicopter, landed and then took off. A much greater question is that of what they did before they landed and cut the hole. I don't follow your reasoning, Doctor. Carnes, that hole was cut through the roof with a heavy saw. In cutting it, the workers dislodged quite a little plaster which fell to the floor and must have made a great deal of noise. Why wasn't that noise heard? Well, it was heard. The watchman heard it, but knew that Lieutenant Breslau was working here and he thought he'd made the noise. Well, surely... But why didn't Breslau hear it? How do we know that he didn't? He was taken to Walter Reed Hospital this morning with his mind an absolute blank and his tongue paralyzed. He must have seen the thieves and they treated him in some way to ensure his silence. When he's able to talk, if he ever is, he'll probably give us a good description of them. Dr. Bird shook his head. Oh, too thin, Carney, old oh dear, he says. Breslau is a very intelligent young man. He was perfectly normal when I left him shortly after midnight last night. He was working alone in here on a device of the utmost military importance. On the desk is a push button which sets ringing a dozen gongs in the building. Surely a man of that type would have had sense enough when he saw or heard intruders cutting a hole through the roof to sound an alarm which would have brought every watchman on the grounds to his assistance. He must have been knocked out before the halt was started, probably before the helicopter's landing. How? Gas of some sort? Well, the windows were all closed and locked, and I've already ascertained that the gas and water lines have not been tampered with. Gas won't penetrate through a solid roof in sufficient concentration to knock out a man like that. It was something more subtle than gas. What was it? 
I don't know yet. The clue to what it was lies, as I told you, in those windows. Carnes moved over and surveyed the windows closely. Well, I see um, nothing unusual about them except that they need washing rather badly. Well, they were washed last Friday, but they do look rather dirty, don't they? Suppose you take a rag and some scouring soap and clean up a pane. The detective took the proffered articles and started his task. He wet a pane of glass, rubbed up a thick lather of scouring soap and applied it and rubbed vigorously. With clear water he washed the glass and then gave an exclamation of astonishment and examined it more closely. Now, this isn't dirt, Doctor, he cried. The glass seems to be fogged. Dr. Bird chuckled. Hmm, so it seems, he admitted. Now look at the rest of the glass around the laboratory. Carnes looked around and then walked to a table littered with apparatus and examined a dozen pieces carefully. It's all fogged in exactly the same way, Doctor, he said. The only piece of clear glass in the room is that piece of plate glass on your desk. Dr. Bird picked up a hammer and struck the plate on his desk a sharp blow. Carnes ducked instinctively, but the hammer rebounded harmlessly from the plate. This isn't glass, Carnes, said the doctor. That plate is made of vitrilene, a new product which I have developed. It looks like glass, but it has entirely different properties. It's of enormous strength and is quite insensitive to shock. It has one most peculiar property. While ultraviolet and longer rays will penetrate it quite readily, it's a perfect screen for X-rays and other rays of shorter wavelengths. It appears to be the only piece of transparent substance in my laboratory which has not been fogged, as you call it. Does short waves fog glass, Doctor? Ah, oh, not as far as I know at present. But you must remember that very little work has been done with the short wavelengths. In the vast range of waves whose lengths lie between zero and that of the X-ray, only a few points have been investigated and definitely plotted. There may be in that range a wavelength which will fog glass. Well, then your theory is that some sort of ray machine was put in operation before the helicopter landed? Oh, it's too early to attempt any theorizing, Carnes. Let us confine ourselves to the known facts. Lieutenant Breslau was normal at midnight and was working in this room. Sometime between then and seven this morning, he underwent certain mental and physical changes which prevent him from telling us what he observed. During the same period, a hole was cut in the roof and things of great importance stolen. At the same time, all the glass in the laboratory became semi-opaque. The problem is to determine what connection there is between the three events. I'll handle the scientific end here, but there is some outside work to be done, and that'll be your share. Give your orders, Doctor, said the detective briefly. Well, to understand what I'm driving at, I'll have to tell you what's been stolen. Now, naturally, this is highly confidential. Some rumors have leaked out as to my experiments with radite, as I've named the new radium-containing disintegrating explosive on which I've been working. But no one short of the Secretary of War and the Chief of Ordnance and certain of their selected subordinates knows that my experiments have been successful and that the United States is in a position to manufacture radite in almost unlimited quantities from the pitch-blend ore deposits of Wyoming and Nevada. The effects of radite will be catastrophic on the unfortunate victim on whom it is first used. The only thing left to do was to develop a gun from which radite shells could be fired with safety and precision. Oh, ordinary propellant powders are too variable for this purpose. But I found that radite B, one form of my new explosive, can be used for propelling the shells from a gun. The ordinary gun will last only two or three rounds due to the erosive action of the radite charge on the barrel, an ordinary ordnance is heavier and more cumbersome than is necessary. When this was found to be the case, the Chief of Ordnance detailed Lieutenant Breslau, the Army's greatest expert on gun design, to work with me in an attempt to develop a suitable weapon. Breslau is a wizard at that sort of work, and has made a miniature working model of a gun with a vitrilene-lined barrel, which is capable of being fired with a miniature shell. The gun will stand up under the repeated firing of radite charges, is very light and compact, and gives an accuracy of fire control heretofore deemed impossible. From this he planned to construct a larger weapon which would fire a shell containing an explosive charge of two and one-half ounces of radite at a rate of fire of two hundred shots per minute. 
the destructive effect of each shell will be greater than that of the ordinary high-explosive shell fired from a 16-inch mortar, and all of the shells can be landed inside a 200-foot circle at a range of 15 miles. The weight of the completed gun will be less than half a ton, exclusive of the firing platform. It is Breslau's working model which has been stolen. Khan's whistled softly between his teeth. The matter will have to be handled pretty delicately to avoid international complications, he said. It's hard to tell just where to look. There are a great many nations who would give any amount for a model of such a weapon. Well, the matter must be handled delicately and also in absolute secrecy, Carnes. We're not yet ready to announce to the world the fact that we have such a weapon in our armory. It's the plan of the President to have a half dozen of these weapons manufactured and given a demonstration of their terrible effectiveness to representatives of the powers of the world. Think what an argument the existence of such a weapon will be for the furtherance of his plans for disarmament and universal peace. Public sentiment will force disarmament on the world, for even the worst jingoists could no longer defend armaments in the face of America's offer to scrap these super-engines of destruction and to destroy the plans from which they were made. If the model has fallen into the hands of any civilized power, the damage is not irreparable. The public opinion would force its surrender and return. Oh, it is among the uncivilized powers that our search must first be made. Well, that makes the problem of where to start more complicated. Oh, on the contrary, it simplifies it immensely. At the head of the uncivilized powers stands one which has the brains, the scientific knowledge, and the manufacturing facilities to make terrible use of such a weapon. In addition, the aim of that power is to overthrow all world governments and set up in their stead its own tyrannical disorder. Need I name it? You refer to Russia? No, not to Russia. The great slumbering giant who will someday take her place in the sun in fellowship with the other nations, but rather to Bolsheviki. That empire within an empire, that horrible power which is holding sleeping Russia in chains of steel and blood. It is there that our search must first be made. Well, of course, they have uh, no official representative in America. No, but the young Labour Party is as much their accredited representative as the British ambassador is of Imperial Britain. Your first task will be to trail down and locate every leader of that group and to investigate his present activities. Well, I can tell you where most of them are without investigation. Demberg, Semensky, and Karuska are in Atlanta. Fedorovich and Kaspar are in Leavenworth. Saranoff is dead, well, presumably. My doctor, I saw with my own eyes the destruction of the submarine in which he was riding. Did you see his dead body? No. Neither did I, and I'll never be sure until I do. Once before we were certain of his death, and he bobbed up with a new fiendish device. Uh, we cannot eliminate Saranov. Uh, I'll include him in my plans. Do so. Besides, a hypothetical Saranov, there are half a dozen or more of the old leaders of the gang who are alive and at liberty, so far as we know. They fled the country after the Coast Guard broke up their alien smuggling scheme, but some of them may have returned. There are also thirty or forty underlings who should be located and checked upon, and, in addition, you must not lose sight of the fact that the new heads of the organization may have been smuggled into the United States. It's no simple task that I'm setting you, Carnes, but I know that you and Bolton will see it through if anyone can. Ah, uh, thanks, Doctor. We'll do our best. Now, if I'm not speaking out of turn, what are you planning on doing in the meantime? I am going to start Taylor off on an ultra shortwave generator and try a few experiments along that line. Breslau is at Walter Reed and they're doing all they can for him, but, well, until I can get some definite information as to the underlying cause of his condition, they are more or less shooting in the dark. How are they treating him? By electric stimulations and vibratory treatments and by keeping him in a darkened room. By the way, Carnes, if I am correct in my line of thought, it would be well to have an extra guard put over Karuska. He was the only real expert in ordnance that the young Labour Party had, and if they have Breslau's model, they'll need him to supervise the construction of a gun. I'll attend to that at once, Doctor. Is there anything else? No, not that I know of. I'm going out to Tacoma Park this afternoon and have another look at Breslau. But it's too soon to hope for any change in his condition. 
Aside from the time I'll be out there, you can find me either here or at my home, in case anything develops. I'll get on that job at once, Doctor. Thanks, man. Remember that speed must be the keynote of your work. The telephone bell at the head of Dr. Bird's bed woke into noisy activity. The doctor roused himself and took down the instrument sleepily. A glance at the clock showed him that it was four in the morning, and he muttered a malediction on the one who had called him. Hello, he said into the receiver. Dr. Bird speaking. Doctor, came a crisp voice over the wire. Wake up. This is Khan talking. Something has broken loose. All trace of sleep vanished from Dr. Bird's face, and his eyes glowed momentarily with a particular glitter which Carnes would at once have recognized as indicative of the keenest interest. Oh, what's happened, Carnes? he demanded. I telephoned Atlanta this morning and arranged to have an extra guard put over Karuska, as you suggested. The matter was simplified by the fact that he and nine others were confined in the prison infirmary. The warden agreed to do as I told him, and, in addition to the other guards, a special man was placed in the ward near Karuska's bed. At 2 a.m., the lights in the ward went out. Accidentally, or were they put out? Well, they haven't found that out yet. At any rate, they're all out right now. But Karuska and all the other inmates and all the guards at that particular ward have gone crazy. The hell, you say? Well, not only that, they're also partially paralyzed. The description I got over the telephone corresponds exactly with the condition of Lieutenant Breslau, as you described it to me. Now here's the most interesting part of the whole affair. The special guard over Karusko was only lightly affected, and has already recovered and is in a position to tell you exactly what happened. I got a garbled account of the affair from the warden. Something about a goldfish bowl or something like that. Oh, the warden wouldn't take it seriously enough to give me details. I didn't press for them much, for I knew that you'd rather get them at first hand. Ah, I certainly would. I'll be ready to leave for Atlanta in less than ten minutes. I expected that, Doctor. The car's already on its way to pick you up. I'll meet you at Langley Field, where a plane has already been tuned up and will be ready to take off by the time we get there. Good work, Hans. I'll see you at the field. A car was waiting for Carnes and Dr. Bird when the Langley Field plane slid down to a landing at Atlanta. At the penitentiary, Dr. Bird went direct to the infirmary where Karuska had been confined. As he entered, he shot a keen glance around and gave an exclamation of satisfaction. Hmm. Look at the windows, Carnes, he cried. Carnes went over to the nearest window and moistened his fingertip and applied it experimentally to the glass. The moisture produced no effect, for the glass of the windows was permanently clouded, as was that of the doctor's laboratory. Whatever happened in my laboratory the night before last was repeated here last night with a similar object, said the doctor. The object there was to steal a gun model. Here it was to steal a man who could construct a full-size gun from the model. I understand that one of the guards escaped the fate which overtook the rest of the persons in the infirmary. Ah, not altogether, doctor replied the warden. I think that his mind is somewhat affected, for he tells a wild yarn and insists on trying to wear a goldfish ball on his head. I have him under observation in the psychopathic ward. Dr. Bird shot a scornful glance at the warden. Oh, there are none so blind as those who will not see, he murmured. Yeah, by all means, I wish to see him, he went on aloud. Will you have him brought here at once, please? The warden nodded and spoke to one of the attendants. In a few moments, a tall, fair-haired young giant stood before the doctor. Dr. Bird pushed back his unruly shock of black hair with his fingers, those long, slim, mobile fingers which alone betrayed the artist in his makeup, and shot a piercing glance from his black eyes into the blue ones, which returned the gaze unabashed. "'What's your name?' he asked. "'Bailey, sir.' "'You were on guard here last night?' Yes, sir. I was detailed as a special guard over number 9764. Tell me in your own words what happened. Don't be afraid to speak out. I'm not going to disbelieve you. And above all, tell me everything, no matter how unimportant it may seem to you. I'll judge the importance of things for myself. I'm Dr. Bird of the Bureau of Standards. 
guard's face lit up at the doctor's words. I've heard of you, doctor, he said in a relieved tone, and I'll be glad to tell you everything. Ten o'clock last night, I received Carragher, a special guard over number 9764. Carragher reported that the prisoner was somewhat restless and hadn't been asleep as of yet. I sat down about fifteen feet from his bed and prepared to keep an eye on him until I was relieved at six o'clock this morning. Well, nothing happened until about two o'clock. Number 9764 was restless, as Carragher had said. But toward midnight, he quieted down and apparently went to sleep. When I was sleeping myself, I got up and took a turn around the room every five minutes to be sure that I kept awake. And that's how I'm so sure of the time, sir. And Dr. Bird nodded. At five minutes to two, just as I got up, I heard a noise outside like a big electric fan. It sounded like it came from directly overhead, and I went to the window and looked out. I couldn't see anything, but I could hear it pretty plainly. And then I heard a noise like someone had fallen on the roof. Almost at the same time, there came a sort of high-pitched whine, a good deal like the noise an electric motor makes when it's running at high speed. I thought of giving an alarm. I didn't want to stir things up unless I was sure that there was some necessity for it. So I started for the door to ask one of the outside guards if he'd heard anything. As I turned toward number 9764, I saw that he'd been sitting up in bed while my back was turned. As soon as he saw that I'd noticed him, he lay back real quick and pulled the covers over his head. Now he moved pretty quick, but not so quick that I couldn't see that he'd had something that glittered like glass before his face started over toward his bed to see what he was doing, and then it was that the light started to get dim. Go on, said the doctor as Bailey paused. His eyes were glittering brightly now. Well, sir, doctor, I don't hardly know how to describe what happened next. The lights were getting dim, but not as they ordinarily do when the current starts to go off. The filaments were shining as bright as they ever did, but well, the light didn't seem to be able to penetrate the air. The whole room seemed to be filled with a blackness that stopped the light. No, sir, it wasn't like fog. It was more like something more powerful than the lights was in the room and was killing them. It wasn't only the lights which were affected. It was me as well. The blackness, whatever it was, was getting into me as well as into the room. I couldn't seem to make myself think like I wanted to. I tried to yell to give an alarm. I found that I could hardly whisper. I went toward the bed and I saw number 9764 sit up again. He had like a goldfish bowl pulled down over his head. It was evident that it was keeping the blackness away, for I could see him plainly and his eyes were as bright as ever. The nearer I got to him, the funnier I felt. I began to be afraid that I'd go out. Number 9764 got up out of bed and I could see him grinning at me through the bowl. He reached up and adjusted that bowl, and all of a sudden I realized that whatever was knocking me out was not affecting him because he had that thing on. Well, I jumped for him with the idea of taking the bowl off and putting it on my own head. He saw what I was up to and fought like a cornered rat, but the blackness hadn't affected my muscles. Yeah, I'm a pretty big man, sir, and number 9764 is a little runt. Yeah, it didn't take me long to get the bowl off his head and pull on over mine. As soon as I did that... Seemed to be able to think clearer. When I was sitting on number 9764, I was ready to tap him with a persuader if he started anything, but, well, I didn't have to. In a few minutes, he stopped struggling and lay perfectly quiet. Well, the lights kept getting dimmer and dimmer until they went out altogether, and the room became pitch dark. Well, it wasn't exactly as if the lights had gone out, sir. Well, I seemed to know that they were still there, and were burning as bright as ever, but... They couldn't penetrate the blackness in the room, if you understand what I mean. Uh, I think I do, said Dr. Bird slowly. It was a good deal as if you'd seen a glass filled with a pale red liquid and someone had dumped black ink into the fluid and hid the red color. You'd know that the red was still there, but you wouldn't be able to see it through the black. Yeah, that's exactly what it was like, Doctor. You've described it better than I can. Well, at any rate... After it got real dark, I heard a low whistle from the roof. Number 9764 made a struggle to get out for a moment, and then lay quiet again. The whistle sounded again, then I heard someone call, Caruso. Everything was quiet for a while, then the same voice called again, said some stuff in a foreign language I couldn't understand. 
I kept perfectly quiet to see what would happen. About ten minutes the whole room remained perfectly dark, as I've said, and all the while I could hear that whining noise. All of a sudden it began to sound in a lower note, and then I could see the lights again. Very dimly, like the black ink you spoke of was fading out. The note got lower until it stopped altogether, and the lights came on brighter until they were normal again. Then I heard a scraping noise on the roof, and the noise I had heard first, like a big electric fan, well, I looked at the clock and it was 2.20. For a few minutes I wasn't able to collect my wits. When I got up off of number 9764 at last, he stared at me as though he didn't know a thing, and I heaved him back into his bed and ran to the door to summon an outside guard. I could still talk in a husky whisper, but not loud. I wasn't surprised when no one heard me. Well, my orders were not to let number 9764 out of my sight, and this was an emergency, so I left the ward and found a guard. It was Madigan. He was standing on his beat, staring at nothing. When I touched him, he looked at me, and there was the same vacant look in his eyes that I'd seen in the prisoners. I talked to him in a whisper, but he didn't seem to understand. So I left him and went to a telephone and called for help. Mr. Lawson, the warden, got here with guards in a couple of minutes, and I tried to tell him what had happened, but I couldn't talk loud, and I was afraid to take the fishbowl off my head. Hmm. What happened next? Mr. Lawson took me to his office, and on the way we passed under an arc light. As soon as I got under it, I began to feel better. My voice became stronger. I saw that it was doing me some good, and I stopped under it for an hour before my voice got back to normal. It seemed to clear the fog from my brain, too, and I was able, uh, about four o'clock, to tell everything that had happened. Mr. Lawson seemed to think that my brain was affected as well as the others, and he sent me to the hospital. And, well, that's all, Doctor. Do you feel perfectly normal now? Yes, sir. Well, there's no need for confining this man longer, Mr. Lawson. He's as well as he ever was. Clarence, get the Walter Reed Hospital on the telephone... Tell them that I said to treat Lieutenant Breslau with light rays, rich in ultraviolets. Tell them to give him an overdose of them, not to put goggles on him. Keep him in the sun all day and under sunray arcs at night until further orders. Mr. Lawson, give the same treatment to the men who were disabled last night. If you haven't enough sunray arcs in your hospital, put them under an ordinary arc light in the yard. Bailey, you still got that fishbowl? It's in my office, Doctor said the warden. Ah, oh, good enough. Send for it at once. And by the way, you have two more communists here, Denberg and Szymanski, haven't you? I think so. Oh, I'll have to consult the records before I can be positive. Well, I'm sure that you have. Look the matter up and let me know. The warden hurried away to carry out the doctor's orders, and an orderly appeared in a few moments with a hollow glow made of some crystalline transparent substance. Despite its presence in the infirmary the evening before, there was no trace of clouding apparent. Dr. Bird took it and examined it critically. He wrapped it with his knuckles and then stepped to the door and hurled it down violently to the concrete floor of the yard. The globe rebounded without injury, and he caught it. Ah, oh, vitrilline, or a good imitation of it, he remarked to Carnes. After you get through talking to the hospital, get Taylor on the wire. There's plenty of loose vitrilline in the bureau, and I want him to send about fifty square feet of it by a special plane at once. As Carnes left the room, the warden reappeared. The men are all lying in the sun now, Doctor, he said. I find that we have the two men you mentioned confined here. They're both in Tier A, Building 6. Is that an isolated building? No, it's one wing of the old main building. On which floor? The second floor. It's a six-story building. Have they been moved there recently? Ah, oh, they've been there for nearly a year. In that case, there'll be little chance of another attack of this sort tonight. At the same time, I would advise you to station extra guards there tonight, and every night until I notify you otherwise. Caution them to watch the lights carefully, and to give an alarm at once if they appear to get dim. In that case, send men to the roof with rifles with orders to shoot to kill anyone they find there. I'm going back to Washington. I'm going to take Karuska, your number 9764, with me. You'd better have one of the guards in the corridor where Denberg and Semensky are. Now, wear this goldfish bowl, as you call it. A lot of plate glass, at least it will look like it, will come from Washington by plane. 
cut it into sheets a foot square, and use surgeon's plaster to make some temporary glass helmets for your men. I want all your guards to wear them until I either settle this matter, or I'll send you some better helmets. You understand? I understand all right, but I'm afraid I can't do it. The wearing of such appliances would interfere with the efficiency of my man as guards. Brain and tongue paralysis would interfere rather more seriously, it seems to me. In any event, I have sufficient authority to enforce my request. If you are at all doubtful, call up the Attorney General and ask him. Well, the Warden hesitated. Well, if you don't mind, I think I will call Washington, Doctor, he said. I'll have to get authority to turn number 9764 over to you in any event. Call all you wish, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Carnes is talking to Washington now, and we'll have a clear line for you in a few minutes. Meanwhile, get a set of shackles on Kariska and get him ready to travel by plane. He appears to be suffering from mental paralysis, but I don't know how his case will develop. He may go violently insane at any moment, and I don't care to be left in a plane with an unbound maniac. Major Martin looked up from the prone figure of Karuska. His condition duplicates that of Lieutenant Breslau, Dr. Bird, he said. We received your telephone message this afternoon, and we kept Breslau in a flood of sunlight until dusk, then put him under sunray lamps. Well, I don't know how you got on to that treatment, but it's having a very beneficial effect. He can already make inarticulate sounds, and his eyes are not quite as vacant as they were. If he keeps on improving as he has, he should be able to talk intelligently in a few days. If you wish to question this man, why not give him the same treatment? Well, I haven't time, Major. I must make him talk tonight, if it's humanly possible. I called you in because you're the most eminent authority on the brain in the government service. Is there any way of artificially stimulating this man's brain so that we can force the secrets of his subconscious mind from him? The Major sat for a moment, in profound thought. Well, there is a way, Doctor, he said at length, but it is a method which I would not dare to use. By applying high-frequency electrical stimulations to the medulla oblongata, at the same time bathing the cerebellum with ultraviolet, it may be done, but, well, the chances are that either death or insanity would result. I would not do it. Major Martin, this man is a reckless and dangerous international criminal. If his gang carries out the plan which I fear they have formed, the lives of thousands, well, of millions, may pay for your hesitation. I will assume full responsibility for the test if you'll make it, and I have the authority of the President of the United States behind me. Well, in that case, Doctor, I have no choice. The President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and if those are his orders, the experiment will be carried out. As a matter of form, I will ask that your orders be reduced to writing. I will write them gladly, Major. Please proceed with the experiment without delay. Major Martin bowed and spoke to a waiting orderly. The prostrate figure of Karuska was wheeled down a corridor into the electrical laboratory, and with the aid of the laboratory technician, the surgeon made his preparations. The moss lamp was arranged to throw a flood of ultraviolet over the Russian's cranium, while the leads from a deep therapy X-ray tube was connected, one to the front of Karuska's throat and the other to the base of his brain. At a signal from the Major, a nurse began to administer ether. I guarantee nothing, Dr. Bird, said the Major. The paralysis of the vocal cords may be physical, in which case the victim will still be unable to speak, regardless of the brain stimulation. If, however, the evident paralysis is due to some obscure influence on the brain, it may work. In any event, I'll hold you blameless and thank you for your help, replied the Doctor. Please start the stimulation. Major Martin closed a switch, and the hum of a high-tension alternator filled the laboratory. The Russian quivered for a moment, and then lay still. Major Martin nodded, and Dr. Bird stepped to the side of the operating table. Ivan Karuska, he said slowly and distinctly, do you hear me? The Russian's lips quivered, and an unintelligible murmur came from them. Ivan Karuska, repeated Dr. Bird. Do you hear me? There was a momentary struggle on the part of the Russian, and then a surprisingly clear voice came from his lips. I do. Who is the present head of the Young Labour Party? Again, there was a pause before the name. Saranov came from the lips of the insensible figure. 
Carnes gave a sharp exclamation, but a gesture from the doctor silenced him. Is Saranoff alive? Yes. Is he in the United States? No, he is in London. Is he coming to the United States? Yes. Where? I do not know. Soon. As soon as we are ready for him. Where is he living in London? I don't know. How did you get word that you were to be rescued from Atlanta? A message was smuggled into me by O'Grady, a guard in our pay. What was the vitrilene helmet for? To protect me from the effects of the black lamp. What's the black lamp? I do not know exactly. Saranoff invented it. It gives a black light and it kills all other light except sunlight, and it paralyzes the brain. Did you know that the model of the Breslau gun had been stolen? Yes. What were you going to do after you were rescued from jail? I was going to make a full-sized gun. We have a disappearing gun platform built in the swamps at the juncture of the Potomac and Piscataway Creek. The gun was to be mounted there, and we would shell Washington and institute a reign of terror. It would be a signal for uprisings all over the country. Is there a black lamp at that gun platform? Yes. The black lamp will kill both the flash and the report. Where did you get the formula for radar? We got it from one of Dr. Bird's assistants. His name... As he spoke the last few sentences, Karuska's voice had steadily risen, almost to a shriek. As he endeavoured to give the name of the doctor's treacherous helper, his voice changed to an unintelligible screech and then died away into silence. Major Martin stepped forward and bent over the prone figure. Hurriedly he tore away the electrical connections and placed a stethoscope over the Russian's heart. He listened for a moment, and then straightened up, his face pale. I hope that the information you obtained is worth a life, Dr. Bird, he said, his voice trembling slightly, because it has cost one. It may easily save thousands of lives. I thank you, Major, and I will see that no blame attaches to you for your actions. I only wish that he'd lived long enough to tell me the name of my assistant, who has sold me out to Saranov. However, we'll get that information in other ways. Garns, telephone Lawson at Atlanta to slam O'Grady into a cell pending investigation, while I get Camp Mead on the wire and order up a couple of tanks. We're going to attack that gun emplacement at daybreak. The telephone bell in the laboratory jangled sharply. Major Martin answered it and turned to Carnes. You're wanted on the telephone, Mr. Carnes. The detective stepped forward and took the transmitter. Carnes speaking, he said. Yeah, oh, hello, Bolton. Yeah, we have Karuska here, or rather his body. Yes, Dr. Bird is here right now. You've what? Great Scott. Wait a minute. Dr. Bird. He cried eagerly, turning from the telephone. Bolton has located the Washington headquarters of the Young Labor Party. Dr. Bird sprang to the instrument. Bird speaking, Bolton, he cried. You've located their headquarters? Who's running it? Stransky, eh? Oh, you're on the right track. He used to be Saranoff's right-hand man. Where's the place located? Hmm. Don't seem to recollect the spot. You have it well surrounded? Where are you speaking from? All right, we'll join you as quickly as we can. Now, keep your patrols out and don't let anyone get away. He then hung up the receiver and turned to Carnes. Did you have the car wait? He asked. Ah, good enough. We'll jump for the bureau and pick up all the vitrilene laying around loose and join Bolton. He thinks he has the whole outfit bottled up. Bolton was waiting as the car rolled up and Dr. Bird leaped out. Where are they? demanded the doctor eagerly. In an abandoned factory building about 300 yards from here, replied the chief of the Secret Service. I traced them through New York. We've been watching the place ever since yesterday noon, and I know that Stanesky is in there with half a dozen others. No one has tried to leave since we set our watch. Funny things happened, one funny thing. About an hour ago, a peculiar red glow suffused the whole building. It's died down a good deal since, but we can still see it through the windows. Can you tell us what that means? Oh, no, I couldn't, Bolton, but we'll find out. How many men have you? 
Well, I have sixteen stationed around. Oh, that's more than we'll need. I have only vitrine shields and helmets enough to equip six men. Pick out your three best men to go with us, and we'll make a try at entering. Bolton strode off into the darkness and returned in a few moments with three men at his heels. Dr. Bird spoke briefly to the operatives, all of them men who had been his companions on other adventures. He explained the need for the vitrilene helmets and shields, and without comment the six donned their armour and followed Bolton as he strode toward the building. As they approached, a dull red glow could be plainly seen through the windows, and Dr. Bird paused and studied the phenomenon for a moment. I don't know what that means, Bolton, he said softly, but I don't like the looks of it. Straneski is up to some devilment or other. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find out that he knows all about your pickets and is ready for a raid. Well, we'd better rush the place then, muttered Bolton. Dr. Bird nodded agreement, and with a sharp command to his men, Bolton broke into a run. Not a shot was fired as they approached, and the front door gave readily to Bolton's touch. As it opened, there came a grating sound from the roof, followed by the whir of a propeller. Dr. Bird ran out of the building and glanced up. A helicopter, he cried. They were expecting us and have escaped. He drew his pistol and fired ineffectually at the great bird-like ship which was rising almost noiselessly into the air. He cursed and turned again to the building. Bolton still stood in the room which they'd first entered. His flashlight showed it to be empty, but from under a door on the opposite side a line of dull red light glowed evilly. With his pistol ready in his hand, Bolton approached the door on hands and knees. When he reached it, he threw his shoulder against it and dropped flat to the floor as the door swung open. No shot greeted him, and he stared for a moment, and then rose to his feet. Nothing in here but some glass statues, he announced. Dr. Bird followed him into the room. As he looked at what Bolton had called glass statues, he gasped and shielded his eyes. God in heaven! he said. Those were living men. Before them were three men, or what had been three men. All stood in strained attitudes, with a look of horror frozen on their faces. The thing that made the spectators shudder was that their bodies had, by some diabolical method, been rendered semi-transparent. The dull red light which suffused the room emanated from the three bodies. Dr. Bird examined them closely, being careful not to touch them. The identity of my treacherous assistant is known, he said grimly, as he pointed at the middle figure. It was Jerome. What's this? He took an envelope from the hand of the middle figure and opened it. A sheet of paper fell out and he picked it up and read it. My dear Mr. Bolton, ran the note. Your methods of tracing and picketing my headquarters are so crude as to be almost laughable. This base has served its purpose, and we were ready to abandon it at any event. But I couldn't resist the temptation to let you almost nab us. The three men whom you will find here are agents who failed in their duty. If you are interested in learning the method of their execution, you might take to heart the words of your colleague, Dr. Bird. The clue lies in those windows. Carnes glanced at the windows and gave out a cry of surprise. The glass was opaque, as had been the glass in the doctor's laboratory and the glass in the infirmary at Atlanta. The fogging, however, was much more pronounced, and the opaque glass gave faintly the same red effulgence which came from the three bodies. "'What does it mean, doctor?' he asked. "'I don't know, Carnes,' said Dr. Bird slowly. I foresee that I am going to have to do a great deal of work on short wavelengths soon. It is doubtless the effect of some modification of the black lamp which has done it. Oh, look out! He leapt to one side as he spoke, drawing Bolton and Carnes with him. A panel in the side of the wall opposite the doorway had slid open, silently, and through the opening poured out a beam of fiery red. Full on the three bodies it fell, and then spread out to fill the room. Dr. Bird had drawn the two nearest men out of the direct beam, but one of the Secret Service men stood full in its power. In the excitement of entering, he dropped his vitrilene shield, and the livid ray fell full on his defenseless body. As they watched, an expression of horror spread over his face, and he strove to move to one side, but he was held helpless. 
Slowly, he stiffened, and as the ray bored through him, his body became semi-transparent, and the same dull red glow which emanated from the three bodies they'd found began to shine forth from him, too. Bolton strove to break from the doctor's grasp and rushed to the rescue, but Dr. Bird held him with a grip of iron. Too late, he said grimly. Chalk up another murder to the arch-fiend who has committed the others. I don't know the nature of that ray, and vitriolene may not be an adequate defense against its full force. We'd better get out of here and attack the place from the rear. Carefully edging their way around the sides of the room, the five men made their way out through the door. Dr. Bird slammed the door shut behind him and led the way out of the building and around to the rear. A door loomed before them, and he cautiously tried it. It gave to his touch as he entered. And as he set foot on the threshold, a terrific explosion came from the interior of the building. Run, he shouted as he led the way in retreat. If that is a radite explosion, it will act for several seconds. From a safe distance they watched. One corner of the building had been torn off by the force of the explosion, and as they watched, the rest of the building gradually collapsed and sank into a pile of ruins. Well, they'd planned on a visit from us, all right, said Dr. Bolton grimly. They had a surprise for us, any way we jumped. If we went in the front door, that devil's ray was to finish us, and if we went in the back door, the whole place was arranged to blow up as we entered. I only hope that Stanensky thinks he's got us all and doesn't expect an attack on his next base in the morning. If he doesn't, I think we may give him a rather unpleasant surprise. Of course, that lamp is smashed into atoms and buried under the debris, but I don't know what other devil's contraptions that ruin holds. Bolden, have your men picket it and allow no one near it until I get back. I've got to get to a telephone and get a couple of tanks from Meade and a plane or two from Langley Field. Two tanks made their way slowly across country. The front of each tank was protected by a heavy sheet of vitrilene, while the turrets of the tanks projected the wicked-looking muzzles of 37mm guns. Overhead, two airplanes from Langley Field soared, scouting the country. Dr. Bird and Carnes rode in the leading tank. It ought to be somewhere near here, unless Karuska lied, said Carnes as he swept the country with a pair of binoculars. He didn't lie, returned Dr. Bird. It was his subconscious mind that spoke, and it never lies. He spoke of the gun emplacement as being in a swamp, and, and I have a strong idea that it's a submersible. Of course, it's bound to be well camouflaged, both from land and from air observation. The plane circled around again and again, quartering the air like a pair of well-trained bird dogs would quarter a hunting field. First high and then low, they swooped back and forth the tanks lumbering slowly along in the same direction. Presently, the occupants of the leading tank saw one of the planes bank sharply and swing around. It dropped to an altitude of only a few hundred feet and turned and went back over the ground it had just crossed. I believe that fellow sees something, exclaimed Carnes. As he spoke, three green, very lights came from the cockpit of the plane. The tank driver gave a grunt of satisfaction and turned the nose of his vehicle in that direction. The second tank followed. Hardly had they turned in the new direction before the ground began to get soft under their tracks and the heavy vehicles began to sink. The driver of the doctor's tank forced it ahead, but the tank sank deeper in the mire until water flowed in around the feet of the occupants. I reckon we'll have to get out and walk pretty soon, doctor, said the driver. But Dr. Bird grunted in acquiescence. The tank made its way forward a few yards before the engine sputtered and died. The second tank stopped when the first one did, fifty yards behind it. Donning vitrilene helmets and taking vitrilene shields in their hands, the crews of both tanks climbed out into the waist-deep water and gathered around the doctor for orders. Form a skirmish line at ten pace intervals and cross the swamp, he directed. We may meet with no opposition, but if there is, the more scattered we are, the safer we'll be. You all have hand grenades as well as your rifles. A murmur of assent answered him, and the line formed and started across the swamp. They'd gone perhaps a hundred yards when three red lights came from one of the planes circling overhead. Get down, cried the doctor, dropping to his knees into the muck. Four hundred yards ahead of him, a concrete platform emerged from the marsh and rose slowly into the air. It was roofed with a dome of what looked like plate glass, 
but which the doctor shrewdly suspected was vitrilline. On the base of the platform was two feet above the level of the water. The dome slid silently aside, disclosing two men bending over a tiny gun. Dr. Bird leveled his binoculars. That's the Breslau gun model that was stolen as sure as I'm a foot high, he cried. They must have made some miniature shells and be planning to fire it. Slowly, a pall of intense blackness rose from the marsh and enveloped the platform and hid it from view. A whining noise came from overhead, and then a crash like a thunderbolt. The blast of the explosion threw the attackers face down into the swamp, and when they arose and looked back, it was merely a gaping hole where the leading tank had been. The second tank suddenly seemed to rise into the air and fly into millions of tiny fragments, and a second thunderous blast sent them again to their knees. Oh, radite, bellowed Dr. Bird to Carnes. Imagine the effect that if that had been a full charge fired from a completed Breslau gun. Watch the planes now. I think they're going to drop a few eggs on them. The black mist cleared as if by magic, and the platform was now in plain view. The big glass dome rolled back into place as the two planes swept over at an elevation of 2,000 feet. From each one, a small black cigar-shaped object was released and fell in a long parabola toward the earth. The glass dome, which had been closing over the gun platform, rolled quickly back, and a long beam of intense blackness pierced the heavens. First one and then the other of the falling bombs disappeared from view into it, and then the black column faded from view. The two bombs fell with increasing speed, but the dome closed over the platform before they struck. The two hit the dome at almost the same instant, and instead of the blinding crash they'd expected, the watchers saw the bombs rebound from the dome and fall harmlessly into the water. Oh, stymied, muttered the doctor. I wonder what other properties that confounded lamp has. He resumed his advance, Carnes and the soldiers keeping abreast of him. When they were within two hundred yards of the platform, it rose again and the transparent dome rolled back. A beam of black shot forth over the swamp, searching them out and hiding them from view. First one and then another felt the effects of the black beam, but the vitrilline which the doctor had provided stood them in good stead, and, aside from a slight shortening of their breath, none of the attackers felt any the worse. "'Come on, men!' cried the doctor as his athletic figure ploughed forward through the breast-deep water. "'That's their worst weapon, and it's harmless against us. Cheering, they fought their way toward the platform. It sunk for a moment and then rose again. As the dome swung back, a sharp crackle of machine gun fire sounded and the water before them was whipped into foam by the plunging bullets. One of the soldiers gave a sharp cry and slumped forward into the water. Fire at will, shouted the lieutenant in command. A crackle of rifle fire answered the tattoo of the machine gun and the sharp ping of bullets striking on the dome could be plainly heard. An occasional shot kicked up a spurt of white dust from the concrete, but the machine gun kept up a steady rattle of fire, and the soldiers kept their heads almost at the level of the water. There came the roar of an airplane motor, and one of the planes swept over the platform, a hundred yards in the air, with two machine guns spraying streams of bullets onto the platform. Two men abandoned their machine gun and crouched under the partially folded back dome as the second plane swept over. Dr. Bird took advantage of the lull to advance his party a few yards nearer. Again, the defenders of the platform rushed to their gun, but the first plane had turned and swooped down with both guns going, and again they were forced to take shelter while the doctor and his force made another advance. The second plane had turned and followed the first, but the defenders had had enough. The transparent dome closed over them, and the platform sank back into the mark. With a shout, Dr. Bird led the way forward again. The attackers were within a hundred yards of the platform, when it again rose above the surface of the water. The guns had disappeared, but in their place stood an airship. It was a small affair with stubby wings, above which were two helicopter blades revolving at high speed. No sound of a motor could be heard. The transparent dome rolled back, and like a bullet, the little craft shot into the air followed by a futile volley from the soldiers. Hardly had it appeared than the two airplanes bore down on it with machine guns going. The helicopter paid no attention to them for a moment, and then came a puff of smoke from its side. 
The leading plane swerved sharply, and the helicopter fired again. The leading plane maneuvered about, trying to get a machine gun to bear, while the second plane climbed swiftly to get above the helicopter and pour a deadly stream of fire down into it. It gained position and swooped down to the attack, but another puff of smoke came from the side of the helicopter, and there was a thunderous report and a blinding flash in the sky. As the smoke cleared away, no trace of the ill-fated plane could be seen. The helicopter hung motionless in the air, as though daring the remaining plane to attack. Well, the plane accepted the challenge and bore down at full speed on the stranger. Again came a puff of smoke, but the plane swerved and an answering shot came from its side. It was above the helicopter, and the shell which missed its mark plunged to the ground. When it struck there came a roar and a flash, and the whole earth seemed to shake. The helicopter shot upward into the air, and forward, both its elevating fans and its propellers whirling blurs of light. The airplane followed at its sharpest climbing angle, but was helpless to compete with its swifter climbing rival. Oh, he's got away, groaned Carnes. Not yet, my friend, cried the doctor, hopping with excitement. He isn't safe yet. I never told you, but one Breslau gun had been made, and it's on that plane. It has deadly accuracy and is good for fifteen miles. That's Lieutenant Dreen at the controls, and Mason at the gun. As he spoke, the plane swung around and made a half loop. For a few yards it flew upside down, and then whirled swiftly. As it turned, there came a sharp report and a puff of smoke from its rear cockpit. High above, the helicopter had ceased climbing and hovered motionless. As the plane fired, the helicopter shot forward like an arrow from a bow, and thereby spelled its doom. Not for nothing did Captain Mason bear the title of the best aerial gunner in the air corps. He'd foreseen what the action of his opponent would be, and had allowed for just such a move. Far up in the sky came a blinding flash and a cloud of smoke. When the smoke cleared, the sky was empty, except for a little scattered debris falling slowly to the ground. And that's that exclaimed Dr. Bird as he finished his examination of the underground laboratory with which the gun platform connected. The lamp has gone to glory with Breslau's gun model and two of the best brains of the young Labour Party. I'm sure that Stanesky was one of those two men, and I wish the whole gang had been on board. Don't you think that this is the end of it, Doctor? Oh, no, Carnes, I don't. We know that the real brains of this outfit is Saranoff, and Saranoff is still alive. He probably won't try to use his black lamp again, because I'll have a defense against it in a short time, now that I've seen it in action, but he will try something else. The whole object of life to a loyal citizen of Bolshevikia is to reduce the whole world to the barbarous level in which they hold Russia, and they will spare no pains or effort to accomplish it. The greatest obstacle to their success at present is the President of the United States. He is loved and respected by the whole world, and if he is spared he will forge the world into a great machine for the preservation of peace and universal goodwill. That would be fatal to Bolshevikia's plans, and they will spare no effort to remove him. By the grace of God we have saved him from harm so far, but until we remove Saranoff permanently from the scene, I will never feel safe for him. What do you suppose they'll try next, Doctor? Well, that can't. Time alone will tell. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Cannell Off there, to the right, somewhere is uh, a large island, said Whitney. It's a rather mysterious... What island is it? Rainsford asked. Oh, the old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. Suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. Ugh, can't see it, remarked Rainsford, trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick warm blackness in upon the yacht. Oh, you've good eyes, said Whitney with a laugh. <laughs> I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall bush at four hundred yards. 
but even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. Oh, it's like moist black velvet. It will be light enough in Rio, promised Whitney. They should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up the Amazon. Great sport hunting. The best sport in the world, agreed Rainsford. Well, for the hunter, amended Whitney. Not for the Jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a Jaguar feels? Perhaps the Jaguar does, observed Whitney. They have no understanding. Uh, even so, I rather think they understand one thing. Fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. <laughs> Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Now be a realist. The world's made up of two classes. The hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are hunters. Do you think we've passed that island yet? Well, I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why? asked Rainsford. Well, the place has a reputation, a bad one. Cannibals, suggested Rainsford. Well, hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? Yeah, they were a bit strange now that you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen. Yeah, even that tough-minded old Swede. Go up to the devil himself and ask for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, oh, This place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. And he said to me very gravely, Don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. Oh, there was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. And what I felt was a, a mental chill, a, a sort of sudden dread. Ugh, pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can't take the whole ship's company with his fear. Well, maybe, but sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they're in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing, with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. An evil place can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. Oh, I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe up on the after deck. Well, good night then, Rainsford. See you at breakfast. Right, good night, Whitney. There was no sound in the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness, and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favourite brayer. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. Oh, it's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my island. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right he heard it, and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again. Somewhere off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leapt upon the rail and balanced himself there to get greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was not from his mouth. Well, he lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry then came from his lips as he realised he'd reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea dosed over his head. Well, he struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out. But the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face, and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht, but he stopped before he swum fifty feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he'd been in a tight place. 
Well, there was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender, and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all his power. The lights of the yacht became faint and ever-vanishing fireflies, and then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. they come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then Rashford heard a sound. He came out of the darkness, a screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He didn't try to. With fresh vitality, he swam toward the sound. He heard it again, and then it was cut short by another noise. Crisp, staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford, swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears. The most welcome he had ever heard. The muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut up in the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand. Gasping his hands raw, he reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. Oh, what perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. The sleep had given him a new vigour. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him almost cheerfully. Hmm. Where there are pistol shots, there are men. And where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees. It was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered along by the water. Not far from where he'd landed, he stopped. Some wounded thing, by the evidence of a large animal, had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down and the moss was lacerated. One patch of weeds was stained crimson. A small glittering object not far away caught Rainsford's eye, and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two, he remarked. That's odd. Must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve with him to tackle it with a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his quarry and wounded it. The last shot was when he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he'd hoped to find. The print of hunting boots. They pointed along the cliff in the direction he'd been going. Eagerly he hurried along, now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone, but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blacking out the sea and jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he'd come upon a village, for there were many lights. But as he forged along he saw to his great astonishment that all the lights were in one enormous building a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upward into the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau. It was set on a high bluff, and on three sides of it cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. A mirage, thought Rainsford. But it was no mirage, he found, when he opened the tall spiked iron gate. The stone steps were real enough, the massive door with a leering gargoyle for a knocker was real enough, yet above it all hung an air of unreality. He lifted the knocker, 
and it creaked up stiffly, as if it had never before been used. He let it fall, and it startled him with its booming loudness. He thought he heard steps within. The door remained closed. Again Rainsford lifted the heavy knocker and let it fall. The door opened then, opened as suddenly as if it were on a spring, and Rainsford stood blinking in the river of glaring gold light that poured out. The first thing Rainsford's eyes discerned was the largest man Rainsford had ever seen, a gigantic creature solidly made and black-bearded to the waist. In his hand the man held a long-barreled revolver, and he was pointing it straight at Rainsford's heart. Out of the snarl of beard, two small eyes regarded Rainsford. Oh, "'Don't be alarmed,' said Rainsford, with a smile which he hoped was disarming. "'I'm no robber. I fell off a yacht. My name is Sanger Rainsford of New York City.' The menacing look in the eyes did not change, the revolver pointing as rigidly as if the giant were a statue. He gave no sign that he understood Rainsford's words, or that he had even heard them. He was dressed in uniform, a black uniform trimmed with a grey astrakhan. "'I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York,' Rainsford began again. "'I fell off a yacht. I'm hungry.' The man's only answer was to raise with his thumb the hammer of his revolver. Then Rainsford saw the man's free hand go to his forehead in a military salute, and he saw him click his heels together and stand at attention. Another man was coming down the broad marble steps, an erect slender man in evening clothes. He advanced to Rainsford and held out his hand. In a cultivated voice marked by a slight accent that gave it an added precision and deliberateness, he said, It's a very great pleasure and honour to welcome Mr. Sanger Rainsford, the celebrated hunter, to my home. Automatically, Rainsford shook the man's hand. I've uh, read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see, explained the man. I am General Zarov. Rainsford's first impression was that the man was singularly handsome. His second was that there was an original, almost bizarre quality about the general's face. He was a tall man, past middle age, for his hair was a vivid white, but his thick eyebrows and pointed military moustache were as black as the night from which Rainsford had come. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. He had high cheekbones, a sharp-cut nose, a spare, dark face, the face of a man used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. Turning to the giant in uniform, the general made a sign. The giant put away his pistol, saluted, and withdrew. Ivan is an incredibly strong fellow, remarked the general, but he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. A simple fellow, but I'm afraid, like all his race, a bit of a savage. Is he Russian? He's a Cossack, said the general, and his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth. Well, so am I. Come, he said. We shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. Now you want clothes, food, rest, and you shall have them. This is a most restful spot. Ivan had reappeared, and the general spoke to him with lips that moved but gave forth no sound. Well, follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford, said the general. I was about to have my dinner when you came. I'll wait for you. You'll find that my clothes will fit you, I think. It was to a huge, beam-ceilinged bedroom with a canopied bed big enough for six men that Rainsford followed the silent giant. Ivan laid out an evening suit, and Rainsford, as he put it on, Noticed that it came from a London tailor who ordinarily cut and sewed for none below the rank of Duke. The dining room to which Ivan conducted him was in many ways remarkable. There was a medieval magnificence about it. It suggested a baronial hall of feudal times with its oaken panels, its high ceiling, its vast refectory tables where two score men could sit down and eat. About the hall were mounted heads of many animals, lions, tigers, elephants, moose, bears, larger or more perfect specimens Rainsford had never seen. At the great table, the general was sitting alone. Oh, you'll have a cocktail, Mr. Rainsford, he suggested. 
Oh, the cocktail was surprisingly good, and Rainsford noted the table appointments were of the finest. The linen, the crystal, the silver, the china. They were eating borscht, the rich red soup with whipped cream so dear to Russian palates. Half apologetically, General Zarov said, We do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive any lapses. We are well off the beaten track, you know. Do you think the champagne has suffered from its long ocean trip? Well, not in the least, declared Rainsford. He was finding the general a most thoughtful and affable host, a true cosmopolite. But there was one small trait of the general's that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraising him narrowly. Perhaps said General Zarov. You are surprised that I recognize your name. You see, I read all books on hunting published in English, French, and Russian. I have but one passion in my life, Mr. Rainsford, and that is the hunt. Oh, you have some wonderful heads here, said Rainsford, as he ate a particularly well-cooked filet mignon. That Cape Buffalo is the largest I've ever seen. Ah, oh, that fellow... Yes, he was a monster. Did he charge you? Oh, hurled me against a tree, said the general. Fractured my skull, but I got the brute. Well, I've always thought, said Rainsford, that the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all big game. For a moment the general did not reply. He was smiling his curious red-lipped smile. Then he said slowly, No, you are wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. He then sipped his wine. Here in my preserve on this island, he said in the same slow tone, I hunt more dangerous game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Is there big game on this island? The general nodded. Ah, the biggest. Really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. What have you imported, General? Rainsford asked. Tigers? The General smiled. Uh, no, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers, no real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave a smell like incense. You will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what game? began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You will be amused, I know. I think I may say, in all modesty, that I've done a rare thing. I've invented a new sensation. Oh, may I pour you another glass of port? Thank you, General. The General filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger, my father said. He was a very rich man with a quarter of a million acres in the Crimea, and he was an ardent sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun, specially made in Moscow for me, to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was ten. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army, it was expected of noblemen's sons, and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry, but my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I have killed. The general then puffed at his cigarette. After the debacle in Russia, I left the country, for it was imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Carlo or drive a taxi in Paris. 
or naturally I continued to hunt. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. Ah, it was in Africa that Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I was recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I'd heard they were unusually cunning. <laughs> they weren't. The Cossack sighed. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him and with a high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I've heard that in America businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that's been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I had no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now, mine is a analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zaroff. So, continued the General, I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. Now, you are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but perhaps you can guess the answer. What was it? Ah, simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry, always. There's no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. No animal had a chance with me any more. That is no boast, it's a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no matter of reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table, absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration what I must do, the general went on. And that was. The general smiled, the quiet smile of one who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt. He said. A new animal? You're joking. Oh, not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. And so I bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. Ah, the island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of traits in them. Hills. Swamps. But the animal, General Zarov. Oh, said the general, it supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Uh, every day I hunt and I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed on his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, he must have courage, cunning, and, above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? <laughs> I can't believe you're serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. Hunting? Great guns, General Zaroff. What you speak of is murder. The general then laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to be harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war <laughs> did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive and, if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. 
It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Ah, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You've a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Oh, dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and, if needs be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships. Well, oh, all kinds. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of men. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely said the general. That's why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eyelids fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Come to the window with me. Rainsford went to the window and looked out toward the sea. Watch! Out there! exclaimed the general, pointing into the night. Rainsford's eyes saw only blackness, and then, as the general pressed a button, far out to sea, Rainsford saw the flash of light. The general chuckled. They indicate a channel, he said, where there's none. Just giant rocks with razor edges, crouching like a sea monster with wide-open jaws. They can crush a ship as easily as I crush this nut. He then dropped a walnut on the hardwood floor and brought his heel grinding down on it. Ah, yes, he said, casually as if in answer to a question. I have electricity. We try to be civilized here. Civilized? And you shoot down men? A trace of anger was now in the general's black eyes, but it was there for but a second, and he said, in his most pleasant manner, Dear me, what a righteous young man you are. I assure you I do not do the thing you suggest. That would be barbarous. I treat these visitors with every consideration. They get plenty of good food and exercise. They get into splendid physical condition. And you shall see that for yourself tomorrow. What do you mean? Well, visit my training school, smiled the general. It's in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish bark San Lujar, and had the bad luck to go on the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens, and more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. He raised his hand, and Ivan, who served as waiter, brought thick Turkish coffee. Rainsford, with an effort, held his tongue in check. "'It's a game, you see,' pursued the general blandly. "'I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. "'I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. "'I give him three hours' start. "'I am to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest calibre and range. "'If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. "'If I find him—' "'The general smiled. He loses. Well, suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, said the general, I give him his option, of course. He need not play the game if he does not wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Ivan once had the honour of serving as official nautilus to the great white Tsar, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Rainsford, Invariably, they do choose the hunt. And if they win? The smile on the general's face widened. To date, I have not lost, he said. Then he added hastily, I do not wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford. 
Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem. Occasionally I strike a tartar. One almost did win. I even had to use the dogs. The dogs? Oh, this way, please. I'll show you. The general steered Rainsford to the window. The lights from the window sent a flickering illumination that made grotesque patterns on the courtyard below, and Rainsford could see moving about there a dozen or so huge black shapes. As they turned toward him, their eyes glittered greenly. Oh, a rather good lot, I think, observed the general. They are let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my house or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to him. He then hummed a snatch of song from the Folie Bergère. And now, said the general, I want to show you my new collection of heads. Will you come with me to the library? Oh, I uh, hope, said Rainsford, that uh, you'll excuse me tonight, General Zorov. I'm not feeling really well. Oh, indeed, the general inquired solicitously. Well, I suppose that's only natural after your long swim. You need a good, restful night's sleep. Tomorrow you'll feel like a new man, I'll wager. And then we'll hunt, eh? I have one rather promising prospect. Rainsford was hurrying from the room. Oh, sorry you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect rather fair sport. A big, strong man. Oh, he looks resourceful. Well... Good night, Mr. Rainsford. I hope you have a good night's rest. The bed was good, and the pyjamas of the softest silk, and he was tired in every fibre of his being. But nevertheless, Rainsford could not quiet his brain with the opiate of sleep. He lay eyes wide open. Once he thought he heard stealthy steps in the corridor outside his room. He sought to throw open the door, but it would not open. He went to the window and looked out. His room was high up in one of the towers. The lights of the chateau were out now, and it was dark and silent. But there was a fragment of sallow moon, and by its one light he could see, dimly, the courtyard. There, weaving in and out in the pattern of shadow, were black, noiseless forms. The hounds heard him at the window and looked up, expectantly, with their green eyes. Rainsford went back to the bed and lay down. By many methods he tried to put himself to sleep. He had achieved a doze when, just as morning began to come, he heard, far off in the jungle, the faint report of a pistol. General Zaroff did not appear until luncheon. He was dressed faultlessly in the tweeds of a country squire. He was solicitous about the state of Rainsford's health. Ah, as for me, sighed the general, I do not feel so well. I am worried, Mr. Rainsford. Last night I detected traces of my old complaint. To Rainsford's questioning glance, the general said, Oh, ennui, boredom. Then, taking a second helping of Crepe Suzette, the general explained, The hunting was not good last night. The fellow lost his head. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. Ah, that's the trouble with these sailors. They have dull brains to begin with, and they do not know how to get about in the woods. They do excessively stupid and obvious things. It's most annoying. Uh, will you have another glass of Chablis, Mr. Rainsford? General, said Rainsford firmly, I wish to leave this island at once. The general raised his thickets of eyebrows. He seemed hurt. But my dear fellow, the general protested, You've only just come. You've had no hunting. Well, I wish to go today, said Rainsford. He saw the dead black eyes of the general on him, studying him. General Zaroff's face suddenly brightened. He filled Rainsford's glass with venerable Chablis from a dusty bottle. Tonight, said the general, we will hunt, you and I. Rainsford shook his head. No, general, he said. I will not hunt. The general shrugged his shoulders and delicately ate a hot house grape. As you wish, my friend, he said. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? 
He nodded toward the corner, to where the giant stood, scowling, his thick arms crossed on his hog's head of chest. Oh, you don't mean it, cried Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last. The general raised his glass, but Rainsford sat, staring at him. You'll find this game worth playing, the general said enthusiastically. Your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength and stamina against mine. Outdoor chess, and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win, began Rainsford huskily, I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeat if I do not find you by midnight of the third day, said General Zaro. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you, in turn, must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general. In that case, but oh, why discuss that now? Three days hence we can discuss it over a bottle of Verve Clicquot, unless... Uh, the general sipped his wine. Then a business-like air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford, we'll supply you with hunting clothes, food, a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's yes, quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. Uh, the deplorable part of it was that Lazarus followed him. Oh, you can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was the finest hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? Au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. General Zaroff, with a deep, curtly bow, then strolled from the room. From another door came Ivan. Under one arm he carried khaki hunting clothes, a haversack of food, a leather sheath containing a long-bladed hunting knife, his right hand rested on a cocked revolver thrust in the crimson sash about his waist. Rainsford had fought his way through the bush for two hours. I must keep my nerve. I must keep my nerve, he said through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear-headed when the chateau gate snapped shut behind him. His whole idea at first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff and to this end he had plunged along, spurred on by the sharp rowers of something like panic. Now he had got a grip on himself, had stopped and was taking stock of himself and the situation. He saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a picture with a frame of water, and his operations clearly must take place within that frame. Well, I'll give him a trail to follow muttered Rainsford, and he struck off from the rude path he'd been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him leg-weary, with hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had the strength. His need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I've played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and, taking care not to leave the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crotch and, stretching out on one of the broad limbs, after a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so zealous a hunter as General Zaroff couldn't trace him there, he told himself. Only the devil himself could follow that complicated trail through the jungle after dark. 
but perhaps the general was a devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford, although the silence of a dead world was on the jungle. Toward morning, when a dingy grey was varnishing the sky, the cry of some startled bird focused Rainsford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He flattened himself down on the limb and, through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. That which was approaching was a man. It was General Zarov. He made his way along with eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused, almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw that the general's right hand held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times as if he were puzzled, and he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent, incense-like smoke floated up to Rainsford's nostrils. Rainsford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were travelling inch by inch up the tree. Rainsford froze there, every muscle tensed for a spring. But the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Rainsford lay. A smile spread over his brown face, and very deliberately he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away, back along the trail he'd come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots growing fainter and fainter. The pent-up air burst hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. Only by the merest chance had the Cossack failed to see his quarry. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Rainsford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was as evident as the sun that had by now pushed through the morning mists. The general was playing with him. The general was saving him for another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat, and he was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. He slid down from the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set, and he forced the machinery of his mind to function. Three hundred yards from his hiding place he stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from its sheath and began to work with all his energy. The job was finished at last, and he threw himself down behind a fallen log a hundred feet away. He didn't have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zarov. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint in the moss. So intent was the Cossack on his stalking that he was upon the thing Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding bow that was the trigger. And even as he touched it, the General sensed his danger and leapt back with the agility of an ape. But he wasn't quite quick enough. The dead tree, delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one, crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he would surely have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder, and Rainsford, with fear again gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford, called the general, if you are within sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man-catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I am going to have my wound dressed. It's only a slight one. 
But I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his flight again. It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight, that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came, then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. An insect bit him savagely. And then, as he stepped forward, his foot sank into the ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sunk viciously at his foot as if it were a giant leap. With a violent effort, he tore his feet loose. Yes, he knew where he was now. Death Swamp and its quicksand. His hands were tight-closed as if his nerve was something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea, though. He stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so, and, like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford had dug himself in back in France when a second's delay meant death. That had been a placid pastime compared to his digging now. The pit grew deeper, and when it was above his shoulders he climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit, with the points sticking up. With flying fingers he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches, and with it he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of feet on the soft earth, and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along, foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year in a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leapt up from his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit a man was standing, with an electric torch in his hand. Ah, you've done well, Rainsford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score. Well, I think, Mr. Rainsford, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by a sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee, and that was postponing the inevitable. For a moment he stood there thinking, an idea that held a wild chance came to him and, tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer, then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. On a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Down a watercourse, not a quarter of a mile away, he could see the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zarov. Just ahead of him, Rainsford made out another figure, whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weeds. It was a giant, Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by some unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he'd learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree, he caught hold of a springy young sapling, and he fastened it to his hunting knife with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling, and then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Well, Rainsford knew now how any animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath, but the baying of the hounds stopped abruptly, and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the night. 
He shinned excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but the hope that was in Rainford's brain when he climbed died, for he saw in the shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. Rainsford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry once more. Nerve, 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 he panted as he dashed along. A blue gap show between the trees dead ahead. Ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford forced himself on toward that gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across a cove he could see the gloomy grey stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds, and then he leapt far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the Cossack stopped. For some minutes he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders, and then he sat down, took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a cigarette, and hummed a bit from Madame Butterfly. General Zaroff had an exceedingly good dinner in his great panelled dining hall that evening. With it he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chambertin. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment, though. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his quarry had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game. So thought the general, as he tasted his after-dinner liqueur. In his library he read, to soothe himself, from the works of Marcus Aurelius. At ten he went up to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired, he said to himself, as he locked himself in. There was a little moonlight, so before turning on his light, he went to the window and looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called. Ah, better luck next time, to them. And they switched on the light. A man who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? I swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaro. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. And he had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.